called to order this uh, work session agenda briefing of the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners for Thursday, April 21st. Uh, Commissioner Flowers will be here momentarily. Um, otherwise, good morning. Mr. Administrator, well, get us started. Morning. Uh, good morning. So this morning we have a, kind of a full agenda, so we'll get started on the first topic. Back during the strategic plan, you had discussed um, ways in which we could combat the issue with um, housing. And so we combine that with an update on our Penny 4 housing um, initiatives. And so Bruce is going to get up and give us a presentation on that, followed by Evan really talking about the compact and our affordable housing initiatives. And, and we'll bring Karen up to join in to those discussions. Go ahead, Bruce. Thank you. Good Speak into your mic. <laughs> Good morning. There we go. Okay. <laughs> location, location, location. That's uh, microphones and housing important. Okay, today's presentation, um, we're going to do a review of the project evaluation and um, recommendation process. We're going to talk about each project that's been funded to date, give you an update on each of those 10 projects, and then we're going to have a discussion on some of the market challenges that are impacting the program. The program itself was launched in 2020. The first application round happened in the fall of 2020. Um, the program is administered by your Housing and Community Development staff in close cooperation and participation with the Housing Finance Authority. Um, Catherine Driver and her team at the HFA work with us closely to evaluate projects, to work with developers. Funded projects then that go into a land trust are um, implemented and overseen by the Housing Finance Authority, so um, they're an integral part of the program and the program implementation. There's a lot of work that goes on before the application. Um, there's marketing of the program, there's outreach to the developers, and there's really just a lot of technical assistance that staff provides to developers to learn more about the program, to point them in directions about other resources. Um, Penny4 is, is a, a great resource that we're utilizing, but we also incorporate the other funding dollars that we receive, the SHIP dollars, the home dollars from the federal government, and we also provide some technical assistance on applications to um, HUD or Florida Housing Finance Corporation for additional resources. Once an applicant gets a project ready, they can apply at any time. Um, it isn't one of those date certain application with a 30 day window, you're in or not. We work with an application, um, with an applicant over the long term. We, we try to get those projects in the pipeline. Some are ready to go pretty quickly. Others can take a year, two years to work through all the challenges and, and the process of getting to the point of, of ready to move forward. This slide kind of talks about some of the key metrics that we look at when we do evaluate a project. Um, we certainly look at cost, we look at affordability set-asides, we looked at the various funding sources, long-term stability of the project, we look at 15 years out, what the projections are, is this project going to be supportive over the long term, um, who's going to be the property management entity, what's their experience. Um, those kind of evaluation pieces go into the, the background review before we ever bring a project forward for recommendation to you for approval. Then, <laughs> thank you. And then quickly, the funding approval process. Um, once we've evaluated a project and feel like it's ready to go and meets all the program criteria, we bring that to the board for your consideration. Um, prior to that time, there's often some negotiation that goes on. Um, applicants come in with a, a concept in mind and a dollar amount that they're requesting, and you know we go back and forth quite a bit to see if you know one if that dollar amount can be reduced by looking at some other resources. And secondly, are we getting as much affordable housing in that project as we can? Are there ways to set aside additional units or maybe change that income mix where there's another tier of affordability added to that project? So there's quite a bit of back and forth that we as staff work with the developers and the applicants on to, to kind of optimize that project for um, cost and affordability requirements. Once the project comes to you, we're looking for your approval to move forward with the maximum amount of funding for the project and a conditional approval that then allows us to dig deeper and do the more due diligence efforts of a 
appraisals, third party underwriting and, and move forward. Following that approval, then the project moves to funding. Um, often that means that we're acquiring the, the land for the property. Again, in coordination with the HFA, the land would be purchased, leased to the developer for a long-term period of time, 99 years, and those restrictions would stay in place to keep that acquisition, that land into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund for long-term affordability. Last steps of the process, once it's constructed, up and operating, then we have a responsibility to monitor that project each and every year to make sure that those affordability housing requirements are being met. So to date, 10 projects have been approved by the board for Penny 4 financing since the fall of 2020. Nine of those projects are in various stages of development from recently completed to just getting underway to um, finalizing their financing. We have had one project that is withdrawn. They've decided to um, not participate in the program, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later in the presentation. The numbers on the screen are updated, reflecting the total units and the total cost for the nine projects that are underway. Before I get into each one of the pro projects, I wanted to share the income and rent limits. Um, in affordable housing, we're often talking percentages, which makes sense in the industry, 80% of this and 120% of that and 30% of that, but what, what does that really mean? So I wanted to include the income and rent limit chart today to kind of give you that the real numbers of what an income amount is that a household of three or a household of four, depending on the income set asides, um, most of our units are either set aside at the 60%, 80%, or the more workforce housing rate of 120% AMI. So that gives you a breakdown of what those income limits look like. And um, as I suspected after I put those in the pre presentation, the new income limits just came out yesterday. So surprisingly, they went up close to 10%. So we did see a, a sizable increase in, in the income limits that just went into effect this week. So that'll be changing those numbers, um, probably adding households to the, those that are eligible for these programs. And here's a map of the 10 projects that have been approved to date. As you can see, they're all in the southern half of the county with the, um, most projects located in, in or around St. Petersburg. Um, and in Clearwater, a lot of that makes sense because these are large multifamily projects where in the urban areas there's density and um, other site, sites that are available for a higher density multi-unit affordable housing projects. So the next nine slides are updates on each of the projects that have been funded. Um, each slide at the top includes the affordable set-asides. And then below on the slide, we've got a, a schedule of major completion points. Um, this is Skyway Lofts. This project was recently completed. I think a couple of you, you were actually able to, to attend the recent ribbon cutting. Um, Blue Dolphin or Blue Sky developers built this project in Southern St. Petersburg. Um, great looking project in an area that has very little affordable housing. Um, so it's, as you can imagine, leasing up very quickly. Um, we're anticipating it being leased up if not this month, by next month. So this was a land trust acquisition. It will be, the land is owned um, through the trust. The HFA and the county own the land and have affordable restrictions for the long term of this project. Uh, similarly, the Shores project is coming along very well. It's at 60% or greater on construction progress. Uh, this project is by the Richmond Group. It is a 100% affordable housing project with 51 units all set aside for under 60% AMI. Uh, they're on track to complete construction um, this summer, July 2020, July of this year is the anticipated completion of construction date. So all of our projects have seen various delays, various cost increases with the market. Um, this project has stayed on track. They did suffer from some material shortages and a few delays, but um, overall it's been, been sticking to the schedule. Innovari is a project in downtown St. Petersburg by Volunteers of America. This project is one of the more unique ones because it's a mixed use project. It will include office space as well as 50 units of affordable housing for low income and special needs households. Uh, they too had a construction delay. They had to um, shut down for a month or two. Um, so they got started, had to pause, but they are back on track to, to restart and um, Hopefully the schedule hasn't slid too, too far off. They're still looking at a completion date at, by the end of this year. 
This is our largest project in terms of number of units. Um, this is a mixed income workforce housing, affordable housing development, um, now, now known as ARIA, formerly known as the New Northeast Project. They are, they are underway, they've started construction. Um, this is a project where we're providing penny for financing, funding for construction activities rather than land assembly. It's got a, a really nice mix of units at different affordability levels, 59 units under 80% AMI, 65 units at 120% AMI. Um, the site's now under construction. They've built the stormwater retention pond, which is a, <laughs> I saw an aerial the other day, a very large stormwater retention pond, but um, we're 415 units. A lot of stormwater needs to be uh, collected and treated. So it's, uh, it's on track for a December 23 completion. Washington Avenue Apartments, um, this project is located in the downtown Clearwater in the CRA. And this project is, is paused at the moment. Um, there's been, you know, with all the projects, the fluctuations in cost and pricing have impacted them. Um, they've ran into some unanticipated cost, and so they're looking at ways to, to move, the for, move the project forward. But right now they've decided to kind of put the brakes on until Hopefully some cost and expenses of construction will stabilize and they can, can look at moving forward. So I don't know in terms of timing if that's going to be three months. Um, we're going to talk about some of the market conditions here later. But um, was, because I'm sorry, was this one that we did increase our portion? Um, no, the amount did not increase since the original funding. Um, okay. The Blue Dolphin project in downtown Clearwater, that was a another CRA located Clearwater project where we added funding because of the cost that increased. So okay. there are two projects in the downtown CRA. Um, so we hope to see this one move forward in the future, but I, I think it could, could be a, a little bit different version. So once they decide what direction they're gonna come, we we'll, would we'll likely bring the project back to you if, if anything changes from a, a financial or affordability standpoint. Question. Yeah, um, and how long will we stay committed to that project with funds? Um, there isn't a hard and fast deadline that we put the commitment on. Um, we've put the commitment letter. The project has changed. We were talking to the developer and they were thinking about going a different direction by partnering with the, Pinell, with the Clearwater Housing Authority. And so they'd come up with a concept to partner with the housing authority to issue um, municipal bonds to finance the project, and the ownership structure was gonna change. Um, if they move forward with that, they'll need to reapply because those are very significant changes to the project. So anything like that that changes the project would require a reapplication and then um, your reconsideration. So those funds are now freed up, will be freed up essentially for other projects? I think so. They haven't been officially, but we're going to work with them. And if they're going to pause for very long, ask them to withdraw their application so that we can then free those funds up. Thank you. The next project is Oakhurst Trace. Um, this project represents the greatest number of affordable units. Um, it remains in the earlier planning stages of financing. This project, the board committed funding for the acquisition of the land. Um, that has not moved forward yet because they are still working on their overall financing plan. They've applied to the HFA for bond financing. That should be coming to you for your consideration as early as next month. It's, yes, sir. What, where is this one located? Because the it says Pinellas Park, but the address on the thing is 16th Street in St. Petersburg. So I was just curious about the location. Um, it is in Pinellas Park. It's on the west side of US 19, um, just north of Park Boulevard. I'm sorry, with the address you're referring to was on the on the map though? of the project, it, it has it mapped at, at uh, 16th Street in St. Pete. But you're saying it's US 19 and Park Boulevard? It's north of Park Boulevard on the west side of US 19. Okay. Um, close to, there's a, it was a former Walmart and now it's a, a church. Sure. It's just to the west of that property. Is, is that one where the, I mean, they had a project that was, I think, um, moving forward and then I think the council denied it. Is this a different version of that or a whole new project, do you know? Um, it's kind of a different project. I think the city council raised some concerns about um, the original owner. They anticipated a higher end 
apartment complex being constructed there, and that owner then entered into a contract to sell the property to Southport. Um, Southport is the developer that's planning to do an affordable housing project. So I think there were some concerns voiced by the city on um, a change of the market demographic for the project. Yeah, the, the neighborhood across the street was not, <laughs> not thrilled with it. I don't think they were thrilled with any project, quite frankly, but specifically that one. Okay. Yeah, on the on the uh, map of projects, it's it's mislocated, but just good catch. We'll uh, we'll correct that. Thank you. <laughs> no, on the on the slide, it was number ten, which is um, it's not a big deal, but it's just a, it was just a misplaced on the map. We'll get that corrected. Thank you. Thank you. The next project, Whispering Pines, is a smaller project. Um, this is a project by Pinellas Affordable Living, uh, the housing development component of Boley. Boley serves special needs clients. Uh, this project successfully was awarded state financing. Um, they're wrapping up those um, requirements to close on the financing, and we anticipate the uh, land trust acquisition for this project in July. I'm sorry, in June, and construction starting in July. So it appears to be on track, and it's a 20-unit affordable housing project by Bully for special needs. Blue Dolphin Tower, this is a recently approved project. The board approved two projects um, recently. This one is the one we um, are adding additional funds for it to move forward in the Clearwater CRA area. It's another Blue Sky project. Blue Sky is the developer of a number of projects that we've done over the years, including the recently opened um, Skyway Lofts. This project will be located on the former fire station in downtown Clearwater. We're expecting construction begin early 23 on this project. Seminole Square Apartments, 96 units of affordable housing, 100% affordable at both 80% and 60% AMI. Um, this project is located in Largo, um, so it's a central location in the county, which is uh, a much, much needed affordable housing location. Uh, we also anticipate this to begin construction in the fall of 2022 this year. So that concludes the nine of the 10 projects that the board has already approved. Um, the one project that was withdrawn is 6090. That was a project that's um, located on Central Avenue in St. Petersburg. Uh, the project is moving forward, but they've opted to not participate in the affordable housing program. Um, basically, it's an economic decision on the rent increases, the property value increasing. They've decided to move forward with a market rate product rather than um, setting aside affordability requirements as a result of the um, funding. So it, it's kind of a a symbol of the challenges that we're facing right now with the market increases in rent and the 20 to 25% range, land values rapidly escalating and the opportunity cost of developers looking at building housing and, and setting aside affordable units. On that project on Central, there, there was no um, density bonuses or extra, any of those kind of things that were granted that would now be rescinded or were they? There were not any density bonuses for affordable housing. As I understand it, there was a density bonus from the city that has some requirements, but those requirements do not include affordable housing. Okay, um, but from the city perspective, not the county? From the city perspective, right. right. Thank you. And so that project, both the city and the county had, had supported with uh, penny financing to set aside affordable units. Um, I understand. So in the pipeline, we have five projects currently under review. Two of those um, we anticipate bringing to you shortly, probably as early as next month. Um, that would be the Fairfield Avenue Apartments Project and the Lemon Trail. Lemon Trail being located um, off in what we call Lemon Heights area. Um, that project the board approved in the past. Um, it was acquired with Penny 3 funds. They've been delayed um, as a challenge of finding primary financing, as well as cost increases. So they have applied for $2 million of assistance to move that project forward. Um, we're feeling pretty confident that they'll be able to do that with, with those additional funds. So we'll bring bringing those two projects to you next month. 
the other ones on the list, we're continuing to work with the developers, um, negotiating and, and learning more about those projects for potential future um, recommendations. Market challenges. I think we all know that we're having market challenges. Um, and it's really affecting the program. I'm talking about 6090. That's a project that kind of demonstrates all of those challenges. Um, and we're looking at statistics. Uh, 2021 year, we saw the greatest increase in rents that probably in history, um, based on different sources. It's anywhere from 20 to 26 percent increases during 2021. Those numbers are continuing to rise. Um, just saw a report this week um, based on HUD data from 2022 that the Tampa Bay region is now ranked 18th in the country for the highest median rents. And so the rents are just rapidly increasing, not by five, not by 10%, not by 50, not by $100, but by hundreds of dollars. Um, I think we've probably all either been impacted or know people that have. I know some of my colleagues have, have gone home and, and found a notice from their apartment owner that their rent was going up $300 if they signed in two weeks, $500 if, if they waited a month. So I think there's been some pretty good media coverage about the challenges that renters are facing with this market escalating so rapidly. And we're focused on rental housing, but it's also impacting home ownership. Um, statistics from the Penthouse Realtor Organization now have the Median home sales price for single family homes in Pinellas County, February of this year at $411,000. That's a 24.5% increase over last February. So whereas in the past, often homeowners, the home housing market might be lower, it's renters are able to move into the housing market, but now they're not able to make that move with housing prices and the single family and the townhome market going up so high, they're kind of getting stuck in their rental units and not able to take that step into home ownership. Conversely, they're seeing their rents increase. So it, whereas often the rental market might be up and the housing market down, both markets are, are rapidly escalating now. So it's really impacting so many people, not just in our county, but in the Tampa Bay area and, and frankly across most of the country. Is there, uh, and I know we have some, you. Uh, some flyers and things that were dropped on our desk this morning, but it, would the state have to declare a state of emergency for housing to, to for the attorney general or someone to uh, investigate gouging? Is there a percentage of home? I mean, is there any kind of gouging rules that would go into uh, to be availed to look at for protection of consumers? Um, you know, we wouldn't let increases like this happen with water or necessarily power or other things. But with housing, there seems to be no limit to what increases. And I'm not talking about a new development that, you know, you can roll in new cost of construction and et cetera. But folks like you're talking about who come home, who've been in a building that's 30 years old, 50 years old, and suddenly they're getting a $5,000 rent increase just because they can. Later in our presentation, Evan and others are going to talk about some of the other housing issues going on and what some of those options might be. Um, I think that's you know certainly a legal question that um, Jewel might be able to help and respond to. I know that um, many of you have probably read some of the articles with some of our surrounding local governments that have looked at rent control. And really, I mean, we can look further in the statutes to see whether... You know, normally we see price gouging uh, controls go into effect around... Um, disasters like hurricanes or the like, but the primary statute that many of us have looked at is the state statute that relates to rent controls, and it's just simply ineffective at this point um, because it hasn't been updated since the 70s, and it basically disallows rent control in luxury buildings, which is defined as anything with a rent over $250. So it has obviously not been updated since the 70s, um, the statute itself does not provide for indexing of that rental rate, but if you did index it, it still only gets you to about not even $1,200, which again is not what we're seeing here. So the main statute that we've looked at, which is the rent control um, statute, and those are just a couple of the hurdles. You have, to pat, you have to take action here and then send it to a referendum, and then it's only good for one year. So there are substantial hurdles you know, we can look into some others, but we have not identified any that would apply. So I just didn't know if that was, I mean, obviously we're talking a lot about Tampa Bay, but it's across the state and, and, and nationally to some degree, um, and didn't know if the state uh, had 
you know, had that kind of conversation if anyone had heard that. So, but I'll, I'll wait for the rest of the presentation. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we've tried to outline different ideas and options that we can either look into more things that we can do, um, short term, long term. And so we're going to get into that. And we formed a little team to review these options to prepare the list that you have before you. Commissioner Long. Yes, and I'd just like to speak to the comments that Jewel just made uh, for one second, because it leads me to think about a lot of other issues as well. But, you know, to, to, to be held hostage by something that hasn't been updated since the 70s, and it's now 2022, seems a little bit insane to me. Because if we just think our, about our own personal lives, what are we dealing with today that is the same as what it was in the 1970s? I can't think of anything, quite frankly. And so where I would like to more focus on where does that leave us in trying to be leaders to more uh, appropriately address this issue. I mean, people are at their wit's end trying to make ends meet. And do you focus on your roof over your head? Or are you more worried about putting food on the table? And I could argue it's both at this point. And so something's got to give somewhere. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just sharing, um, in California in 2019, I think it was, there, the issue came up about rental rates and price gouging. And the question came up as to whether or not um, housing could fall under that um, particular spectrum. There was a state of emergency, though, put in place at the time. But it was determined that um, anything that would increase those rental rates 10% or greater um, would be considered um, price gouging. So I don't know if we want to look at what they did. I mean, California is not uh, Pinellas County, but it looks like we're heading in that direction when you look at the cost of goods and services. So I don't know if we want to look at, at that particular model and see what they did and how they were able to, to change some things. One example was uh, a gentleman's rent went from like $835 to over $2,000. And I don't know about others, but I know I've gotten some emails where a person's rent has increased $800 a month, not you know as drastic as what we're having here. Um, and then of course, some of the seniors out um, uh, a little bit, uh, a complex a little bit past Gulfport, um, while their rent only increased $125 a month, still when you're on Social Security, $125 a month is a lot of money because that's your income that you, you don't have any other place to get it. And you're limited if you work, if you can work, you're limited as it relates to how many hours you can work before you have to give up some of your Social Security benefits. So it's a catch-22 um, for that group. Um, the other thing is I, I had a realtor friend um, comment that um, they felt like issues with uh, property taxes and things like that was really lending to a lot of the issues. And um, I, don't, I don't believe that to be so. I truly believe that, of course, the increase in insurance premiums. So if you own a rental property, you're in it to make money, you're going to pass that cost on along to the person that's renting from you. So I, I get that. But I don't believe that property taxes, the property tax that they're paying on that particular property has anything to do with them making the decision to raise rents over 415% in some cases. Um, um, and then the final thing I'll say is I was just wondering, as many other people, just who's buying these units? I mean, there are some units in downtown St. Pete that's going for $4 million, and that's not even the top floor. Uh, apartments. Um, and so some of them are from persons who are out of town and maybe this is gonna be their retirement home, but then is that property going to sit vacant until they retire for two, three years, or are they re-renting that um, to other individuals? So I don't know if we could uh, address some, some accountability um, in those areas. 
but it's I understand it's a touchy subject because if a person purchases a property, you know, they should be able to make certain decisions within the realm of the law with that. But um, we're the population that once could afford to live that working family, they're not going to be able to to afford it. If they move from the apartment they're in right now, there's nowhere else really for them to go because they'll be paying um, more. And we can't build fast enough to replace um, what what will be needed for those people who are finding themselves working very hard and earning a decent salary, um, but still can't afford where they live, let alone um, to move somewhere else. So I guess it's gonna be tiny homes <laughs> um, and other things like that that'll probably, um, we may not uh, really wanna see a whole bunch of those, but we may have to look at, at what we can do in those areas in that, in that degree. Um, something that can be built quick, fast, um, is safe, but is affordable and may not necessarily uh, succumb to some of the um, material concerns or the ability to get some of the materials in for the traditional way that we construct units. Um, but I do appreciate all of the information you, you brought us and um, it's some, some really good information. The only, I just have one um, property, I mean, one activity that you listed here and that's uh, the Burlington Post 2 where it's only 15, I mean, 76 units, but they want $10 million. So I have a, yeah, that uh, gave me a little that's heartburn. Not coming, that, that's still in discussion. That's, <laughs> yeah. not, that's not a recommendation or something no, I, coming yeah, to you. I just, I just wanted to throw my two cents in there since it says <laughs> projects under review. Yeah. That for, you know, if we're going to do 10 million, I'm expecting a whole bunch of, <laughs> yeah. bunch of units, yeah. not 76. <laughs> And I can assure you we've had a similar conversation with the applicant. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they figured if you don't ask, you know what I'm saying? Um, you may see that project in the future, but with much different numbers. And um, I don't know how my colleagues feel, but if, we're gonna, if we are going to continue to focus on using penny dollars um, for persons who are building affordable, um, I would like for us to even consider uh, having a a percentage, a threshold of how many units they have to have. Because if you're building 200 units and only 18 of them are affordable, I appreciate the 18, but is that really the best bang for our buck to support that project? You see what I'm saying? Um, versus you have someone that builds 145 units and all 145, you know, fall within that 60, 80, 120 AMI. So that group has shown us it can be done, that they can do it. They can put that together, they can make a little money, and they can pro provide affordability versus us giving to someone who has over 200 units, but they only want to designate 18 um, as affordable. So um, maybe that's for further discussion or something. But yeah, I think it is. And we've, we've struggled you know, with how to put that, even when we talked about small areas and how to fit in some affordable housing, even though it's a really small project. Um, and so we were looking at larger projects and then we had areas where they really needed some workforce housing, in particular down in the area that you were talking about. And, you know, we said, well, let's, you know, maybe if the unit cost is reasonable compared to other ones, then it's still okay. And so we really look kind of getting down to the unit cost. We're not going to subsidize market rate housing, right. but if they, and we're really approaching developers and trying to get them to include some affordable housing. So that to the extent we can get them to do that, you know, we're we're kind of reacting to their development plans. And as we've seen with one, you know, they they can make all the money in the world in the private, you know, in just the private market right now. And so getting them to include something, you know, helps. And if and especially if the subsidy is not very high, because then that really drives down the unit cost. In in regard to your the other comments, you know, we're we're going to get um, Bruce up next. I'm sorry, we're going to get Evan up next along with Karen. We put together a group made up of you know housing community development human services consumer protection office of human rights communications county attorney's office to really look and explore all these different options a lot of that is limited by state law um, and what is provided for us in statute um, by the state and so um, we've tried to look at ideas and that's the reason we want to bring it here maybe you have additional ideas that we can explore um, but we, we wanted to kind of put a, you know, a menu of options available and kind of work through them, both what we can do, what's practical, and also what is legal. 
uh, that we can act on. So that's going to be the next part of the presentation. And um, again, it's it, this is a kind of a first run at it, and you know, we'll we'll see where it goes. And my la my last comment or question is the property that Commissioner Justice was talking about, which is um, kind of in between that nursing home facility, but it's across the street from a market rate uh, complex that was recently built. It's down the street from the old Demet um, auto dealer, which is a complete complex. So you're going to have um, a lot of new activity in that area. Um, will that impact the level of service? Have we looked at how that will impact the level of service for roads right along US-19? Because it's already very heavy with traffic. Well, on, um, on Bruce's side, he's looking at the affordable housing piece. Um, that's a development question, and that would be for the city of St. Petersburg, because they're still... No, that's Pinellas know, Park. Uh, although for Pinellas Park. Yeah, so it's still within the city. They're going to have to review that as, okay. as part of the development process. I wasn't sure if that was something that we also took a look at when we're... Because we always get calls about... You know, it's increasing the amount of traffic on the roads and, and things of that nature. So thank you for redirecting me. I appreciate it. I've got a couple more commissioners that went away. And uh, Commissioner Gerard? Yeah, I just, <laughs> I have all kinds of comments about that stuff, but I guess we're going to talk about that. I just had one question before Bruce sits down. Um, the Rainbow Village Project, and I can't remember what the name of it is. Heritage Oaks. still alive. Absolutely. <laughs> it's uh, called Heritage Oaks, which would be the first phase of four phases of redeveloping Rainbow Village. Still alive. Um, they were awarded 9% tax credits from Florida Housing Finance Corporation. Um, it's a very lengthy process to get from the award to the closing, and it's actually probably going to be end of the year before they close on that, and they're anticipating starting construction early 23. Are we uh, participating in that at all? Or uh, we, we provided a $610,000 commitment in support of the tax credit application, and... So far, that's the... And that's uh, senior housing, right? Correct. Thanks. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, thank you for the presentation and you know some comments probably later, but just a couple of questions for you. Um, number of projects that we're seeing um, don't look like many. Um, but these are the ones that are under review. Um, What's, what, are you, what are you hearing out there as the major issues? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I may have a little, take a little exception with the fact that, you know, a 5% or 10% raise in property taxes don't have any bearing. That gets passed on to renters for sure, and so do the insurance costs. And that could be 10% of the value, 10% of the cost, and that bump gets done regardless of market adjustments. So the market adjustments are what they're claiming, and that's the big piece clearly. But what are you hearing out there? Why are we not seeing more projects than, well, I'm seeing five under review. I'd say the number one reason is land availability and cost. Um, you know, finding a site to build a sizable project is quite challenging. Um, you know, there's not too many vacant areas. You've got to look at something that's probably been developed and just, you know, the cost increases over the last year. Um, you know, the 6090 project, one of the reasons they decided to go another route, they got an offer to buy the land at a significantly increased amount than what they paid for it. And so not only is it challenging to find that land, to purchase that land, but the investment that goes into that to do something other than maximize market profitability is, is more and more challenging. On the smaller scale, you know, we work very closely with Habitat for Humanity, and in past years we'd provide them a, a ship loan to go out and buy a lot for thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And I was talking to, to Ken Rush the other day, and he had two vacant lots in Dansville. $225,000 was the price that they wouldn't come off of for two lots. He saw another one on the MLS in South St. Pete for $80,000, and that's the lowest number he'd seen for quite some time. So, you know, that's, that's a smaller scale project, but just those land values to find a project to get started is very limiting. And then, you know, construction costs, we're seeing everything from 17 to over 20% increases over the last year on construction costs. Um, so that's, I think, playing a role in terms of the timing of projects, projects that have been in the pipeline. You know, if a developer's got several projects going on, they're slowing in terms of taking on new projects until they get those finished. It's kind of slowing down the, the production at that rate as well. But, but I think the land is probably the number one challenge. Yeah, you almost, you almost get to the point where, like, on the... Uh Habitat homes where you're just, you know, you underwrite the value of the land completely. And that, 
that cost as a percentage of the overall cost is so high that it really does make a significant difference and it gets people into owning versus you know renting sooner as well but yeah i shared the same comment about burlington post too i mean these are the five that are in the in the running and you look at wedgwood villas and they're about the same number of units that are being delivered at five times the the ask so it, I don't know what they're getting, what they're asking or delivering for that additional ask, but um, uh, interesting. Um, and as it relates to, you, you made the comment about, um, I think you said, much needed housing location. So um, I noticed that you know a lot of the the applications or the ones that we've done are uh, mid South County. Are you are you not seeing it around the quote poverty zones that were identified several years ago, like in Clearwater area? Uh, Greenwood is specifically or Tarpon Springs that has a, a you know one of those uh, defined locations or, or zones yeah we have seen um, some projects in Clearwater we've got two projects currently anticipating in Clearwater um, there's a third project that we're anticipating an am application in the near future um, we haven't seen any new applications from the Tarpon area um, we did recently have a project open there Eagle Ridge in fact there's going to be a Mm -hmm. Ribbon cutting May 18th for that project. Um, that project was county supported with NS with neighborhood stabilization program dollars. So we have done some projects in the Tarpon Springs area over the years, but in the last year or two, we've not seen a new application from that it, area. It's really not. It's not really size of the project driven. Clearly, you've got some that are large and some that are smaller. So just if it, I'm just trying to make sure that because I've heard of a couple of folks that have made applications and. They're not really being looked at as favorably, but it's not really size of the project so much. I mean, if we're getting 100 units versus 10 units, you're going to be paying a lot more into that 100 unit project. So um, if we can find some 10 and 20 unit projects, that, that makes sense too. Oh, absolutely. Um, in terms of the penny program, the only size limit is a minimum of 10 units. But even a project that was smaller than that, we would look at that for some other funding, the SHIP funding or CDBG, for example. So there's really no minimum size requirement. Now, you know, all things being even, if we could spend the same amount and get a larger project with more units, you know, that would, would score better. But they're, you know, okay. we're basically working with any developer to, to find a project where we can, can buy units, um, kind of put some program considerations on on this slide to talk about and maybe bring back at a later date, but you know, in the past we've always talked about filling the gap and the last one in and and you know, pretty much making the developer get everything ready to go except for that needed piece and then come to us. But we're really looking at a more a new model now where it's it's almost like we're buying units. You know, a developer's gonna build a project. Can we partner with them? Can we add some dollars to their project in return for them setting aside affordable units? So that's kind of a different concept that we're trying to work with and, and the market conditions are making that even harder than it was two years ago when, yeah. we, when we went down that route. But. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Beth. Commissioner Seal. Thank you. Um, so Bruce, from my, I'm trying to um, remember on, when it goes into the land trust, do they pay real estate taxes on the construction piece of it or on the entire project? On the entire project. Okay. Um, that doesn't make the project tax, ex tax exempt. Um, mm -hmm. So in other words, the, the owner, the developer, the improvements pays taxes for both the property and the improvements once it's constructed. Um, it's never been a model to eliminate property taxes, if you will. Um, affordable restrictions can get the overall value reduced so that the tax amount is less, but it's still a taxable property. Okay. But the housing authority, those are off the tax rolls. Housing authority owned properties are tax exempt, correct. Okay. Um, are any of these companies that are doing the projects under construction now or the projects under review not for profits? Um, yes. That you know, the company's status is not it's not required to be a nonprofit. Okay. So Southport, for example, is not necessarily a nonprofit. Most of them establish a LLC for the development. Mm -hmm. um, also, where are we in analyzing the land that the county owns, whether any of that could be used for affordable housing? Um, I believe real estate management is wrapping up that process and we'll be bringing an item to you in the near future to um, identify some of those 
potential parcels. Kevin Knutson, Assistant County Administrator. Uh, we have the complete inventory and we're working with colliers to determine which lands could be used for which purposes. We have about 110 we've identified so far and we're gonna start bringing those back to you um, to get approval to move forward to move some of them either to affordable housing or to put them for sale out on the market. Okay. Um, the other thought that I had was um, could we create our own tax credit program? Have we considered that? I guess I would liken the HFA multifamily bond program as tax credit like. Um, it's basically a 4% tax credit program. Um, so when you say our own tax credit program, would you, are you talking about property taxes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Meaning, could we replicate kind of what the state's doing? But I mean, we, we do it for other things where we're doing <coughs> economic development projects and abating taxes. I mean, could we you do would, the same would, for affordable housing? We would most, we could look into it, but we would most likely need some kind of statutory authority to do that. Mm -hmm. um, imposition of ad valorem taxes is very highly regulated. And of course that includes any exemptions from ad valorem taxes. I mean, like I said, we could look into it, but I suspect that it would need to be enabled by the state. Okay. but. I'm thinking back to when we did the Nielsen project. That was an economic development project, but we did abate taxes on that particular one. Just thinking of, you know, is there another model that we could put into place rather than putting cash up front into it? Um, and then my other thought is, even though the land has gone up, and I'm glad to hear we have quite a few properties, but, you know, is there any opportunity because of rising, rising construction Prices at the present time, whether we could land bank and just, you know, find, put it in the land trust and bank it for a while. Just, I'm, because <laughs> some of these, you know, you look at the limits of what we have to invest with the penny, and I'm just trying to figure out if there's a different yeah. way to get some other bang for our buck to. I think you, you raised that question before. Is this the right time you know, yeah. to be investing in these? And it's, it's a fair question. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's also, you know, trying to pull out your crystal ball about whether things are going to get better. I know. <laughs> you know, um, you know we, and that's one of the reasons we, we reached out to developers because we're really trying to get them to include some affordable units in their larger development because mm -hmm. then you get the economies of scale. The big issue is some will get tax credits, some won't. And so the amount per unit that we have to pay then is going to be fluctuated by the other types of financing they're able to secure to drive down that cost. The question you have, it's it's a developer bringing it forward, so we'd have to work with them to kind of stop the project. And so it, it just becomes more a little more complicated, but we can certainly look at it, especially the ones where we have mm -hmm. um, control over. Right. I just some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Attorney White. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, respond to the question about the price gouging statute in the state of Florida. Um, that is specifically linked to a declaration of a state of emergency. The statute appears to only apply when that emergency has been declared by the state of Florida. Um, those are, of course, in 60-day increments and would rely on the state of Florida to enact that. Um, keep in mind, even if, it, if we were able to declare such an emergency and take advantage of that statute at the local level, we are now limited to 42 days in total for a declaration of emergency um, on the same topic, uh, unless it's like a hurricane or some kind of natural disaster. So it does not appear to be a statute that would apply in this instance. Um, it does you know, state that it applies to a dwelling unit as a direct result of the emergency. Uh, so if there was an emergency declared as to a housing you know, emergency, in theory, it would apply, but a very limited duration, not a long-term solution, and really we, we would be relying on the state of Florida to put that declaration into place. And again, theirs are limited to 60 days unless extended. Thank you very much. All right, we've, we've sidetracked you, so please uh, carry on. <laughs> well, I think um, um, great conversation and, and a lot of good points. Um, kind of touched on this slide, some program considerations. We're always looking to improve the program. Um, we're talking to developers, getting their feedback. Overall, it's been pretty positive. 
Um, a couple of things that we want to look at and possibly bring back is adding a little bit more flexibility to the approval process. Um, they're really looking for approval early on. If they've got county approval, that there's going to be some funding there that helps them go leverage that when they go to their other financing sources. So we're looking at ways that we can maybe bring those projects to you sooner to give the developers sort of your stamp of approval that you're supportive of the project, behind the project. They know that earlier on and, and can help both expedite their process and gain other financing. Also looking at ways where we can provide a little bit more flexibility in our funding sources that, you know, if we think we're going to fund a project with $2 million a penny today, if six months from now it makes a lot more sense to use ship dollars or another source um, to be able to, to kind of make that change without slowing the project down. And the other thing, we want to look at our ground lease methodology. We started the ground lease program with Penny 3 back in 2015, I think it was, and established a formula for annual lease payments that's below market, but it's still a payment. And in today's market, we think, you know, it probably makes sense to reduce that, maybe not to the dollar a year level, but something lower that, you know, again, reduces the overall project cost. So we're looking at that methodology. Um, you know, now it's almost competing with construction loan dollars that Penny 4 can provide because that's a forgivable loan, so they're not making payments on, on those dollars where they are making payments on the ground lease. So we're, we're going to make a, some analysis of that and come back with a recommendation on how to maybe alter that and make the ground lease more attractive because I think there's a long-term benefit there. If we're getting 50 units, if we can preserve those long-term, there's obviously a, a lot better, better economic value for that long-term affordability. So with that, that pretty much summarizes the Penny 4 program. If there aren't any other questions, I'd be happy to, to turn it over to Evan for the next part of the presentation. And I will mention while he's coming up, um, you've got at your, at your desk there a um, brochure that the communications department has put together summarizing the affordable housing program activities over the last five years. So thank them for that. I think that's a nice piece that captures a lot of data and a few pages of the things that the county has been doing. So, thank you. Oh, not that I need it. Go back to my slide. There you go. I may use uh, Bruce's slide since I don't have a presentation. Um, so you all should have received this document uh, talking about some of the other initiatives, affordable housing initiatives that we are undertaking or have been undertaking um, already. So. What I would like to do is go through what's under the Housing Community Development section, and then I hand it over to Karen Yatchum from Human Services to talk a little bit about the uh, work that they've been doing since, as Barry mentioned, this group's been formed. And I know that I listed a Tenants Bill of Rights at the first of my list here on this sheet, but I'm going to start with the stuff that we're already in process with and that we're working on as Housing Community Development, and then I'll come back to that and we can, because I have a feeling that's going to be a little more conversation. Uh, about that particular item on this list. So first, from a housing compact, you all are very well aware and briefed on a housing compact. Um, just to give you an idea of a couple of things that we'll be doing in the coming months. Uh, one, we are gonna be, uh, we've got a joint letter with Ford Pinellas we're gonna be sending out to recruit other municipalities um, into the compact itself. So giving presentations, trying to get other folks to sign on, that's something we'll be doing. We're working on some website updates that include trying to make it more of a one-stop shop to connect to programs, whether they be emergency programs or regular programs at not only the county, but also our partner cities that are in the compact. Those will be happening in the next, anywhere from the next three to six, seven months, depending on the level of complexity that we get to with that. Uh, we have an action plan. We're meeting with our partners uh, from the compact uh, actually tomorrow to talk about the development of the action plan, which was required in the uh, compact. So that'll be something we're basically what we're trying to do there is put together a, um, a collaborative document that kind of outlines what we want to be doing together and uh, tries to put some general timing to things. And the reason we want to do that is because, you know, these things can move very quickly. Suddenly St. Pete's doing something and it takes us by surprise. And if we like to think if we had a little more coordination, we can kind of be doing these things a little bit more hand in hand wherever possible. So that's something we'll be working on in the coming months as well. Um, and we'll be bringing, of course, bringing that back to you all uh, when we're there. You all have heard about our comp plan. Well, there are affordable housing related policies and density bonus changes that are going to be occurring within the, um, within the comp plan. Uh, that'll be, we're bringing that back in May, I believe is our goal to, for the transmittal hearing. So that'll be kind of going through that process with hopefully an October adoption date. 
um, as well. Um, our code update, uh, I just was reading through a draft scope of work for the affordable housing development code update. Uh, that would include kind of fine tuning our uh, review processes, fine tuning our incentives, working with what the affordable housing um, advisory committee has given us as far as recommendations and bringing that back to you as code amendments in the coming year. So we expect to have recommendations in the fourth quarter um, for your consideration and discussion. Um, and that'll be kind of coming in concert with the AHAC, their, the Affordable Housing Committee's uh, recommendations. But we won't be bringing code amendments back until after probably the new year um, is when we'll be coming back to you all with formal adoption of, of those amendments. Um, Want to see if the, one of the other items, and I know I believe uh, Mr. Lowak will be talking a little bit more about this since it is related to changes from the legislature. Uh, on the back, we've got a discussion about um, there was a bill in this session, uh, 962, related to industrial lands, uh, non residential lands, and affordable housing. Um, so essentially, uh, the Ford Pinellas is undergoing its industrial land study right now. Um, we are very much involved in that. Uh, and what we're looking to do is kind of take those criteria, those ideas that they bring back from that study, and kind of use that for the implementation of the requirements of these new state, state laws. Um, so that'll be something that happens. I believe their study is going to be done by August. Um, and so at that point, we'll be looking at, you know, what have they identified as recommendations and what does that mean for our code when we're thinking about uh, transitioning land uses and things like that for housing. Um, so that'll be something that you'll be seeing um, in the coming months. And um, the last item I certainly wanted to mention was um, the multimodal impact fee um, ordinance. Uh, so. I believe it was in 2019, um, the state legislature uh, gave, uh, changed the law to allow for a waiver of impact fees for affordable housing. This would be as opposed to a, you know, writing down the cost, which is typically how you would have to do it. You'd have to apply some revenue from elsewhere. So because of that waiver is now available, that's something that we would like to look into and have a conversation about. It would be a um, essentially, if you meet certain criteria, affordable housing criteria, we could waive those transportation impact fees. It's something that we've had conversations with with some of our other compact partners. Um, so we'll most likely will be having that discussion in the near future. Uh, just a minor change to the ordinance to allow for that flexibility. Um, and then the other thing would be much more of a kind of a longer term possibility would be a discussion of a larger uh, look at that ordinance, at the transportation impact fee ordinance. Um, not just as it relates to affordable housing, but how it relates to some of those other things we're trying to do about encouraging housing in the right locations and things like that. And now I'll go have, back to my first one. one, just one second. We have have a, before yes, you get going, what, mm -hmm. can you give us a time period on the serving as a single source of, source of information for affordable housing programs? So, you know, I mean, yes, there was a yes. lot of interest there to get that mm -hmm. up and running like, you know, yesterday rather than, you know. So we've been working with communications um, and they, uh, to, to basically start to collect all those pieces. Um, from not only, for, they're focusing on the county's programs and the county's different websites. Uh, we're meeting again with our other partners tomorrow and I wanna kind of bring that up as well so they can start to provide us those links and that information. So we really think that we'll be able to have the website updated as kind of that one point of entry um, in the next three to four months um, that we could have that refresh done. So essentially it'll be kind of an iterative as we get the information up, it'll be, we'll be updating the site accordingly. But given that there's probably, even on the county side, we probably have 10 to 15 different pages that have information related to housing or rent support or those types of things, we just want to have a place where go to homesforpinellas.org, find you know, uh, rent assistance, find down payment assistance, and be able to link out to those things very, very quickly. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to do, because I think at least the consensus amongst um, you know, the, not only the internal groups but our partners is, uh, there's a lack of knowledge of some of these programs. You know, the, the, I work in housing and community development and I swear I still learn sometimes some of the unique funding sources and programs that we have available as well. Yes, sir. But I also think the questions the commissioners raised last time is, you know, if somebody needs affordable housing, where do they go? I mean, I, I want to be able to yes. find it. I, you know, it just information mm -hmm. is helpful, but 
you know, that link is very difficult. I right. wouldn't know where to send someone. Right. So, so we are, um, and on the Homes for Pinellas website, we currently link out to, I believe it's Florida, Florida Housing Finance Corporation. They have a housing search, floridahousingsearch.com, I believe. I'm looking over at Bruce. He shook his head. Um, so that is a, probably right now, the best database for uh, affordable units that I'm aware of in the state. You can look at it by county. You, it'll give you your location. Now, I will say, like any good database, it's only updated as much as the landlords are updating it. Um, but that would be the best site right now, and we do link to that. We have had a conversation with St. Pete, um, and we plan on continuing this conversation with our other partners about some ideas about how we might be able to do this uh, in a more comprehensive way for the county as a whole. Um, the challenge, of course, is always, you know, our goal is not to suddenly have to commit a significant amount of staff time to maintaining such a database, right? So we're trying to walk the, you know, we can put in that initial cost to help develop the site or something like that, but ultimately making sure that we understand how most effectively uh, to get that, uh, that data continually updated. So it's dynamic, because otherwise we, nobody will use it. Um, but to your point, I think it's a huge, I think it's a very significant problem in that people don't know where these units are, particularly the subsidized ones. Um, but even outside of the officially subsidized ones um, or set-asides, you know, I, I think there's probably a lack of good information as to where you could find just a more affordable you know, unit right now, um, you know, more affordable development. There are, they are out there. Um, certainly they're maybe not as affordable as they used to be, but there is a stock out there that, you know, for lack of a better term, they call it the naturally occurring affordable housing, which essentially just means, you know, somewhat depreciated older units, but they're out there and making, helping make those connections is something we want to be looking at doing. I believe I set aside, uh, I said in the next, you know, year, eight to 12 months, uh, we could have a database like that. That will be revised as soon as we start to kind of brainstorm together and figure out some options. Um, that's the best way to do it. Yes, sir, sorry. Uh, Commissioner Gerard had a question. Oh. Actually, a couple. I can't remember if we talked about this mm -hmm. at the Affordable Housing Committee, but um, so my dream is to have developments um, that are similar to mobile home parks, only with actual stable housing, you mm -hmm. know, buildings. Is that something that our, um, because I think the people that live in good parks love that atmosphere and love that, um, right. you know, the size and the closeness and the, the no yard to deal with. Um, is that something that we have anywhere in our code that could even be done in terms of lot lines and floor area ratio and all that kind of good so stuff? Yes, ma'am. So the uh, the one place that it is currently is um, the non-conforming uh, mobile home or manufactured home park redevelopment or uh, ordinance. I'm not going to remember the exact uh, citation okay. at the moment. Where's Glenn Bailey? Um, he could help us. Uh, but basically what that does is that allows for that, uh, any of the vested uh, density you had on the site, because you're right, I mean, a lot of those lots are very small. They put a lot of units on there. You could do one-for-one one replacement um, within that, so whether it's an upgraded unit or some other type of unit. The challenges that we've just, from our research as we've been doing the manufactured housing strategy, include things like, well, how do you address, uh, you know, where do we draw the line with parking requirements or modern stormwater or those types of things, which we've come a long way since, since a lot of those parks have been created. So that's kind of a... And there's probably a need for some operational kind of clarity as to how we address those moving forward. The other issue that was very interesting just from doing research is finding people, um, you're really getting into the modular home model at that point, uh, maybe not quite tiny home, but a modular home that could be put on a foundation and become an actual, you know, to Florida building code type home. Finding one that fits on a, on a parcel like that, a small site like that, is also kind of a unique challenge because they are a lot of the tiny homes are built to a certain standard, but they're not built to building code. And so... Well, not yet. Not yet, right. But, you know, I think that that might be coming. You know, I think we... Um, I was reading an article not too long ago about housing and how we've kind of dictated what the size of housing by the minimum lot sizes we have and all, because mm -hmm. a developer will come in and 
still to the lot. Yeah. So if we allow those smaller lots in some places, and you know, I guess I want, I want to know whether we can do it outside of the mobile home strategy. Mm -hmm. If you had a piece of land out there that, um, you know, could fit 20 small homes. They don't have to be tiny. They could be sure. eight or 900 square feet, you know? Right. But I mean, yeah, I'd like us to be able to do that or have that as some sort of an exception somewhere. If somebody wanted to do, particularly if somebody wanted to try something like that and didn't want to have to get, you know, there are some, burial, there are some really, on everything. as we've been looking at the code update and having those conversations, there are some really interesting um, developments in the region that do that. Um, I know Hillsborough's got a couple now that are just exactly like they're 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 tiny homes, but they're really modular. You know, they're on a foundation there's something and all in Gainesville that. Too. Yeah, and and so I think there's an opportunity there, but we're going to have to try to figure out what was the, what what were the mechanisms they used to do that? Is it a bonus? Is it you know that makes it more flexible? Because the last thing I want to do is just say, well, if you go through a plan amendment and a rezoning and the six other steps, yeah. then you can do it because that also defeats the purpose, right? We want to. You know, if you're doing good things, we want to make it as easy as possible. <laughs> yeah, with setbacks on the lot size exactly. and all that. Um, so good, I'd like to look at that. Um, what was I going to ask? Um, is part of the Tenant's Bill of Rights that we're working on mm -hmm. um, a minimum notice of either non-renewal of lease or rate increase? Because I, the Apartment it, Association was asking about that. And, thinks that 60 days on a year-long lease would be a good time. Gets a little more complicated when you have a month-to-month -month or weekly or anything, but. So I will say that um, what we've done so far is we've pulled the recent examples here in the region. We've been digging through kind of the pieces that we think make the most sense for what, you know, we're trying to accomplish. So we haven't um, specifically laid out, this is what we think um, that should should be as far as a noticing requirement, but every one of the ones uh, that we've looked at and, and even the drafts that we've played around with are certainly going to have specific notice requirements, um, ensuring that they're getting notices, particularly of fines, um, because mm -hmm. that becomes an issue if they don't know they're supposed to be paying fines or they're not giving fair notice that something's wrong, then suddenly they're getting hit with bills that are you know not unexpected and they don't have the flexibility to be able to pay those and that causes a problem. So I know that's been addressed as well. So. We haven't specifically come up with anything, but as, as you'll see in the list here, we, we do plan on pulling something, working, pulling something together and bringing it back to you all for a conversation. And we have the source of income yes. thing yes. in there. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right, thanks. When you're looking at those, when we're talking about tiny homes or in your modular, I mean, do we have anywhere in, in I guess it would be unincorporated where tiny homes, you could build tiny homes today? I am not 100% sure. I believe that we do have the flexibility in the code, but I would have to get back to you specifically with that reference. And then as you're talking about codes, mm -hmm. um, have we had requests for, or are we looking at more flexibility in auxiliary dwelling units and setbacks and yeah. all those kind of things? Uh, yes, sir. That, that tends to be one of the more common discussion points. Um, whether it be maximum size of the unit is something that people want us to look at. We currently allow up to 750 square feet max. Um, could they build it as long as it's smaller than the main unit? Could they build it bigger? Um, I think that's part of a discussion that we need to have, particularly as you're thinking about, you know, you may have an older home, smaller home, but you've got room for another unit and you could use that as a source of income, rent it out, um, and it becomes kind of builds, builds wealth in your, in your asset. Yeah, um, I think people are looking at, at mother-in-law yeah. uh, type things. I think they're looking at um, uh, adult children, uh, you know, yeah. uh, as far as, you know, affordability of how, I mean, it's just, it's there. And the other thing is we're talking, you, you mentioned the uh, older apartments um, and, and there are some, there are, you know, uh, there are apartments out there, but not certainly the quantity. No. And so, I mean, I have a friend who recently moved from St. Pete to Largo because there was a, a rate that she could afford mm -hmm. and it was available. Mm -hmm. Now, two months later, one closer to where she was came available, but there was no guarantee and there was no, you know. Yeah. So it's not, there's not 10 to choose from, there's zero or one. Yeah, And so, absolutely. Um, 
it pushes people out and now the transportation costs are higher and um, all those kind of things. Uh, two, two thoughts to that, to that point about transportation costs and all of that. I, I think that from the county's perspective, we certainly um, are looking at it, as you saw, St. Pete, of course, and St. Pete's put a lot of money in, in these projects as well. And in some cases, there's a, there's a very much a focus in the St. Pete area on the developments for Penny Four so far. Um, but I do think that we're looking at it as, and we've kind of said this with our, the housing compact partners, is that, you know, if you're in Loman, you're only 10 to 15 minutes from downtown St. Pete. If you're in Pinellas Park, the same. From a countywide perspective, as long as the, you have good access to transportation, that's better than, you know, that may also be part of solving the problem, is, is providing housing in a way that is close to good access uh, so you can get to your job, whether that be in the Gateway or St. Pete, but maybe it's not right there. So we do, you know, as I know as Barry and we've talked about in the last couple of years, that whole investment corridor idea is about how do we make sure that, well, they don't have to live right next to to their, house, to their place of employment, but they certainly need good access to it. And those codes that you're talking about that we won't see until 23, mm -hmm. I mean, are, what broadly, they, they address some of the things that we've been talking about today? Yes, so uh, they certainly, uh, tiny homes and a discussion of how we might integrate those more clearly is certainly part of that, the ADU discussion um, the other item that uh, I know we talked about in our AHAC meeting was if you build a, an ADU, must you, is there flexibility in the setbacks and things like that as well? Um, because right now you're supposed to meet the, the code standards. And then you've got, we've got a series of parking reductions, landscape reductions, building placement, bonuses. That's all going to be part of that update. Um, and. Uh, and I do hope while we won't be finalizing the adoption until early next year, we'll be bringing back those recommendations uh, and I expect the fourth quarter as just kind of recommendations. And then in uh, Commissioner Seal's point about properties, you know, it's interesting, uh, Universal and Disney both <laughs> set aside big swaths of land over there to, to develop because they know they needed it for their employees. Yeah. And we saw Jable cut, you know, set aside part of their land to mm -hmm. build, um, and so I just think about that as, as we have, do we have private landowners here as well that are, might not be zoned right or might not think that they're zoned right or not even think about it that we've approached or thought about approaching. And I, I think about the school board and I think about, and I was glad to hear that we're, we've got the inventory coming. Um, you know, it's just, it's kind of be every possible tool in the toolkit kind of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Commissioner Gerard. I heard from a school board board member the other day that they are looking at um, doing workforce housing for their employees on some of their vacant land. Good. Commissioner Peters. So on that note, um, you know, if the school board comes to us and wants us to help them with affordable workforce housing for just teachers, are we going to have every law enforcement agency come in and saying we want affordable housing for just law enforcement? And I kind of foresee that is going to kind of happen. And so that's why I think this directory is so important. But the question I had is, um, you know, are we working with those industries, you know, law enforcement, fire departments, um, the school board directly so that because they need to have housing to recruit new teachers to come here. We have to have housing to recruit law enforcement officers and fire department fire officers to come to come here. So. Um, I know we're going to do this directory and this, this way to find it, but I think there should be a direct connection, a direct communication link, just like Jable is doing it, you know, on their own. Um, we need to be doing that for, for the same thing. Otherwise, we're going to be building silos for each little individual industry. Right. And I just don't know that that's the, maybe the best path to be going. So... Um, well, we don't. We, we've heard that they're going to that the school board's going to come to us. Um, we, we haven't seen that application. It's a good question. Right. But uh, but I want to remind we respond to people that are proposing doing developments. We do not have the staff or geared up to be able to manage developments. Um, and so, you know, we're we're responsive in that. It would be a different approach if we went out and started trying to recruit to do developments like that because they would. We're, we can't do that. We're not set up to do that. If you want us to do that, it would just be a very different approach. We'd have to gear up, staff up, to be able to take that um, type of an approach. Um, and, and that makes it hard because 
you, you know, the question we had is, you know, why aren't there developments in North County and Tarpon Springs or wherever? And it's because we're reacting to people that are proposed. What we did do is hire contra contract staff to go out and talk to the development community and try to get them to participate in our vertical portal housing program. And so we've tried to encourage um, more developers that are building. I mean, you go up and down 19 and you see thousands of units and none of them are, have any affordability to it. It was a missed opportunity, I believe. Um, and so we're trying to reach out and say, work with us, incorporate some of that, and we have these funding sources available. Um, but we, but we're, we're, not, we're not building you know, units. And so I just wanted to re remind that because it, then it, it, it's not gonna be consistent because, it's, because we're reacting to proposals. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I, I guess if, if we're doing workforce housing, and you know, my question when I pose to you is, how, how do we know, once we give them the money and they open up, how, how do we know what they're doing? How do, how do we know that they're giving workforce housing? And, and after they do their first year lease, are they four years later still doing, I mean, how do we know? Is there accountability on checking up on that? Yeah. And I just think that if there's a link up, and, and this directory and this kind of thing that you're talking mm -hmm. about, but you have a direct link up, in which workforce, because we're saying this is workforce mm -hmm. housing, that workforce has a way to connect. I mean, how do we know the hospitality industry is connected up so that when they need their groundskeepers and their housekeepers and stuff, that they're connected up to this kind of, you know, we're, we're spending all this money on it, but how do we know yeah. that they're not working with these industries to make sure that they're going in there? And where's the accountability to make sure that four years later, they're still doing what they said they were gonna do? Well, and so I just- those. So I do know that this directly should help. Mm -hmm. um, at least there's a place to go to and say, all right, here's some units. We want to hire some folks. There's units here. Here's who your contact to get your housing. Um, I think that's a huge step. But I, you know, I just, you know, I just want to make sure there's accountability on whatever it is that we're 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 doing. And Evan, you you monitor those yearly, correct? Yeah. So our community development side, that's part of any agreement that would have about setting aside a unit that they're. Uh, and I believe sometimes it's a private firm. I know Bruce can speak to it, but there is a required monitoring that's ongoing uh, with okay. any anybody who has a. a yeah, an I'm just curious where they're getting the people. Are they getting them from out of other counties, or are they getting it from our workforce industry? Where do they where do they get where do they get the people that are going to be staying in those workforce housing or affordable housing? And I can't answer that question in terms of who's being housed in those units from where they lived before that unit or what their occupation is necessarily. The restrictions that are put in place are for income. So we go out on an annual basis and monitor to make sure that they have files for the minimum number of units. And we look at the income documentation of those applicants to make sure that they meet that requirement. So, you know, those restrictions do not place a restriction on a type of job or any other thing other than income. So we're monitoring that income requirement on an annual basis, but um, all the programs that we administer do not have a, a job preference priority or limitation to a, an occupation. But to your, your point, Commissioner, we as we get this website built out, we certainly can market that mm -hmm. and talk to our, our hospitality industry, talk to um, any of the um, areas that you just referred to right. and make sure they and they know that this is available at least. Okay, because um, we, so we, 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 we are selling this as workforce housing, but it's not a workforce credential. We're not collecting that workforce information. So we don't know if we're providing more workforce housing for any one industry because we're not collecting that data, right? But we're selling this as workforce housing. So when I say, no, we're not doing affordable housing, what people think, Section 8, we're doing workforce housing to ensure that people can afford you know, we can recruit good people. And so I think if we're gonna be doing workforce housing, we should be collecting the data on workforce. Um, the, well, they do for income, so it has to meet income. that criteria. I, I get that, but I guess if, if, if we're doing it for income and we're saying it's for workforce, and, and then let's say someone says, okay, well, we're doing this for workforce. How many, you know, have we been able to recruit teachers because we're doing workforce housing? Mm -hmm. Have we been able to ensure the hospitality industry has the workforce that they need because we're doing workforce housing? Um, and there's no data being collected based on workforce. And we're saying that we're doing workforce. And so is there a way that we can collect data that at least says, not just income, I get how it's income, but if we are doing true workforce, and we want to recruit new police officers to go into the police, to, you know, that industry or whatever it is, should we not have some kind of 
data set or data point about the workforce. What you mean? What type? What type of of uh, jobs people have that are in those particular? Yeah, I mean, units? if we're doing workforce housing, then I think think we should be have some data point on what the workforce. I defer to staff of whether they can collect that type of information. Um, but remember, you know, you, we also have to remember that if you look at the numbers, the number of units compared to any industry is low. I mean, the number of units we're able to incentivize is still a fraction, you know, of, of the numbers. And if you broke that down, I certainly would not advise us to get into trying to set aside units for hospitality, police officers, teachers. I mean, that would be a nightmare to manage. Um, and somebody would have to step forward and manage that. So if the school board wants to do that, well then, you know, obviously you, you could set that up, but it'd be on them to manage that. I mean, somebody's got to be able to manage that front end process. Um, and it would be, it, you know, if you went by jurisdiction, that's a lot of, a lot of different people. But I defer to them. I mean, if they can collect that type of information, it'd be good data points, um, you know, but uh, it, it'd be very, very hard for us to get in and, and try to satisfy any particular industry. We're having a hard enough time just getting affordable units advanced. And we and we worked really hard. I mean, we put a lot of resources into hiring people to go out and talk to developers and, and say, rather than just build this unit, set aside a few dollars to make some affordable, either workforce or affordable. And, and by the way, we, we can incentivize that. And here's some other types of finance programs that are available to help with that cost because, you know, like we, we've seen, they know that they can run them out at market rate. Um, and so, you know, any extra layer of, of uh, complexity to it makes it harder to attract them to participate. Okay. Well, then maybe we ought to be defining on our workforce because if we're just using the term to satisfy people's perception, I just think we should be collecting some kind of data set. If we're going to be terming it workforce, then I think we should be collecting something. Um, otherwise, you just change the name and it's strictly affordable, it's strictly based on income, which is definitely what you're telling me. Um, and so then I have trouble with this calling it workforce if, if it's not based on some kind of job creation, which I assume it is. If they can afford to live there, they can afford their job more. I get it. But I just think that well, if we're going to use the term workforce, then we should be collecting a data point. Even entry level into um, our white collar jobs, those, I mean, there's a huge gap and need for you know, take that Raymond James or whoever of trying to recruit and keep talent. And those are workforce units because they're at the entry level, you know, range and they can't stay in that unit if they're monitoring it, if they get up to be a vice president, you know, and, and that's the monitoring piece that they have to make sure that we're enforcing those requirements. So those units would turn over for new people coming into the workforce. That's, I mean, that's a very important piece for our overall economy, just like having affordable places for, you know, hospitality or for others. But they all are workforce, um, and they're at that entry level at different different types of industries. Yeah, it just, yeah. I just think it would be a good data point. Yeah. I, they, can you, we'll, we'll certainly look into it. I, I, okay. I know there's a lot of uh, regulations around what we can ask and, and not ask, but we certainly <laughs> can ask a question and figure out if, if it's something we can do. It's currently not monitored now because it is based on income, but it so there would be an administrative burden. And you know, the, the good news about ramping up <laughs> production is more units, but on the back end, there is cost there to that administration process. And so, you know, person would start with the property manager collecting that information because most of the information we look at is in the files that the department collects, and so that's income and that would have employee information. But the requirements that we meet are income, ethnicity things like that that HUD requires. So it would be an additional administrative burden. Sometimes we outsource that. The monitors, the third party, that's not something they collect, but we could look into. It's not an enforcement. It's a, it's more of a data point to, for us to know what parts of our um, industry were, um, were um, helping. And so it would be knowledge for kind of future use. So. All right, we've got more questions. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Thank you. Yeah, this obviously this conversation is um, is just very complex and leads in so many different directions. I it, sometimes I wonder how we got ourselves into this position. You know, I think it's three years ago, five years ago, seven years ago, or and then I try to think about where we're going to be in five years from now. And I still think there's a, there's a there's a macro look at this that kind of gives us a sense of 
supply demand issues, um, and then the variables that make it up, make up this terribly complicated equation. I mean, I, I, I just, um, I, I just don't feel like I have a, 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 as good of an understanding of all the pieces. So, are we having a, a, a much greater in, influx of numbers of people into this county than we expected? Uh, and are those higher end demographics that are driving land prices? Um, are we having, you know, where's the growth coming from, um, and 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 where, what are we doing to solve that? So when people leave where they're living into these these mm -hmm. new places, what are we backfilling? Are we back? Are we improving those? Or are we tearing them down and building new ones? Right. Um, it just seems like there's an, an, an awful lot of variables here that. Um, and the other one on top of all of that is the, is the jobs issue. And you know, we've talked about that, the number of jobs. People, companies are desperate. Yeah. So we, I, think, I think about we don't have the right, you know, there's people that can maximize their income in different jobs and move them on that AMI scale so they can afford, you know, different things. And so that issue, how do we get there as well? So we, right. we don't have the number of people. We have people that are desperately looking for jobs and there seems to be a disconnect and all of this is kind of to it works together um, so I still think that you know having you know a, a macro economist come talk to us about these variables and let us have a feel for it and it may not be what we can use for today and all the tools that we're talking sure. about I think we have to look at everything but it, things are coming that we just yeah. will be different so well, I, I've certainly been, um, there is no shortage of information articles and other things trying to kind of parse the different pieces of, of housing markets within regions or states or what have you. Um, so I, you know, finding some of that, um, you know, information, um, looking at some of the data we have now and kind of maybe bringing some, some ideas of just that the things that we're going to know most about are going to be the things like supply and demand, uh, regulatory costs, the cost of having to build something because you have to redevelop it versus a vacant piece of property or something like that. We certainly can look at those types of things. Um, but I, I think that, you know, that larger discussion is a really interesting one. And I, I certainly would be open to, to doing that. I mean, we are looking to have a housing summit in the next year or so. So. <laughs> We don't have shortages of universities in this area, colleges, doctors, right. and, and doctorates in those mm -hmm. in those arenas that that aren't studying that for our region, not right. just general mm -hmm. discussion, but what's going on in the Tampa Bay area, mm -hmm. and clearly Pinellas County being landlocked, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are things that would help you know us kind of prepare for that next thing because it just seems like all we're doing is just instantaneously reacting to things and. Um, I, I, you know, we and, I, and I'll certainly ask around. I'm in touch with folks at USF and their planning and, you know, uh, geography departments, people who look at housing issues. Um, I will say that I, I do think that just more generally, um, I think what's important is we've made a lot of really good steps. Um, you know, Bruce is, you know, very quick to say we do almost more than just about any other county uh, in the state when it comes to investing money and investing resources in these unique programs. But I think that, you know, the idea of affordable housing and mix of housing and housing types, I think it needs to be, it's a long-term effort that needs to just be part of everything we do always uh, from a planning, from a, from a design perspective. I think because some of this stuff, you're not going to see the results for you know yeah. ten years. But I, I think we just need to be part of our culture of what we do here. Yeah, and, and clearly we've said a, a number of people have talked about including the businesses in these discussions yes, because they seem to either, whether it's self-interest driven or whatever, they seem to be pretty creative when it comes to doing that. And, and Commissioner Peters mentioned the hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. My gosh, that's a that's an industry with people that have vested interest in making sure their folks have a place to live. Because finding those people, those folks to help out on the, on our, in our beaches and our, that economy is just got to be a big challenge. And so, uh, you know, I think the business community might have some solutions and mixed in with all of this that we can listen to. And and, and, and we absolutely agree. And, and one of the things that part of with our compact partners that we're doing is finding those opportunities to talk to the business groups, to talk to the hospitality. Uh, I think it's Trade Association of uh, the area of the region. Um, I know that Largo recently presented to kind of central county chambers, and so we're, we're looking to kind of 
you know, get out uh, to those business uh, opportunities. And now that we have these initial partners on, on board, I mean, I think it's really a coordinated effort. And what we want to do is make sure that we're asking the right questions, bringing the same message um, so that we can start to really get some information from across the county. Yeah. With the state laws that are changing on affordable housing uh, or la light industrial use, mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be probably more companies looking at that. Absolutely. Know, the land Absolutely. near or near them or, you know, near the area mm -hmm. that they have their businesses to, sure. to convert. So anyway, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Seal. Um, a few things. One, I agree that we're in this for the long term, and I think we do have to stay focused on that. Um, I hate to throw back a bit of history, but I, during the recession, I did want to invest in mm -hmm. housing at that point and land, figuring it was a good time to do it and didn't have support amongst the commissioners to do that. So if we are going to keep moving forward, then we're going to have to be thinking of the long term. Um, I also agree with Commissioner Peters that even if we can get categories, I can't imagine that we couldn't say, are you in the hospitality or law right. enforcement or, you know, general categories, mm -hmm. not asking what specific company they work for, but just categories. Um, the other um, piece that I kind of referenced earlier, but the housing authority, have we really been encouraging them since they can get, produce housing um, to take advantage of the penny for Pinellas to ramp up their efforts as well? And then um, I'll go back. Um, I had talked to Barry about this before, but several years ago or a couple years ago, the housing finance authority had put in a down payment assistance program of additional monies for teachers and for first line personnel. And I don't know how much that was utilized, but it was marketed. I think it was $5,000 and it was in kind of direct result of some discussions with the Education Foundation and with others saying we need to keep attracting teachers. So maybe we can get an update from the mm -hmm. HFA as to how that went or whether they're continuing to do that. It would be another option in order to increase the ability for um, some of our first line folks to um, buy homes. Thanks. And House Joint Resolution 1 will be on the ballot to provide some tax relief for tar very targeted uh, right. public workforce. Uh, Commissioner Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, to Commissioner Seals' point, it wasn't that long ago that the St. Pete Police Department was offering huge monetary incentives for police officers to buy homes in, in St. Pete. But I can't help but think that we're, you know, we've been talking about affordable housing on this commission since I, the first year that I was elected here, and I think even before that, uh, alluding back to Commissioner Seals' points. And, you know, I just cannot help but feel that we are missing something. Um, you all heard the story about one of our municipalities turning down a very fabulous um, development because they didn't want those people in their community. Well, I mean, you know, do we have a problem with those people and what that truly means because when you start talking about trying to categorize or have data points about what a person's employment is, what about the young people coming out of school who are trying to find uh, affordable housing who may not have parents that they can move in or continue to stay with? And what about the elderly? There was a huge article just a couple Sundays ago about the problems that the elderly were having with increases in, in their rent. And do we have a stigma here about how affordable it really is to live here? I mean, those are all issues that we kind of dance all around, but we spend an awful lot of time and an awful lot of money collecting data. That's not the issue here. <laughs> the issue is availability of 
being able to either redevelop or have land to develop on or, or, or. So uh, it, it's just really very frustrating. And Commissioner Flowers did a summit on affordable housing mm -hmm. just a couple months ago. The Regional Planning Council is doing a summit mm -hmm. on affordable housing. Almost every municipality is doing one. You know, at, at what point do we collect all of that and say, okay, we have a plan to move forward, and no matter what we do, we can't do it fast enough to solve the issue. Well, the issue of affordability and building the units is a significant issue. It's huge. One of the issues you talked about is exactly though what the compact should be working on, which is the anti-stigma campaign. Um, I've raised this with city managers as a group, and I've said that you know we're going to have a development before this commission sometime, and you're going to have neighbors that are going to be in here telling you it's traffic, that it's this, that it's that. And, you know, and that's where the rubber is going to meet the road and whether we can stand and approve, you know, those types of developments. Um, you know, the issue about uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, accessory structures mm -hmm. um, and things like that. You're, you know, those are those are some significant issues. I believe the housing compact can really come up. And, and I challenged a group. There was a group that, that just approached me and they were talking about how, how they can help. And I said, there you go. You know, talk about an anti-stigma campaign. Talking about yeah. that, you know, you know, because you don't have money doesn't make you a criminal, okay? And you know, and it's not going to devalue your house. That these are all kinds of folks, depending upon the issue, and that it's a good thing. And, but but we don't have an organized effort like that, um, and so we only hear the you know loud few, and so that's something that I think could be a, a very successful uh, initiative that could be started through the housing compact. And, and, and it's certainly something that we're talking about as far as how do we, particularly between Forward Pinellas and the county, since we're kind of the owner of the, the, the website and that infrastructure, how do we kind of uh, begin to build that messaging uh, countywide? And of course, how do our partners also make sure that they're talking about it as well in everything that they do? Um, I think it's really, really important. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it needs to be the, the constituents, the, the community, the electeds, there's, an ed, there's education that needs to happen. We need to, and we need to do whatever we can as part of this to kind of, to spread that, to spread that word and to educate to the things that Barry was just speaking to. And I think we're certainly committed to that. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, Barry, there is a group, it's called Yimbyism. Mm -hmm. Yes, in my backyard. And, um, mm -hmm. And it's a, a, a anti, the not in my backyard. And um, they have a, sh sh this young lady's been able to coalesce a really good group of people um, and all doing it from a factual standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, not a emotional, just all from a factual standpoint. Um, so I can introduce you to her mm -hmm. if you'd like. A very nice young lady um, and very good group of people, hardworking people. Um, because at any point in time, if any one of us had a major health crisis or something, we could find ourselves, you know, in, in a bit of a pickle. So I was really glad to hear that she took that challenge on. Um, she's a young person, too. Um, for the listing of uh, affordable housing stock, whether it's rental or purchase, I support that wholeheartedly. Um, what I'm finding is the minute that uh, a project is almost complete mm -hmm. and that entity advertises that they're now taking applications like Skyway Loft. Mm -hmm. The units, for those people who are in position, the units are gone and they have a waiting list of 1,500 people. Mm -hmm. So, and that's just one entity. So, um, even if we compile this list, which I think is a fabulous idea, it depends on the modality of a person. If you have mobile transportation, maybe you can get to where you need to quickly. If you don't have mobile transportation, somebody's gonna get there before you, the unit's gone. Mm -hmm. I was speaking with Barry. Um, um, I'm very appreciative of Mr. Lundy with the St. Petersburg Housing Authority and some other local housing groups. We're putting together um, an event 
where it will be persons from various aspects of the community. So if you're coming in because you already have your HUD Section 8 voucher, you have everything ready to mm -hmm. go, you're just having difficulty getting online because everywhere that you look, either they're not taking vouchers anymore or your voucher doesn't fit because it's two, three bedroom, you only need a one or whatever, that person will be able to go to that specific entity and get what they need right then and there and not have to go to 1,500 different places. So maybe that'll help mm -hmm. cut down on A, the frustration, and B, some of the calls because people are just calling anybody they could think of right. to try to get some help. Absolutely. They 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 don't, and they're frustrated, so that's why they yell at us. You know, <laughs> it's not personal. They're just frustrated. Um, um, keeping a list, I think, um, would be good, but I could see that thing changing, like, minute by minute, yep. second by second. Um, so that's going to be difficult, but I think it is good to do that. Um, I think the other problem that we're having that I had not thought about until last week, yes, we push for an increase in hourly salaries, hourly wages, $15 or greater. 24, 6 to 7 average means is what you would need to earn an hour for just a one-bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. In increasing that hourly wage, even if you work at McDonald's or Burger King, for some people that now takes them out of the eligibility for their voucher. So now they no longer qualify for the voucher. So now they're at market rate, but they don't make enough to pay for market rate. So it's just so many things that are people have to deal with to try to maneuver this system. But all of the ideas, all of the conversations I heard today are all worth investigating and putting in. Lastly, um, even when Rick Baker was mayor with the city of St. Petersburg, he put forth that effort through the WIND program and the SHIP program to provide uh, additional down payment and closing cost assistance to teachers, first responders, and whatnot. And they got a little bit more if they actually moved into a more challenging community mm -hmm. or if a teacher got a house in South St. Pete, but she also worked at one of the schools that were challenging, um, John Hopkins, um, uh, Melrose, et cetera, then they got an additional 5,000. Um, Mayor Welch has put something similar in place, which I think is really, really good. Um, and then I saw this morning where either Polk or Pasco County now has put $890,000 towards mortgage assistance for people mm -hmm. who uh, uh, face losing their home or got behind in their mortgage because of COVID. It has to be COVID related. Yeah. They have to be at 80% AMI means. They have to reside in that county with the exception of Lakeland. So it's, you know, mm -hmm. criteria. But... Um, I think all of those things um, where a person could get all of that information and they know I don't qualify for this, but I qualify for that. So that they're not wasting their time filling out an application that they don't even qualify for when they could be over here and maybe would have gotten something. I'm not saying we're the, necessarily the people to do it because I understand what Barry's saying. You know, that's manpower and whatnot. Um, but finding an organization that would be in position to do that, um, I think it would be really, really, really good. Some organization like the Urban League mm -hmm. or um, I hate to say 211, but just throwing mm -hmm. some names out. Um, I'm not talking bad about 211, <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 that's why I said not. Yeah, yeah, that's, I caught myself. Commission to seal, I caught myself. Um, but to find an organization like that that is kind of embedded in the community that may have that staff person and speaking seriously about the Urban League, they've now gotten into affordable housing. They just completed their first house. They have three more that are um, coming online, but they're doing houses. Maybe they'll look at townhomes okay. or something, you know, um, that gives some additional density at some point. But uh, maybe an organization like that who's accustomed to taking those calls mm -hmm. um, or having that kind of traffic and then having those additional services there where they could assist them in other areas might be a forethought. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gerard. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, in terms of data, Tampa Bay Partnership just put together a report, actually they released it a couple of months ago, on a whole bunch of different data points, mm -hmm. but related to economic development and where we are with lots of different things like housing. The other thing I wanted to ask about, um, are we looking at all, I know, um, and this is probably a Bruce question, mm -hmm about increasing the down payment assistance. And I'm not sure, Largo just passed something, and St. Pete did. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's with home ARP funds or what, or what, but I'm wondering if we've looked at that. 
We are looking at that. Um, we've increased it for the last year. We've been at forty thousand dollars available for down payment assistance, and we're not we're not making many loans. Um, income eligible buyers, especially at the under eighty percent threshold, even with that forty thousand dollars to find a house on the market. Um, it's pretty challenging. So we are looking at bumping that up. We'd have to amend our ship plan, but we are looking at going higher on that. But it's kind of one of those challenging policy decisions of, right. of what that limit should be. And, and we, one thing we didn't maybe necessarily touch on in terms of the inventory, but the cash buyers, 47% of houses are being bought by cash buyers. So that, you know, I don't have all the data what that means, but it tells me two things, probably investors, probably people moving retirement years that are selling a home in, in another state with equity that they're bringing down. And so that's, you know, in a way it's, there's a lot of units out there in Pinellas County. It's unique in terms of vacant units. So long answer to your question, but yeah, we're looking at bumping that up and, and we'll be bracking back a recommendation with the ship plan for a, a higher amount. Okay. Thanks. All right, Mr. Johnson, you're, <laughs> yeah, the next uh, next up is Karen's going to kind of go over the packet that you have here available from um, human services standpoint. And just so. FYI, we're probably going to shuffle the agenda today just a little bit, uh, working with people's schedules. So, Hi, good, good morning, morning. Uh, Karen Yachum, human services director, and I'm going to quickly go over what our work group completed. So our work group com was comprised of consumer protection. Office of Human Rights, Gulf Coast Legal, and our communications department. And so what we really tried to do was reduce the confusion. So we have places that our residents can go to to increase their education on when they should contact consumer protection, when they should contact Office of Human Rights, and when do they need an attorney. And so we have a four-pronged communication approach. So we developed postcards. Uh, we already printed 500 and that was part of the farm share, so they were already distributed to the community. We have created the flyer that you have. It's both in English and Spanish, and it will also be on the website that has already been created. I cannot thank our communications department enough. We met weekly right after our initial meeting with Barry and really everything just came together. So the website that's noted on those flyers is already live. Um, in addition, we have created three public service announcements, which again, really will help viewers watch videos on when, again, when should they contact consumer protection if they feel like they've been engaged with a scam, a rental scam? When should they contact Office of Human Rights if they feel like they are being discriminated against and could file a claim under the Fair Housing? And again, with Gulf Coast Legal, what options do they have with a community legal partner or legal aid if they're facing an eviction or want to try to get out of their lease ahead of an eviction. So we're really just trying to increase that education. Um, lastly, as far as the communication, we are hosting a community um, virtual event on kind of training our helpers in our community. So for that in-person interaction that many of our residents may go to, making sure that our helpers in the community know where these resources are, know how to direct individuals um, to these services, we feel like that's really important. We did that during the CARES program, and we wanted to replicate that as well. Um, lastly, our consumer protection division is looking at how they can be more proactive with looking at rental scams. And so multiple times each week, they are going on various websites and pairing when a new house is listed for sale, looking at rental sites, because that's usually the link that it's being listed for rent by a fraudulent company. And so they're taking that information and working with local law enforcement so that they can pursue those individuals for the criminal activity. That is going to also be part of our kind of training the helpers um, session. For many case managers who are working with rapid rehousing, they're encountering these scams all the time. So it's really increasing those avenues so that they know what to do to help protect our residents. Questions? Right. Absolutely. And you're going to be distributing those through a variety of different avenues. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that reminder. So we are going to be distributing the paper brochures throughout the community. So Office of Human Rights has just started their brochure campaign. So we're partnering with all of the different community agencies. 211 will have this on their website. HLA will have this. And we also meet monthly with all of the municipalities. So we're sharing that information with them as well. 
Well, this took a lot of time, <laughs> but it was, <laughs> it was an important discussion, and, and there were some good questions that you asked that we'll certainly follow up on and, and try to do this. We're trying to do, th do the things that we can do, um, you know, and then while we're pursuing more long-term issues. The, the videos you mentioned, where are they located? <laughs> Um, they were just recorded, and so I think once Barbara and her team does their magic to finalize them, they will be on our website, and many of our partners have agreed to push them out as well. And then can you send that link to the commissioners as well? Thank you. Great. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's is, your pleasure, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> is that it for item one? That's it for item one. <laughs> and, and we have ordered pizzas. <laughs> I was in this room yesterday for about five or six hours, and the first hour and a half, we got to page three, so uh, we're, we're really, we're moving light speed today. I would like to move to item number five, the legislative update, if Mr. Lowack is available. Ready? And then we can figure out how long, if the, how long this one takes, then we'll figure out when your 30 minutes or less guy gets here, and we'll, we'll go from there. Well, good morning, Commissioners. Brian Lowack, Intergovernmental Liaison. And I'm here today to provide a 2022 legislative wrap-up. Before I get started, I would note that I'm joined today uh, with Laura Beamer from the Southern Group, and she represents your interests in Tallahassee. So just a quick overview of the session. It was a very typical session in the amount of legislation that was filed. There are about 3,700 bills introduced, 1,700 of those were appropriations bills. You'll recall a few years ago, uh, the House amended their process for appropriations requests and required those to be filed as standalone bills. Uh, of the 3,600 3, bills that were introduced, uh, 285 of those made it through the finish line. Uh, right now, as of today, 79 of those bills have been signed into law by the governor and there are 205 that um, have not yet been signed into law. The budget that was passed by the legislature was $112.1 billion, approximately a 10% increase from the current fiscal year. And when I created this slide, um, signee die was March 14th, and that was the end of session. And in the meantime, as you know, they're currently up there now uh, in their first special session, and recently, um, we've been informed that they are likely to have a second legislative session uh, next month. I like when they just automatically say our first special session, knowing more to come. So it was, to use local government vernacular, it was a 10% budget increase over the rollback rate. Yes. <laughs> Uh, as far as some of the county, uh, the priorities that you all had in your legislative program, uh, I listed here two of those that passed. Uh, the first one being the East Lake Tarpon Community Special Act. That was a local bill that was um, up to sunset this year. Uh, that, was, that did make it through the finish line, and now that sunset date has been removed. Uh, and as a reminder, what that local bill does is there's two ways to annex uh, in the state of Florida. One of those is through voluntary annexation. If your property abuts a property of a municipality, you can voluntarily annex into that community. The other way is through holding a referendum in those enclaves. What this bill says is in the East Lake Tarpon community, it's all an enclave essentially. And if there were to be a referendum uh, to annex in a, uh, another community, the referendum would have to be held and passed by all the voters in the East Lake Tarpon community and the entire community would be annexed. The next bill is waste to energy facilities. Um, this was included in your package. And when we talk about waste energy, um, kind of the holy grail on what we'd like to see eventually is net metering and the energy that's produced over at the waste energy facility, allowing us to use it to generate, uh, to power our county owned facilities. That's what we want long term. But short term, uh, the Florida Waste Energy Coalition was created this year. Uh, it's made up of the 10 communities, the 10 counties uh, throughout the uh, state of Florida who own and operate waste energy facilities. They came up with a piece of legislation that um, was uh, considered uh, favorably by the legislature, the uh, president of the Senate. Uh, uh, he uh, was really the one who, who um, 
carry the water on this bill. Um, the, the sponsors in the House and Senate, the House was Representative Mariano for, from Pasco County. As you're aware, they also have a waste energy facility. And in the Senate, it was Senator Albritton. Uh, this was a great bill because what it essentially did was establish um, a grant fund for waste municipalities that own waste energy facilities. And there's two pieces to this. One, if, if a county who has a waste energy facility uh, is currently entered into a power purchase agreement. Once that expires, they enter into a new power purchase agreement. If those capacity payments go down, which we expect ours will, that's what we're seeing throughout the state, or even if they're eliminated, um, you're eligible to apply for this grant. Uh, and this grant would pay up to two cents per kilowatt hour of energy produced. Uh, looking at uh, the amount of energy that's currently being produced at the waste energy facility, we anticipate that we'd be eligible uh, to receive approximately $8.6 million per year. The other half of this grant program is if you have a solid, even if you don't have a solid waste energy facility, but you're, uh, the county or municipality elects to build one, or if you have one and you look to expand it, um, this will be a match for those. Um, unfortunately, the last week of session, the $100 million that actually funded the grant program uh, was removed from the bill. So um, that will be something that we focus on in the next two sessions. Uh, our agreement doesn't, doesn't expire until 2024. So we do have two sessions to work with specifically um, the legislature and hopefully the um, in, uh, Department of Agriculture who will run that grant, um, make sure that they know that that's a priority. Commissioner Gerard has a question. Just that, how does the 8.6 million compare to what we get now for the capacity payments? We, we have an expert it's, in it's, the room. <laughs> <laughs> I know somebody knows that. Unless you can answer it right. It's less, but it helps. <laughs> but how much less? Oh. So good morning, Paul Sacco, Director of Solid Waste. So under our existing power purchase agreement, which is an escalating power purchase agreement as far as capacity payments, which goes up, I think, a little over 6% every year, the capacity payments that we would be receiving, I think, in 2024 are around $70 million. How many? 70? 70. 70. That's mm. our last payment. Okay. Um, we would expect that we'd be taking a standard offer contract at that point, which brings that capacity payment down probably to about 12 so that $8 million is substantial in making up some of that difference. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Commissioner Flowers. The $100 million that um, was removed from the bill um, based on our request, were those dollars put anywhere into um, environmental protection type programs or just divert it somewhere else altogether? I, oh, you don't know? I don't know a good answer for that. They, the legislation initially had $100 million in there. It, it was $100 million that had never been there before. So to say it, it was diverted somewhere else, I don't know if that would be accurate. It just was, it never made it into the bill. Yeah. Um, additionally, related to your priorities, I did want to touch on, even though there weren't bills that passed, uh, rapid rectangular rapid flashing beacons and allowing us to continue the use of those uh, was included in your priorities uh, with the help of partners like Ford Pinellas, DOT, Representative Cheney. Uh, we were able to convince the bill sponsor not to introduce that legislation this year. Uh, so rapid flashing beacons aren't going anywhere anytime soon. And secondly, the private sanitary sewer laterals uh, there was a bill that was filed that set up a system for if a local government has a, sanit a private sanitary sewer lateral program, inspection pro and repair program, it must look like this. And it was very prescriptive. It would not have allowed you all to implement um, the program that you recently adopted. Uh, we did get language in that bill that would allow us to adopt that. Um, that program, but uh, just as good as that bill passing was that bill not passing and uh, keeping the status quo. On this slide, I go over the county, the specific appropriations uh, that were requested by Pinellas County. The first one being the Toy Town Envi Environmental Remediation. $15 million is in the budget for that. And that money is for capping and doing site remediation out on the Toy Town property. 
The next is the North Pinellas stormwater improvements, $9.5 million uh, is included in the budget. Those are, spe those are specifically stormwater uh, treatment and capacity projects in the uh, Ozona and Crystal, Crystal Beach communities. And these are gonna, these are gonna uh, really help improve water quality in the St. Joseph Sound area. These projects were specifically pulled from stormwater uh, management plan back in 2019, as well as a um, mass watershed master plan in 2019. The West Klosterman Preserve Project, $3 million. That'll cover the full purchase price of that property from the school board, and that will main be maintained as a preserve. And finally, the High Point Community Park, you're very familiar with that. Uh, I would like to note that if this money um, does survive um, the governor's veto pen, this will make this project a, a extremely unique partnership where we're gonna have, we're using ARPA dollars, so federal funds, uh, Penny for Pinellas funds, state funds, the school board's providing the land and the city of Largo uh, will operate and maintain that. Uh, that's just a very cool project and I wanna make sure I plug it anytime I can. Um, so Barry, if this 400,000 meets the red pen, are we gonna look at? We'll have to re reevaluate, but certainly we've, we've come a long way with this project, so. Yeah, I mean, I wanna continue to support them, just I would love for us to, we, just have to make we, it up. we are still in the design phase of that project, so I, I do believe we've added some things uh, as we've brought these, as we've identified these different funding sources, so we still will have time to uh, adjust the design accordingly if needed. And we do have more flexibility with this being an underserved community um, with ARPA dollars. Okay. And then for Toy Town, we asked for 10? Correct. The original request was for 10, and uh, we were able to secure uh, $15 million in the final budget. I would note these are all uh, subject to the governor's approval. He has not been presented with the budget yet, um, but it will be uh, before... Uh, July 1 so and that was the last minute discussion uh, with the speaker um, actually when I stepped out of here at the commit last commission meeting right when they were in session um, you know and and because he recognizes it's going to be far greater than 15 million dollars uh, for the cap and to try to make that project a reality and you're going to get an engineering report coming up to you in a few months that'll further discuss that project yeah that that one is um, and there was an article we, we talked a little bit about this yesterday at the TDC, and there was an article in one of the online publications that made it look like the rec center was being built today, I think. Um, and I, I talked to the reporter and clarified that there was still a long way to go between uh, the appropriation. But so when will we, we see that engineering report? Because we've been talking about that for a little while now. Kevin, you're about 60 days out. Um, and about, yeah, about 60 days out. But, you know, again, the engineering report talks about that. That's just the engineering report. Now we've got to piece together all, everything that would go into creating a park and the funding sources and um, and how we would operate that and bid it and everything else. Right, and and I don't know what kind of um, uh, criteria or or requirements are in this appropriation as far as you know if this, this fifteen million goes a long way towards remediation and whether we scrape or cap or how, whatever we're talking about doing. Um, but then we don't have any funds to actually build a youth park. And I don't know what, is it just youth rec kind of general term or is it, you know, or was it remediation? This is site remediation. Site remediation. Uh, is what this, these, these funds are appropriated for. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's helpful to know. And at the bottom, I did include, because I know you are very interested, two projects um, that were both filed actually by Representative Cheney on behalf, one on behalf of Madeira Beach and the other on behalf of Sierra Verde Community Association. And these projects were for the two dredges um, and they were both fully funded in the final budget. Into bills, individual bills that passed. The first one, uh, you're familiar with this one. It has received a lot of press. This is Senate Bill 620, the Local Business Protection Act. And essentially what it does is it allows any uh, business that has been operated operating in a jurisdiction for at least three years um, to file file a claim against the local government for damages um, that they believe result 
from a uh, revision or implementation of a, a charter provision or a, um, a new um, county ordinance, local government ordinance. So they're, um, they had to have uh, realized a minimum of 15% loss of business profits. And there is set out in this bill uh, different documentation that um, they need to provide to prove that. Um, there is a process for after uh, uh, we're informed that they intend to file a claim, what that looks like. There is some cure time where we have options to uh, amend the ordinance, um, uh, to uh, claw back the ordinance, um, or to provide waivers. So um, there are a lot of question marks with this bill, but uh, I'm sure um, we will be busy uh, dealing with it uh, in the coming, coming months. Is this, is this um, going forward as well? So if we do things going forward that yeah, create business loss for an, a company? I think, and, and Jewel can correct me, but uh, this bill is effective upon becoming law. So I think it would only be moving forward after if this is signed into law. Okay. Thank you. Next, uh, as Evan alluded to earlier, residential development projects for affordable housing. And what this does is, if you'll recall, two years ago, a bill was passed where they, the legislature allowed for the, the um, building of affordable housing on industrial lands. Uh, that was for 100% affordable developments. This, this piece of legislation kind of went a step further. And a uh, residential uh, housing can be built, uh, is allowable on any commercial um, industrial uh, or, uh, property uh, in the state, uh, no matter if it's, excuse me, as long as it's 10% affordable. Um, what does this mean here in Pinellas County? That's really what I wanted to, to touch on here. Uh, you all are unique as you're one of only five counties in the state that sit, have a CPA, countywide planning authority. And uh, how this would work is currently today if a, uh, one of the 24 municipalities or even in the unincorporated area, if a project were to come forward today um, that is a residential project, they want to develop on industrial land, it would have to go through the city, they would have to change their, their plan, uh, they would then go to Ford Pinellas, Ford Pinellas would make a recommendation, it would then come to you sitting as a, the countywide planning authority and you would have to approve that. This bill says that no longer needs to occur, it's up to the discretion of the local government, uh, but which, which is good that it's discretionary, however, you are one of five counties where it takes that, it, it essentially circumvents that countywide planning authority process in these cases. Commissioner Gerard. So the bill says that we may approve them, but may we also not approve them? <laughs> Correct. However, you don't have a choice now um, sitting as a countywide planning authority. So a city or if it's in the un if the development's in the unincorporated community, you may or may not approve that development. Right. Okay. But if it's in the city, we we would not have the option. The city could do it standalone. Well, that's fine. Okay. Correct. All right. Got it. Okay. Correct, uh, Brian. Is that how I explained it? One hundred percent correct. So if there was, for example, a property in the city of Safety Harbor that wanted to convert from industrial to residential, it would never come necessarily ever come to the county commission. Correct. Or for Pinellas, right? Or for Pinellas. They could do it simply at the city level. Commissioner Seal. But if it's in the unincorporated, it would come to us. It would come to you sitting as the Board of County Commissioners. Correct. Got it. Commissioner yeah. Eggers. And that, and yeah, so do we have a sense, and I don't have to have an answer this morning, but do we have a sense of the amount of industrial land that is out there that sits in unincorporated versus incorporated areas? Uh, just a question, for, maybe. So we asked, need... we asked um, Port Pinellas to prepare that report for us, and so they're in the middle of completing that. I talked to Witt, and I think they're a couple months out. Um, so, but, but, this, but this change here, um, because of costs of land, is cheapest in industrial, it makes it very attractive for people who own extra industrial land to, to sell it for affordable housing uses or, yeah. or anything should, else. So. I think I think that's correct. Um, I think the the key is going to be different areas, um, and again, st there still will be an oversight body that says is this appropriate or not. 
Um, but, it, but, it, but it opens that up to be at the local level as you as commissioners or as the municipality wherever the land presides. Do we know the 10%? The what is that the cost of the project, the size of the projects, square footage? What's that 10% mean? As I understand it, it's 10% of the units, of the total units. I mean, if I have a warehouse and, and a, if I have a warehouse brewery that's 10,000 square feet, and then, you know, I want to put 20 units of affordable housing. Well, I, my interpretation, that would be two of the units must be affordable. Okay. The other eight could be market rate. So it's of the 10% the is, is of the residential, of the residential component, residential. not of the. Correct. So, so that is, it could go 100% from industrial to residential. There's no. Correct. Okay. All right. That's where I, I wanted some clarification. And that was last year as well. I mean, it was, uh, it could go 100%, but it had to be all affordable. 100% affordable of the units that were built. And now only affordable. 10%. Now only 10%. And that was one of the things that we expressed is that this directly competes with last year's bill that, uh, you know, well, last year they had to be 100% affordable. Well, now I can come in and get this change and I've only got to have 10% of the units affordable. And it was just announced St. Petersburg is moving forward with the old Tibbetts lumber property. Correct. I saw an article yeah. off of, yeah, in St. Petersburg. Further questions on this area? Commissioner Gerard. So you could also do it in any residential parcel, right? Yes. So it doesn't matter how it's zoned or what the density is. Well, I guess you would still have to confirm, you'd still it, have to have those zoning and setbacks and all that crap on there. For the cities, the cities would have Correct. I, I well, think yeah, the main- I mean, we the, have them too, but land use in terms of units per acre and all that. I'll tell you the focus of this was every city and the county, we've got our, comp, our comprehensive plans, right. and that's really what dictates what can go there. Um, so this is essentially, it was uh, intended to be a fast track, so now you don't have to, if one of these come forward, you don't have to amend your comprehensive plan. A city doesn't have yeah, to amend that. their comprehensive plan. They can just go in. So as far as different setbacks and, and those sort of things, uh, I'm not sure if those still would apply or how that works out, but we'll work with staff to make sure we provide those responses. I will also note one last provision in here that I did not include is that if they want to take advantage of this, they have to forego uh, their right to go after the state uh, sale 9% tax credits. And, and not to get completely in the weeds on this, but because it hasn't been signed yet and we'll see the, how it's implemented, to approve mixed use, that part was the, so does it have to be a mixed use residential or can it be a 100% Residential. It can be 100% uh, residential. It started out as mixed use, and as it worked through the process, um, it ended at residential. Okay. And there was, uh, was it last year or that there was a, a dramatic expansion to the, the cottage laws as far as the type of businesses that folks could do in from their home? Was that last year? I believe that was last year, and essentially they can do any business from their home with some requirements, some some things that they um, are not allowed to do. If if you think, can you look back and just send me that bill number from last year on sure. on that? Uh, because I did have some questions about what that would mean in in uh, neighborhoods. Um, I think going from NIMBY to YIMBY to uh, <laughs> wow, Commissioner Gerard. So to go to back up again to the credit, the nine percent credit, is it? Um, so does that? Can they still do that if they have hundred percent affordable housing? Not I mean, if. What is this covers? Basically everything. What does that mean? I mean, if they want to take advantage of um, not having to amend the comprehensive plan to build residential on something that's commercial or industrial, they cannot go for those sale funds. If even they if want, we, if, even if we changed our comprehensive plan to allow that? Well, then it wouldn't be, it, then it wouldn't be, it would no longer be zoned uh, or designated um, commercial or residential if you were to change it. Industrial. Well, industrial, sorry. I mean, under what they did the year before or two years ago, 
you could change your own plan to allow for industrial and I'm confused about about all this now. So even if you changed your plan to allow affordable housing, they still couldn't apply for a grant? I mean, why would they have? Well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, briefs you're bringing is back 2020. Acting, uh, yeah, I'm the um, acting director. Yeah, I, I, let I, me try to help Brian. I mean, I <laughs> in reading this bill, yeah. not going back to last year's, this bill to me, first of all, it does say uh, at least 10%, so obviously you can go above 10% if you're the developer. The advantage to a developer on this is that they would not have to change the comprehensive plan, and in, in, I guess as, as, as sort of the trade-off for that, they can't apply for the funds. If they did come forward and ask the applicable local government to change the zoning, the land use, and whatever may be necessary, then in my opinion, this bill is not in play, and they would be able to yeah. apply okay. for whatever funding they may be eligible for under the um, statute that's referenced. Okay. But last year's, you had to, we had to actually adopt something in our plan to implement the, the uh, legislation. I don't believe that's correct. I okay. will verify. Because that's what St. Pete did. They adopted policies or decision points about how they would do that before this. I think they chose to be ahead of the curve on that. I don't oh, yeah. think it was mandated. No, I know. I know, but okay. Never mind. All right, we'll go through this one quickly. This was HB3 law enforcement. And I wanted to put this on here because I know um, there were some questions about this one, but essentially this was a law enforcement recruitment uh, bill aimed at providing tools to law enforcement agencies to help them retain and better recruit um, uh, employees. But particularly uh, to, to us, what the point that was in the bill that I wanted to, to mention was uh, there is a provision that allows the sheriff to uh, move funds in his budget uh, across different uh, areas without coming to the BCC for approval. Um, I know FAC had reached out to you uh, to um, draw some concerns on that. There was a court case in Alachua County, I believe, um, that is probably where this stemmed from uh, after a ruling. But as far as we understand, we've looked at this and we do not anticipate this affecting the way uh, our current budget process uh, here in Pinellas County. So I wanted to make that clear um, in case anyone hears anything else about that moving forward. Yeah, I don't think we've ever uh, micromanaged down to that kind of level with our constitutional. You haven't, yeah. Next, House Joint Resolution 1. This is that additional homestead property ex exemption for specific critical public sector workforce. Um, what this does is it provides an additional $50,000 tax exemption uh, between the assessed value of $100,000 of a property of homesteaded properties owned by those critical workers. And just to give you an idea of these critical workers, they're defined as classroom teachers, law enforcement officers, correctional officers, firefighters, EMT paramedics, uh, child wel welfare service professionals, active duty military, and members of the Florida National Guard. Um, this will be placed on the ballot in November. It needs 60% to uh, go into law. And uh, when we ran the numbers with the property appraiser, uh, we are estimating, and these are very conservative estimates, uh, we took the number of those critical workers uh, that uh, are employed in Pinellas County, and we assumed that 100% uh, of them uh, lived in Pinellas County, had homesteaded properties that had an assessed value of over $150,000, and they would apply for this um, exemption every year, which is required by the law. Um, if all of them were to do that, um, the general fund uh, impact would be $1.9 million, and the impact of the MSTU would be $782,000. And that was just kind of estimating a percentage of them lives in unincorporated and yes, yes, I think we I think the assumption took into consideration that sixty percent of them would live in the unincorporated. Again, these were assumptions sure. and very conservative. By conservative, you mean worst case financially. Yes, sir. Best case for the citizen.
Next is the tax package. And as you know, the tax package comes out, it's, it's usually uh, 10 to 20 pages. And by the time it is passed, uh, it is 100 pages. I think this year it was 84. Um, so many, many bills um, that addressed tax-related issues that were standalone bills that didn't make it through the finish line, they were tacked onto this. One of those was a tax abatement for residential properties run, rendered uninhabitable by a catastrophic event. So what does this mean? Um, the, the easiest way that I can describe it is if we were to have a direct hit from a hurricane and it wiped out uh, the, the properties and they were uninhabitable for 30 days, residents would get uh, a tax abatement on their property taxes. Right now, as that sits, um, essentially, if, if they, they can uh, request tax abatements on an individual parcel by parcel basis, this will be more of a blanketed uh, um, abatement. Commissioner Gerard. So does that uh, abate the taxes for the whole property or just the, the dwelling unit or what? I believe it's the whole, the entire property. I mean, because there's still ground underneath. There's still acreage. So you don't even get to collect taxes on that. It's my understanding it's it's the whole property. Hmm. Their house has been destroyed. The, the land is really not valuable to them at all for a while. Well, for a while, but it's still valuable. The, the, so how is it does it stay then abated until it's either wiped clean or there's a new unit on there? I'm thinking of a house in my neighborhood that was condemned for three years. And so that was it wasn't falling down, it was uninhabitable, but they wouldn't have to pay taxes on that at all. It has to be by a catastrophic event. It's for one year. Well, uh, Chris, Chris, Chris is uh, informing me that it would be for one year. Oh, okay, all right. So if it's uninhabitable for a week? 30 days, 30 days. a minimum of 30 days. Okay, all right. Uh, there were there were nine sales tax holidays included in the package, and I did want a single one out. Uh, this will look familiar to um, at least two of our commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Long, you'll recall you filed a proposal at FAC um, that uh, Commissioner Flowers was, was willing to step in and present, and this was for Energy Star Appliance holidays. Um, the uh, holiday that's included in the tax package will run this year from September through February of next year. There is a tax holiday on the state fuel tax, the month of October. You've heard about this one, and really the point of putting this on here is I wanted to make it clear that this is on the state fuel tax. Um, this does not uh, apply to the county's uh, fuel tax that you impose. And last, there was an increase in ad valorem property tax exemptions for widows, widowers, and blind and permanently disabled homeowners. They increased that tenfold from $500 to $5,000. Again, uh, working with the property appraiser and OMB, we expect that um, if everyone were to take advantage of this, it would potentially have an impact of $704,000 on the general fund and $286,000 on the MSTU. 7053, statewide flooding and sea level rise resilience. Last year was a significant uh, flooding and resilience package passed by the legislature. This built off of that. This actually established the Office of Resiliency in the governor's office, and it defined the roles and responsibilities of the chief resiliency officer. Um, it requires FDOT to develop a resiliency action plan for the state highway system. And importantly, um, it revises in last year's bill, it, it called for up to $100 million uh, in an annual resilience projects that, that need to be funded. Uh, this year, it reversed that and said a minimum of $100 million must be uh, spent on these types of projects annually. Cybersecurity, uh, we all know that this has been a threat. They did pass an expansive cybersecurity package. Um, essentially, it, it lays out requirements for reporting uh, cybersecurity incidents. It prohibits state and local governments from paying ransom or complying with demands from an attack. And specifically to us here in Pinellas County, it requires local governments to adopt certain cybersecurity standards. Large counties over 75,000, they must adopt these standards by January 1, 2024. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm really appreciative of what we're doing with um, um, 
uh, the committee that I serve on, um, thank you, um, in trying to be as proactive as possible when it comes to cybersecurity, additional safety uh, precautions when it comes to our computer systems, storage of data, um, bringing on board um, an organization who will monitor 24 seven. So I'm really happy about that. However, um, there is always a way around. So was there anything in the language that talked about what alternatives would be available um, other than paying ransom or compliance to demand a tax, should something come through and we um, are denied access to our systems based on someone just being stupid? I will have to work with, uh, we have uh, made sure that uh, BTS uh, is aware of this package. They're currently reviewing it. It's a, a rather lengthy bill. Um, so we will look into that and provide answers, but I don't have that off the top of my head. Yeah, and and, and I, I guess I really didn't think you did, but I just wanted to put this out here to my colleagues. I mean, what else do you do? There have been a couple of instances where individuals have actually had to pay the ransom in order to have their systems released. I mean, they tried other methods and alternatives, um, and, and it was to no avail. But I know that we're taking some additional steps um, to try to assure that um, should something like this happen, we will be able, through a backup system, to restore a large um, component of anything that could be tapped into. But anyway, just. And my guess is that the, uh, the intent of this is to uh, put those attackers on notice. Uh, don't, don't attack local, local or state governments in Florida because they're not gonna pay you. Okay. Senate Bill 524, Elections Administration. Uh, this was an elections reform bill. Uh, but there was a section of the bill that requires single member county commission districts to be on the ballot uh, following redistricting. Um, there uh, were a number of exemptions that were included in there. Uh, Pinellas County uh, does not fall into any of those exemption categories. So as a result, um, all single member county commission districts um, today will be on the ballot uh, in November of 2022. How many, how many counties are applied by this bill when you apply those exemptions? I have, I've heard uh, different numbers. It is a, a uh, at most, two or three, um, at a, possibly one. Commissioner Long has a question. Yes, I do. Oh. And I do believe my question is more of a legal uh, question, Ryan, Brian, so if you just, Jewel, if you could pay attention, please. I wrote it down so I wouldn't mess it up. As it relates to this bill, do we have a cause of action to challenge this bill that clearly prioritizes Pinellas County and singles out only two county commissioners who have already run for re-election and been elected by our citizens? And... Um, do they have to continue to run for re-election? Can we challenge this? That's my question, thank you. First, let me answer a question that you asked, Brian. Um, we have taken a look at the bill and taken a look at um, the applicability of it throughout the state and do believe it applies to only Pinellas County. Um, some of the other counties that I have heard suggested that it applies to, we have specifically pulled the charters of those counties, for instance, Duval County, has been suggested, their charter provides for term limits and therefore they are specifically exempted from the terms of this. Um, you know, that's the one specific county that's been suggested to me, but I can tell you we've, we've taken a look throughout and this bill only applies to Pinellas County. Uh, that being the case, I do believe uh, we would have a cause of action for it being filed illegally as a general bill as opposed to a local bill. Um, because, of course, there are requirements, and um, I can't really speak to the specifics. I know Brian or Don could, but there's special requirements, and many of you know from your days in the legislature, uh, local bills have local notice requirements, local public hearing requirements, um, and things of that nature from a due process standpoint for the citizens of Pinellas uh, that obviously were not complied with here. So I do think that that would be a primary cause of action um, if, if the county were to decide that they wanted to take up a challenge. Further questions? 
Commissioner Gerard. Uh, I guess I want to ask, are you prepared to do that? Because it would be your office. If the direction of this board was to file suit, uh, my office would be prepared to do that. We would obviously handle that in-house. Uh, we have a staff of local government experts, and we would be perfectly prepared to handle a case like this. Uh, this board would simply need to take action to uh, direct the county attorney's office to file such a suit. One caveat I would add is that this bill has not become law. Uh, as early as this morning, I know that my staff checked and it has not been forwarded to the governor uh, for his action. So until the, the bill becomes law, I do not believe we would have a, a legitimate cause of action. Um, but I would say this, um, given time frames and uh, the approaching of qualifying in June and just the expediency with which we would need to move forward with a case like this, we would be asking any court uh, to hear it. We would have to file this in Leon County. Um, but we would be asking for the case to be handled on an expedited basis uh, through some of the emergency measures uh, that exist for any plaintiff to move a, a case forward quickly. So uh, with that being the case, I would suggest that if the commission was desirous of filing suit, that you take action uh, sooner rather than later to authorize such a lawsuit. You obviously could not do so today. Um, but you could at any regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. Um, and I say that because when you go into court seeking uh, something to be handled on an emergency basis, uh, you really need to file suit as soon as, as possible. Um, so with that said, I would just, you know, again, kind of say that uh, if you were to take action, I would recommend that you do so sooner rather than later. We really don't have any idea when that bill will be forwarded to the governor, uh, but we would like to be prepared if it is the will of the board to move forward to file a lawsuit as, as soon as possible after that happens. Right, Brian, Brian, what's the time frame that the legislature is required to send legislation to the governor? Uh, do they have after session, has Signe died? I don't know if there's a time frame when it has to be presented. Once he's presented with it, I believe he has 15 days to act. But isn't, um, so there, I mean, there, there's no time frame that they have to 30 days, 60 days, 90 days after signing die that they must forward legislation. If, if a, I mean, I can't see that actually happening, but I, and I think there is, and we'll find a lawyer who can answer this question, that beginning of the next regular session, that would kind of wipe away previous acts. Like, but I have to believe there's some sort of time frame. Regardless, it will be forwarded to the governor at some point um, relatively soon, I would imagine. Commissioner Gerard. Well, along that line, um, he could actually wait till after qualifying to forward this bill to the governor? I mean, they could. I, I assume that that's a possibility. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I agree with Brian. I don't believe that there's any sort of limitation or, or, or any requirement um, or time frame within which the bills have to be forwarded, so I assume that would be um, a possibility. Um, if that were the case, I'm not really sure how uh, the provisions related to Pinellas County would play out. Um, but certainly, that you know, that might be something that that could be the the topic of a lawsuit as well. Okay. I, I yeah, would I think point. The, out, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Brian. I would just point out that it is the the overarching bill is an elections reform bill, right. and there is an election this year, so. Um, I think there's going to be significant pressure from the supervisor of elections and the Department of State um, that they need time to implement these changes pr pr prior to this year's election, and I would assume that would be primary and qualifying as well. Right, and that's where I think, it, you know, I, I don't know the other provisions, how applicable they are to the 2022 cycle, but the ones that are would be the ones that you would want to look at to see the priority for the governor to sign. The, the, the Certainly the, the improper or... Uh, as you term illegal filing of a local bill um, would be a, a, a big part of the cause of action, I would think. But I, I still think, um, and I know we've discussed this a little bit, that in the Florida Constitution, the county commissioners are elected to a four-year term. And the voters of Pinellas County elected two of these commissioners to a four-year term. And if the legislature can come in and change the term of an office of a constitutional body such as a county commission, I think that's pretty amazing um, that what would stop them from doing it to any elected office in the state? 
I mean, I just think that's a, an amazing uh, a stretch of power attempt here. Um, so I would certainly be in favor of, of exploring our options um, with that timeline. Commissioner Gerard. <laughs> just one more question. So the budget has not gone to the governor yet? Correct. Do we have any idea when it will? Do they, is there a time limit on that? How long? Well, the, the fiscal year takes effect on July, July 1. So um, we've seen that when he has, uh, when the current governor has received the budget, uh, he typically acts quick on it. Um, so while he has not been presented the budget yet, um, we know that his staff is um, reviewing it. For the questions. Well, the, well, never mind. I'll keep that comment to myself. <laughs> Understood. All right, Brian. Thank you. Next slide. Um, next, and I'll try to go through these last three quickly, wanted to touch on redistricting because there were a few effects that it'll have on districts here in Pinellas. State and House map, uh, or state, Senate, and House maps, those kind of flew through the process. They were pretty easy. Uh, there is one change to Pinellas. We're going from the current 10 members in our legislative delegation to now we will lose one House district. Uh, that was the House District 64, which um, is mainly a Hillsborough district, but did encompass some of the East North East Lake community east of East Lake Road. Um, so that'll be shifted out. And then um, the most northern house district, uh, that did have some, some areas north of Pinellas and Pasco. Those will be shifted down. Is that the currently Representative Coster? District 64 that'll move um, out of Pinellas, that is currently represented by Representative uh, Coster. Thank you. And then on the congressional map, you're well aware the um, map that was uh, approved by the legislature sent to the governor, that was vetoed. That's why they're up there now in special session. Um, we expect today the um, map uh, that was um, um, submitted by the governor's office uh, that has been uh, gone through committees the last day and a half, and we expect that that'll pass the legislature um, later today. Uh, the big point here is that um, the current Senate or Congressional District 12, um, represented by Representative Bill Arrakis, that would move out of Pinellas into Pasco. District 13, currently held by Representative Chris, that would move and encompass pretty much all of Pinellas, except for a portion that is east of I-275 and US-19, and that will bring in District 14, currently held by Representative Castor. Questions? It literally, the new map literally cuts Childs Park in half, which is uh, a very strong, from Childs Park to Wildwood, um, and then going over to historic Kenwood, Kenwood, Old Northeast. So it, it literally cuts it in half. I, it resembles pretty much what the district looked like before when Congressman Kathy Castor first got into Congress and um, we were kind of split between her representation and at the time um, coming over from um, um, Bill Young to uh, the person that followed him. Um, Congressman Jolly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's gonna be, it's going to be very interesting. Of course, there are a number of entities who've already stated that they are looking at filing um, uh, uh, a lawsuit against the map based on um, its current proposed district lines, um, but very interesting. Yeah, there's a, a million dollars in the bill uh, for their litigation fund. Commissioner Eggers. Uh, you said east of I-275 would do what? I'm, I, I didn't that would become, uh, that would become district, Congressional District 14, okay. uh, which is mainly a Hillsborough district uh, currently held by Representative Castor. And that does pick up Feather Sound uh, as well. So it's Feather Sound wraps around over there. Roosevelt 275 runs south, picks up uh, all, uh, US 19 further south in um, St. Petersburg. So District 13 that goes up to about Bel Air now, would this go all the way up to the county line? This would go all the way up to the county line. So then Bill Arrakis would be Pasco. running for 13. That would well, be up to him. I mean, 
<laughs> okay. okay. Safe okay. answer. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, I don't know where, yeah, the whole where do you live thing, I guess. Is Congressional different. districts, it doesn't matter yeah, where you different live. Different story, yeah. yeah. They don't have the same district. Correct. Yeah, it, the district would basically, um, east of 275 and Pinellas would become in the Hillsborough majority seat. Um, and it's different than when it was with Congressman Young, where it was basically southeast Pinellas. Um, uh, basically, black Democrats were put into the Tampa seat there. But after the redistricting litig litigation over the years, we got rid of the split across the bridge. Um, but this way, would, this would basically take us back to where um, it's east, really, it's the eastern bubble of South Pinellas, St. Petersburg, over into the Hillsborough seat. Or in case you were looking, it's basically where every Democratic congressional candidate lives now goes from District 13 to District 14. But I know they didn't look at people's addresses. Last time, literally, the pink, um, the pink Street, if you lived on the southern side, you were Congressman Bill Young. If you lived on the northern side, you were Jim Davis. I mean, it, it, that's, so it was literally the middle of the street. And Further comments? All right, thank you, Brian. Just on to the budget highlights, wanted to make sure I uh, informed you of affordable housing. This is a big topic. Uh, this morning we spent a significant <laughs> amount of time on this. Um, the uh, affordable housing trust fund was funded this year at uh, $362.7 million. Last fiscal year it was at um, $209.2 million. So that's an increase. However, I would note that uh, of that one, uh, $362 million, um, a hundred million of the uh, sale funds, which are administrated through tax credits at Florida Housing Finance Corporation, those have been earmarked for the Hometown Heroes um, housing program. Um, and I can't speak to what that program is yet because those parameters have not yet been uh, put in place. As far as it relates to Pinellas County and the dollars that we get through the SHIP program, last year we got $3.3 million. This year we're expected to get $4.8 million. So we will see an increase uh, here to the funds that Housing Community Development um, uh, administers through the SHIP program. Resiliency Florida Trust Fund, um, this was included on here just to show you there was a significant investment uh, in resilience. You'll see there are a number of programs that were funded. Um, these are for resiliency planning grants, um, the uh, data collection, uh, modeling, um, projections, regional resilient coalitions, and also projects that are local projects and state projects that are identified in the statewide plan. Beach Nourishment, they funded that at $50 million. This has typically been what we've seen the last few years, although last year it was slightly more at $75 million. They used some federal funds to uh, increase that last year. Job Growth Grant Fund was also fully funded at $50 million, and Visit Florida was fully funded at $50 million, and which dovetails on the fact that that was reauthorized uh, uh, for a few additional years. So they're a great partner, and I know you're happy to be here, hear that. With that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I will note that I wanted to touch on the, the issues that uh, touch to your priorities, uh, issues that are high level affect policy, issues that might be come before you, um, but there are a number of additional uh, bills that will have impacts to some degree on departments. Uh, we are work, we'll be working with the uh, individual departments over the coming months to prepare for those changes. I did also include in the Granicus item as an attachment the FAC uh, session report, that's really good. Um, specifically, they also include the bills that did not pass. Um, with that, happy to answer any questions you've got. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, um, yeah on the, um, the federal dollars that have, are flowed down to the state on, this, on ARPA and anything else that, any of those state federal funds that are coming down that the state is getting, are they in the budget? Are they included in that revenue side? And are they? And how much of that is being expended in this year's budget? Do we have a sense of that? Yeah, you know? and and they have a a separate list. They kept that kind of separate from um, during the budget process. That came out at the end. What those funds would be used to? It's itemized. There's maybe twenty so um, a, uh, programs that that's going to be used on. We're happy to send that to you. Yeah, and what was that dollar uh, dollar amount? Do you remember? No. It was a lot. Um, was it three or six 
billion, I want to okay. say. Three or six. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming those, yes? I'm assuming those numbers are in that 110 that we showed, you said earlier. The 112 billion? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So that just kind of, it's kind of a flow through. Yes. Okay. And are we going to have at some point a, an understanding of what those dollars are and what they can be used for or what we can, what access we're going to have to them through, you know, grant applications or? Yeah, so we're going to be doing an update on the ARPA funds, um, but the what programs at the state level, that's a great question. Uh, we, okay. That's something we'll okay. try to add to that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Great job. Further questions? You have a question? Commissioner Long. Oh, yes. I just wanted to hearken back to our previous conversation and ask if, if there is a reason that we need to give Jewel direction today. If you all did, did intend to or and desire to move forward with the lawsuit, again, you could not take action today. Um, you could take action on Tuesday. And again, as I mentioned, uh, given the expediency with which we'd be asking a court to act, um, you may wish to grant authorization before the, the bill becomes law. And in that case, the county attorney's office would be in a position to file suit immediately, because I do think that is what would be necessary to convince a court to act with all due haste um, if we were you know, to do the same. So for instance, if you all had a meeting Tuesday, did nothing, and the bill was signed the next day, and we waited two weeks to grant that authorization, I, I believe we would potentially have a difficult time convincing a, a court that it was a true emergency. So think about that issue over the weekend, and uh, we can revisit this on Tuesday for action. And uh, Brian, thank you and, and uh, Southern for all the good work during session, keeping us updated. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, and uh, we make our, um, or I should say, I make my, my quips and my little uh, uh, remarks um, on things that we don't like to happen in Tallahassee, but a lot of good stuff happened in Tallahassee this year. And there was certainly a lot of good funding that our local legislative delegation brought home for really important projects here. And we're, we are grateful for that partnership. Um, so uh, again, thank you for all your good work this session. All right, we have completed two out of the six items on our agenda, and we are gonna take a lunch break before the pizza gets completely ice cold. It's 12.15, how about 12.45? That worked? All right, we're in recess.
All right. Uh, we're back in our workshop. We'll go to item number two. Kelly's on her way up. This is our surface water management program. There's been a lot of discussions over the past you know, year or so about what is in and, and not in our program and kind of their focus. So Kelly's going to provide kind of a comprehensive update of where we're at, what is included, and the things that they're working on. So okay. go ahead, Kelly. All right. Thank you, Barry. Um, well, it's not moving. What am I doing wrong? Tech support. There, thank you. All right. Um, so, you know, very interesting. I, I was, I actually went back to 2011 and was looking at a bunch of my notes from the time I, the very first work session with the board to talk about surface water. And so many of the themes that we discussed back then, we are now discussing about transportation, about sustainable management of our infrastructure. So, um, I, I think I could take this. I mean, I've even got notes from Commissioner Seal on this set of pages that, that apply just wholeheartedly to how we manage infrastructure. So that was a, a really uh, you know, good reminder for, for me. Um, so I wanted to take you back a little bit, again, to give you a little history of, of how we got where, where we are with our surface water utility. Um, we kicked off this process actually in, 20, in 2011, and that's when the discussions first started about our challenges that we were facing as an urban county. Um, you know, it started with our development history. Uh, when you look at Pinellas County, 81% of our developable areas were already built before the state had a stormwater rule in place. And so we are dealing with a lot of our development that predates modern, any type of modern stormwater uh, regulations. Um, our, obviously, our infrastructure is old, and we had a lot of information gaps. We really did not, at that time, have a complete picture of what our system looked like, how it functioned, the different materials it was made up of. We were dealing with the extreme water quality issues. Um, at the, in the 2011 presentation at, to the board, we were 74% of our waters, our lakes, our streams, our bays were considered not meeting water quality standards. And by the time we got to passing the surface water utility in uh, 2013 for FY14, we were almost at 80%. So um, we had a lot of challenges in that area. Um, increase our, our regulatory framework that we were working within was becoming a lot more stringent. The state was developing um, numeric standards. Our stormwater permitting requirements were, were becoming um, more stringent, and we really didn't have the tools in the toolbox to deal with that. At the same time, we're dealing with a lot of flooding and a lot of erosion. Um, our CRS was actually at risk at that point in time. The, FEMA requirements had become more stringent, and we really didn't have a program to actually maintain participation in the program at that time. So we were, we were really trying to figure out, you know, how do we even stay in the program yet get where we are today? Um, as a result of, of the recession, you know, we had lost a lot of resources, a lot of people, a lot of equipment was sold off. And we really went back to what we would call a reactive mode, where citizens would complain and, and OK, let's go out and just deal with that issue right there. We really didn't have a proactive program. It was really more focused on, on reacting to the, what was happening at the time. And we really had stepped back our, our public outreach. Um, again, we we're talking a lot about the, the recession. Um, so a lot of those resources weren't available um, as, we, as we stepped through that process. And you know, public engagement, connecting with our communities, making sure they understand how this is all connected is really important to how it works. So we realized that these challenges, there wasn't one magic thing that we were gonna do that was gonna resolve all this. It was gonna be a combination of things coming together to collectively uh, take us in a, in a more positive direction. So as we were developing um, a plan, we, we brought on a consultant to help us uh, evaluate our, our service level 
And at the time, we were roughly around a C. Um, you know, if you look at the the sort the matrix, um, it's kind of like that base me, middle level. Um, but our but our operations and maintenance, that's where we were really starting to go down and go down fast. Um, we had we had some some inspections mostly related to as those complaints come in, somebody goes out, says what needs to be done, and then send somebody out there to to try to address what was going on. But we really were um, going more towards a, a complaint based system at that time. So after many discussions and um, you know taking feedback from the public, from the board, and what direction we wanted to go, um, there were very specific areas that the board said we need to increase our level of service in these areas. And so um, we took our 2013 program as we were funded at that time and increased our level of service in the areas of um, operations and maintenance, maintaining our swales, our ditches, our channels, um, vectoring out our pipes and those types of things. Um, we were also having a lot of problem with pipe failure. And the problem with pipe failure is it usually comes with then road failure, sewer line failure, water, water line failure, because when a, when a stormwater pipe is under a road um, and it fails, it takes all the other infrastructure with it. And we had about 24 miles that we knew of at that time um, of this corrugated metal pipe that was put in back in the 70s and is long beyond its, its life expectancy. So that was something that we, the board really wanted to focus on. Um, we also took an approach of, you know, to uh, prevent versus cure problems, and that was a common theme. Street sweeping and other uh, source control programs were implemented. We prevent the problem from happening. It's a lot less expensive to deal with than trying to correct it once it has. We also increased our, our program management activities, and that was a lot of our planning and our asset management our regulatory activities. Um, we beefed up our MPDS compliance. That's our stormwater permit that regulates the public system. Uh, the state adopted numeric water quality standards, so we made some changes and improvements to the monitoring program. We have done a lot of um, planning, development of watershed plans for, uh, for areas where we have responsibility for operating and maintaining infrastructure, uh, partnering with our cities, partnering with the water management district. Floodplain management, again, was key. We, we really wanted to maintain our, our, our CRS uh, so that our, our community received those benefits. A lot of times, some, uh, when we see a flooding problem, sometimes you go out and it's actually not the public system causing the issue, it's actually a private system. And so part of this strategy was also to look for those private systems and bring them back into compliance. And then probably one of the, the board's mo more favorite programs was adopt a pond and it really was a way that when you connect with people, I mean, you're connecting with people, you know, hand in hand. You're, you're out there with them, you're talking about it. So it isn't just handing somebody a brochure. It really is meeting them where they are and helping them work on these issues as a community. So our future state, where we were, high, where we were trying to go, was to take revenue from this program and develop an integrated asset management strategy that was a combination of all of these different things that led us to a responsive environment, that we were responding to the challenge and not reacting to events. It was a very good basic program. There were, there were a lot of wishes and wants discussed over those few years. Um, but in the end, we decided that you know, we're going to focus on those things, those critical needs first. And that was the corrugated metal pipe, work towards you know, proactive preventative maintenance cycles, um, watershed plans for priority watersheds, data-driven maintenance cycles, do what we could to maximize water quality and water quanti quantity benefits in every project and celebrate with our community. Our goal was 150 to 200 ponds, I'll tell you right now. We're not quite there yet, but we're not at 10 years yet either. So um, um, the challenge is on. And, and just, again, more engagement with our communities. The more they understand about these systems, um, the better off they are, but also the better off the public system is as well. So fast forward to today. Um, we completed our asset management plan and our criticality analysis of our stormwater infrastructure actually in 2020. I have a 
kind of a layout there of our stormwater inventory. As you can see, we have we own a lot of infrastructure, and the asset value is is over a billion dollars. Where are those those alum treatment uh, systems? We have um, four on Lake Seminole and one on Lake Tarpon. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have 14 completed watershed management plans. This includes, so a watershed plan, we look at, those are uh, some of the boundaries in that map there. So if um, you go down, you see the, the pink one kind of at the bottom, that's Joe's Creek. And what it does is we look at everything within those basin boundaries. They all drain to the same place. They all drain to the creek. And how well is our system working? What is the water quality? Identifying areas for improvements flood forecasting, um, but we also look at maintenance. So we're not just looking at improvements to say, oh, we need to build another pond over here. It's like, where do we need to improve our maintenance? And it also supports development. So development, um, private development, they utilize these models to help refine their projects. And again, we use, um, we use all this information to prioritize areas for improvement. Maybe it's flood control, maybe it's water quality, maybe it's both. Floodplain and stormwater management, I, I mentioned that we were at risk of, of not participating in CRS at the beginning there. Our, the requirements had, had become more, more rigorous and we really didn't have a program in place. We were a seven in 2013 and again, we took on that challenge. Um, we brought on some uh, consulting resources to assist county staff who worked day and night. And when the auditor walked in the room in 2014, she announced that she was absolutely shocked. She had never seen a community turn around the way Pinellas had. It was just a great moment of pride when we went from a seven to a five, and just another one that we did it again this past year going to a three. We are a coastal community surrounded by water, and we are only one of just a few that have a three. I mean, it's, it's amazing. All of these programs um, on the right-hand side are, were critical to achieving that three. Um, the partnership with our real estate uh, community out here with the agents, um, with that has just been a wonderful program. Um, the flood risk evaluation, our, our staff provide a, a flood risk evaluation of any property when anyone, any business owner, any uh, developer, any citizen just wants to know their flood risk. They can call and get that type of information. Flood warning and response. Um, we have practices and procedures for how we put out information. Tarpon Woods is one of those. We refine those processes so that we know when we need to notify the community when they can expect flooding. And of course, updating our codes, our floodplain um, ordinance, and our stormwater manual contributed to us achieving that three and the, that $8 million benefit to the unincorporated um, uh, flood insurance uh, holders. So as far as the, um, the closed conveyance systems, those pipes, when we, in 2013, we estimated that we had 24 miles. We found about another half mile out there. But we're at about 14.9 miles completed, about 9.6 to go, and we are expected to be complete in FY25. So there will be no more metal pipe to fail. Our open conveyances. Um, we had estimated we had 322 miles of open channels, ditches, and swales. And that um, our maintenance cycle at that point in time was over 22 years. And I want to say what that means. It's an average maintenance cycle. Some, some are a little more, some are a little less. But the average was 22 years. Um, we had moved towards a 10-year cycle uh, with an updated inventory of 308 miles. Uh, 227 of those miles fall in the unincorporated area. We have a gap of 14 miles a year, and we are looking at that to see um, how we can um, close that gap. There were some changes um, to the program once, once it was adopted. Um, instead of bringing on additional staff, we were asked to go to a contract model. And we have, we have a wonderful contractor on. They're a SBE, WBE, um, and they, they do great work. Um, but unfortunately, there just aren't any other contractors that do this type of work. So, uh, we, we have a gap that we need to look at. We're going to look at, you know, the program overall and see um, what else might be going on here. But some of it is related to the size and the, 
the um, amount of the work. Um, so you'll look in 2015, they were going out there and that was a lot of swale restoration um, in neighborhoods specifically. And then in 2016, they were more working on very large channels. So those numbers are gonna fluctuate, but a, a 14 mile gap is, is more than I would have expected. Our street sweeping, again, this is part of the source control. It's it's very inexpensive way to remove pollutants um, before it, they actually end up in the stormwater system or in our water bodies. And you can see um, in 2013 are the blue lines. We were um, around that 1,000 mark on nitrogen and around the 500 mark on phosphorus, and we're well up to 4,000 um, uh, pounds of, of nitrogen removed each year, um, which is a, a great benefit to Tampa Bay and, our, and a lot of our water bodies that that nitrogen is frankly not a friend. <laughs> adopt a pond, we have 48 communities adopted in the program. Um, if you're not familiar with the adopt a pond program, um, a lot of times we will get complaints from residents about their private retention ponds. Um, they may have algae bloom issues, fish kill issues, um, generally just aesthetic issues. They don't, they don't like the way it works, their banks are eroding. In this particular area, this was kind of their issue as they were having bank erosion. If you um, see if I can get the uh, pointer. Um, right there. That bank was eroding and they really didn't know what to do about it. So this is that bank. It was recontoured and plants were actually placed in front of it. So when the waves kick up in the lake, the waves hit the plants and not the bank. So the bank doesn't erode. So part of that is, again, just a lot of education. A lot of people don't know that having grass all the way down to the water's edge can um, actually lead to erosion and having that nice wave break um, not, only, um, not only protects the property, but it also provides a more aesthetically pleasing shoreline. So is the, the grass and that just planted right over the, the concrete or was it removed? It's a different view. So there's the, um, there's the seawall right there, and um, so this view down here, it's, it's, I think it's about taken over here, okay. and this is the eroded shoreline right there, and this is what it looks like today. Okay, I gotcha. So, yeah. Um, improving existing facilities. Um, one, uh, Commissioner Seal will recognize this pond. I think she drove by it last week. Uh, this is the one I referred to, Oak Street. Uh, the top picture was the before, and the bottom picture is the after. Sometimes when HOAs or, or private citizens that own these facilities um, are not aware that preventative, these type of preventative maintenance is a requirement, the ponds are allowed to fill in, and the next thing you know, the, the neighborhood's flooding. And so the program that was put in place, 110 private facilities have been fully restored and brought into compliance with their site plan. Um, on the public side of it, We've looked at, you know, part of it was maximizing return on investment. We own a lot of infrastructure. We own a lot of permitted facilities. And can we get more out of them? Can we, can we improve their performance with regard to flood control, floodplain restoration, water quality, instead of building additional ones? So this is the um, Roosevelt Stormwater Improvement Project that was just completed. And um, it was an existing facility. We um, re replumbed it and uh, came up with a much bigger project um, that really uh, benefits not only um, the community, it's kind of a community, it's a community park area now, it's got educational signage out there so the public can access it, but it is also discharging um, right into a system that goes out to Old Tampa Bay. We have Eagle Lake Park, again, another county facility, um, and there were some opportunities in, within the park to actually make improvements to their facilities and, and improve what was going to Allen's Creek. Um, we partnered with uh, Sunstar. Um, they allowed us to retrofit their parking lot with some green infrastructure technology to test to see how that would work in a retrofit environment. Ibis Lake is down in um, like South Pasadena area. It uh, you know, discharges into Bear Creek. And again, it was a lake that was just chronically, um, chronic blue-green algae blooms that the community um, brought to our attention. Um, we had to place signs out there because it was a harm, they were harmful algal blooms. And we did a green infrastructure project out there to improve water before it actually went into the lake. And then the Starkey, what we call M10 retrofit, it's an existing facility out on Starkey Road. M means mitigation. 
um, so it's mitigation facility 10, and we are expanding that facility to, um, to treat more water and to get a better product out of it. So again, when we have existing facilities, we always look first, let's see, how can we maximize our return on investment on that facility before adding another one? Uh, can you just dig a little bit more on what we're doing at SunStar? Sunstar, um, so their parking lot um, doesn't have any formal stormwater treatment. It's, it's, they have uh, stormwater inlets that go to pipes that just go out. It was built, you know, again, I'm kind of mentioning the, the uh, lack of uh, more modern development. So what we did is um, there are some green technologies that you can drop into existing stormwater system, so they have like graded inlets, you pull up the grate, you drop this box in there, and it has some treatment components in it, so it treats the water before it goes out. And we put several of these in, if you go over to the parking lot and walk around, you'll see them, they're, they're pretty obvious. Um, and uh, it was great to, to work with them um, on this project. It's DOT actually funded it. Um, so we're, we're testing the three different um, products to see how they work. Resiliency really wasn't discussed back in, in 2013 when we were bringing this program forward, but it definitely became very integrated into what we were doing um, as we move forward. Um, the first slide there on the, on the left basically is looking at um, a heat map. So you see the shadowy, kind of cloudy looking areas, and that is our layer of, of, of known um, of stormwater um, complaints that we receive um, you know, from, from citizens, from businesses, and it's all in city works. Uh, so we make a heat map. It allows us to, like, hone in on areas that are, are more chronic problems. Um, then we utilized our criticality analysis and our vulnerability assessment and kind of overlaid them together to identify locations that would be appropriate for tidal check valves so that we could prevent tidal flooding. So you can see most of the dots over there are on the, on the Gulf Coast. That's because we are focusing on where we might put those tidal check valves. And in the areas where they're recommended, those, the flooding complaints line up. And then on the, on the uh, right-hand side, again, those are where we utilize that information to help us make decisions as to where those tidal check valves will go. You can see some along the Dunedin Causeway, um, some up a few further north, but we utilize this type of information to make data-driven decisions. We only have a certain amount of money to buy a certain amount of check valves, and we want to make sure we're putting them in the right places. So water quality outcomes, I and mean, this, um, you know, when uh, I think we did a, an update back in like 2015, uh, 2016 time frame, and we reported that, you know, water quality is improving, and it was, it was just so great to see. This is, this is, these are the outcomes. This is why we do this. Um, all of these things working together, you know, result in a positive outcome. And so you look at the, the watershed, those dot, those arrows over the watershed area, the, the land mass, if you will, and you see most of them are going in the down direction. And that's good. That's telling us that, that the nitrogen is going down. When you get to 2019, um, you see two arrows going up over there in Clearwater Harbor. You'll remember the first red tide was in 2018. And then you'll see in 2020, the whole Gulf Coast is, is going up. We do think that is related to red tide. Um, we do have a study with the Water Management District, Dunedin, Clearwater, and Largo to look at it um, because it's very concerning. Um, obviously, we, you look over at the other side of the coast where manatees are, are starving to death because the seagrasses are dying off. We don't want anything like that to happen here. So we're looking at it because it's now been going on over this period of time, and we, we want to make sure we understand what's, what's going on. But you see the, the arrows over the land mass area are still going down. So that kind of tells us it's not a runoff issue. It's not coming from, from the land. It's coming from probably what's out there. So that's something we are, we are looking at. Flooding outcomes. Um, the county has had long standing list of what we call hotspots. And uh, before big storms, we would send out at least a dozen staff over the course of a week to go out to every single one of these locations, clear them, make sure that water is flowing freely so that, that the communities don't flood. And this is for structure flooding, not roadway flooding, but actually structure flooding. Um, before, um, when we started, we had 415 locations. Today, we have 259. And now, those 12 people can go out there and get this done in a day. 
So that was a significant improvement in, in resources, you know, how we use our resources. Our next step is to, we're prioritizing these 259 locations and looking for additional operational improvements. Some of them are capital, um, but we're, we are very much looking at what we can do with our maintenance. So what are we doing going forward? Um, well, the governance study is actually being updated right now. Um, our, our consultant, Stantec, has completed a gap analysis. They are reevaluating our program level of service um, to give us an unbiased view of where we are. Um, they're re-looking at major drainage opportunities. Uh, major drainage came up during, I'll call it round one, <laughs> and that major drainage is our creeks, so Curlew Creek, Bear Creek, and how we, uh, how we maintain those systems. Um, it wasn't something that we took on back then, but I wanted to bring it forward and, and look at it again and, and see if there's any opportunities there. Um, and then recommendation for program improvements, like our, our open conveyance program, and looking at the gap that we have and how we, how we address that gap. We're continuing to develop and refine our watershed plans. Um, we have two new plans just about ready to start. Uh, Sutherland Bayou um, is in the north part of the county, and Coastal Zone 5, which is largely unincorporated Seminole. Uh, we're refining the K Creek, Starkey, and Curlew um, so that we can um, better define the capital projects and the operational projects that need to come out of those studies. We're relooking at our stormwater level of service. The level of service that we currently have in the comp plan has been there for well over 20 years. Um, this is what it says. Uh, basically, the 20, 24 hour rain event stays you know, within the channel banks or the 25 year floodplain and the 100 year stays out of buildings. Um, but we want to look at you know, how, we're, how our stormwater level of service also influences our, our transportation network. Because um, you know, if, a, if, a, if we're saying, uh, yeah, the 100 year storm stayed out of somebody's house, but uh, an ambulance can't get to somebody, then, then we, we have an issue. So we're, we want to take a look at this and see if we might better define our stormwater level of service um, with regard to a more broader um, set, of, um, set of issues. We're evaluating areas for process improvements. Again, we talked about those hot spots and the open conveyances. Um, and then, again, we'll review the outcomes from the governance study related to uh, major drainage, gap analysis, and, and those things that we need to do to continue to make this the program that it is. Um, it really is a continuous improvement process. Uh, I go back to the notes, and um, I'm going to read something, because uh, I thought it was it's like right now that we didn't know what true stewardship of our stormwater system looked like, but the picture will become more clear as we proceed, as we collect more information and adapt our systems and processes. And that was from 2011. I can't remember which commissioner said it, but, um, but they were spot on. And I'll answer any questions. Questions? Well, you guys are going to let me off easy. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Hold on a second. Oh. <laughs> Commissioner Long. Well, thank you for that presentation, Kelly. And while I don't have any questions per se, I do think that you and your team have done a remarkable job of turning our county around. I remember the first presentation I saw on this issue when I first was elected to the county commission. It was pretty abysmal the state that we were in. So to think back on that and see where we are today is just a real testament to your leadership and the teamwork of your entire group. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. And I want to echo that. Um, I remember when we looked at stormwater fees starting back about 2005, mm -hmm. and it took all those years, but it took the visits to the creeks, if you recall. Yes. It happened to rain. I don't know how we made that happen, but we got to take all the commissioners on a field trip, and I don't think I've ever done that again. And no, I definitely, it definitely hasn't happened again. But we we got all the commissioners in a bus, and uh, boots, and uh, we 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 went out on a field trip, and we we got a bird's eye view of I mean bird's eye boots on the ground view of exactly the challenges that we have out there in our community when it comes to stormwater and. Honestly, it was supposed to be a beautiful day, and like about an hour before the trip, it started pouring down rain. I was like, "Thank you. <laughs> you're going to make my you're going to make my point for me." 
But thank you to you and your team, truly. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo some of those comments too. Thank you, Kelly, for the work. And I think CIP has a new definition now, continuous improvement process. I think that is what it is. It is a complete work in progress. Um, I think about those check valves along some of those waterside communities and how we're getting nutrients into the to the bay. You got old development projects that just they drain right in, straight directly into our waterways. And you got a lot of homes. Um, there, there are streets that go, they go into a drain right into the waterway. So those check valves, they don't help any of that. It just helps the, the resiliency component. But we've got a lot of areas like that that just, and I think they're right along that, that the coastline. So you talk about nutri nutrient elevated areas along the coastline. I think probably, maybe not from our homes so much, but the runoff from our homes into the streets that do go straight in there. I mean, it's just a, it's just a mess. But uh, looking forward to those studies on Curlew Creek and uh, what uh, the one north of there, um, South Creek. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And seeing what we what kind of improvements we can look at. Thank you. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Up next is uh, solid waste rate review. Paul Sacco is on his way up. He's going to introduce Terry with Rep Tellus. So good afternoon. Again, Paul Sacco, Director of Solid Waste. Um, so before I turn it over to Ref Tellus for the actual um, uh, summary of their, their rate, review, rate review and recommendation, just want to put a little history and framework about uh, around what we're, we're going to be presenting to you today. So County Code 106 actually uh, establishes the Solid Waste Technical Management Committee, TMC, to be your advisory board for all solid waste matters. And part of that requirement is to bring forth an annual rate recommendation back to the commission, which is the reason that we're here today. Um, to assist them in that, in that rate recommendation, uh, OMB and Department of Solid Waste uh, jointly, we work with a third party contractor uh, to do the rate study and then bring that information back to the TMC to, to help them. And uh, this year, it is Raf Tellus. They've been doing that for us for probably the last four or five years. Um, and through fiscal year 19, or up to fiscal year 19, that recommendation's always been zero. I mean, we've had a strong power purchase agreement. Um, it's been very beneficial to the county. Currently, that makes up 55% of the solid waste enterprise fund revenue. But in, you know, being a little bit, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a forecasting matter, we, we looked at that in, in FY 2019, and the recommendation brought to the board was a three-year recommendation to increase 6% every year for fiscal years 20, 21, and 22. So we're in the last year of that 6% uh, recommendation. Um, RAF Tellus presented their information to uh, the TMC in January at their January meeting. Um, the recommendation brought to them was a 6% or 6.8% increase. So the difference between what we knew this year as a, compared to three years ago, we were still trying to renegotiate with uh, Duke Energy for the power purchase agreement, which has pretty much come to a stop as I reported to you pretty much this time last year. I think it was April last year. And then also at the time we've completed our master plan and the recommendations the capital project associated with that have been all incorporated into the solid waste enterprise funds forecast. So knowing those two elements, the rate review that was conducted has shifted a little bit and has gone up just a tad, you know, from 6% 6, uh, 6 to 6.8% based on the information that's provided. And they'll be able to provide you more details on that. At the TMC meeting, there was much discussion. Uh, they entertained several motions, um, but the TMC actually settled at a rate recommendation uh, at 5.5%. So there wasn't anything that I can bring you contextually around why they settled at 5.5%. So the staff is still standing uh, um, in concurrence with the original 6.8%, which is, again, what you'll be presented today. Now, just to put that into perspective, uh, the average single family home generates about a ton of trash a year. And at our current rate, is $44.70 per ton. A 6% or 6.8% increase 
it would be an impact to the homeowner of about 25 cents per month. At 5.5%, it's 20 cents per month. So, you know, that's what we're talking about, pennies and the difference between the percentages. So I wanted to make sure you had, you know, that framework or that benefit of knowledge as you're, as you're um, going to be presented the information from RAF TELUS. So just want to give you that background. Um, so if you have no questions for me at this time, I guess we're going to... Mr. Seal. 25 cents per month just for one year, or you're looking at the 20 to 30 year projection? Well, the, you'll be getting a, a recommendation comes to you every year. So when you see this, to, when you see Raftalis's projection, it does show multiple increases over several years. But the difference between that 6.8% and the 55 that's being um, presented today is the difference of about a nickel a month, you know, for this one year. For one year. For one year. Okay. Commissioner Eggers. Who's on that TMC? I, I, you may have said it. I just missed who's on your team, the, 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 the committee. As far as names are. Yeah, no, just, you know. All right, so we have uh, two members from the city of St. Pete, uh, city of Clearwater, uh, Pinellas Park, um, city of Largo. Uh, all, uh, we have group A cities. We have representative from group B cities. Um, Dunedin. Um, yeah, St. Pete Beach has their own. Okay their own, as well as the county's uh, representative. Yeah, okay. um, and that group And also, then we have one from the private hauler community. Okay, great. And that, and that group's the same group that would be look, looking at the separate issue on the, the, the MRF facility that they've been involved in that Same group. Well. They've been involved yeah. all along. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, do the numbers include the, st the state contributions that we're getting or potentially getting, or, or, or I guess not? Because no. so that will be... That would probably come in a later rate review like maybe next year because we didn't have the knowledge right. of, yeah. of that information at the time this was okay. being done. Okay, thanks. Yes. So if there's no other questions, I'm gonna introduce Ref Tellus, and today we have Terry Boveri, who's their vice president, and we also have Nick Smith, who is a manager. So between the two of them, they'll provide that, and then I'll be available if you have any questions afterwards. So, thank you. Terry? Thank you, Paul. <coughs> Uh, for the record, my name is Terry Bovary uh, with Reptalis, and as Paul mentioned, here with me today is Nick Smith. Um, we were tasked with developing an update to a 30-year financial projection uh, for the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund, and um, we were also tasked with developing um, some presentations for the TMC and um, for the BCC as well. Um, the methodology that you know we run through when we when we perform these evaluations is uh, very data driven. So we're taking in a lot of information about you know tonnage statistics, um, historical financial data, budget. We're reviewing uh, contractual agreements. We're checking invoices uh, with the contractors. Um, you know since the contractors do represent a fairly sizable element of the total cost of the operations. Uh, most of the operations are contracted out both uh, for the waste energy facility as well as for the landfill operations. Um, we look at establishing or reviewing financial targets and parameters that help set the sort of the guidelines through which we make these recommendations. Um, we examine trends in the data. Uh, we look at our assumptions and we uh, formulate those around um, how, how we think the projection of the cost of service is going to look over time. Uh, and I'll touch on that in, in another slide, what those key assumptions are. And then ultimately, we're trying to look at a balance between our resources being our you know, gross revenues versus our funding requirements or responsibilities being our, our gross revenue requirements. Um, you know, as far as the revenues go, I think Paul mentioned that you know, the capacity ele electric payment represents a s substantial portion of the revenue currently. Um, and I think you all are, are familiar with that. Um, but we also generate revenue from our tip fees, which is that other major significant revenue stream. And so, you know, if one's going down, you know, we're going to need to raise the other one to complement or to offset um, up to the balance on the other side of the balance there being our costs, which is uh, effectively our operating costs, our capital expenditures, and our closure liability, our reserves for that. 
So here's a, a, a view of the composition of the waste stream coming into the system. Um, you know, about 71% of what's being processed is gonna be MSW. Um, another 8% is gonna be class three waste. So um, for uh, the layperson, MSW just means your garbage or solid waste. And class three is gonna be um, your non putrescible materials, maybe your bulky items, things of that nature. Um, and then we have another big element uh, of the process uh, comes from the byproduct of the waste energy, which is the ash that comes off the tail end of the facility and that needs to get processed and that ends up into the landfill. And the benefit of having the waste energy, um, as many of you know, is that it reduces the volume so it can extend the life of the landfill. And presently, um, I think the expectation is about 80 years remaining life for the landfill. Um, so, you know, the county is responsible for processing a significant amount of inbound waste you know, roughly, you know, a million tons per year. And we're projecting that to grow over time at, you know, less than 1%. Um, uh, let me back up. Uh, however, we still are responsible for, for processing the byproducts of that and dealing with that. So the total amount of waste that we handle is about 1.3 million per year. So, um, the, the reason why that's kind of relevant to, to talk about that is because it gives you an understanding about how many tons per year we're dealing with on the inbound side, about a million, and we you know generate revenue off of that. Um, if you if you look at the um, bar chart, the forecast um, through 2052, the long range forecast, um, the bottom uh, bar in green represents our tipping fee revenues. Um, the blue bar that's stacked right on top of that represents our, electric, uh, our electric capacity payments. And one of the assumptions that is different in this financial projection than the last time we made this presentation a few years ago, back in 2019, that served as the foundation for the adoption of the um, three-year rate increases that were implemented, um, is that we now are assuming uh, a standard offer on the electric capacity payment. So you'll notice that we do have some revenue on an ongoing basis after the conclusion of the existing agreement. Um, and that happens in fiscal year 2025. So um, I believe that uh, the end of the current, you know, PPA agreement is gonna be December, you know, the end of December in 2024. So that's the end of uh, Q1 of fiscal year 25. Um, so that's why there's a little bit of a bump up in that fiscal year 25. But then after that, we are expecting some revenue um, I think there was a question earlier before I started the presentation about, you know, have we factored in the potential revenue um, uh, associated with some bills that are outstanding? And um, I think it was mentioned um, from in a, in, in a prior presentation, uh, roughly seven or eight million dollars per year potentially. If that was a recurring revenue stream, I think that that would be very beneficial. So I think it also depends if it's a one-time revenue benefit or how, you know, if we can depend on that revenue stream on an ongoing basis, I think that that would have a much bigger impact. But if it's just a one-time sort of revenue, it's, it's not going to have as big of an impact, um, you know, to just kind of frame that a little bit. Um, outside of that, we do have um, some other revenues that we're anticipating, metal recovery revenue that we expect to be a little bit greater. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about the capital uh, needs of the system in a second. But um, overall, you know, just by order of magnitude, you can see that, you know, after 2024, we have a big steep drop off in our revenues. And I think Paul was correct in saying it's roughly $70 million, maybe a little bit more than that, over the next three years before that PPA expires. Commissioner Ayers has a question. Uh, yeah, that, those uh, rate stabilization funds, is that what those are, rate stabilization, stabilization funds, the darker? Uh, yes. So um, what is happening is that, that's a great question. Um, what's happening is that uh, we are trying to phase in um, the, the rate plan, which I was gonna talk about in just a little bit, but in order to do that, we need to draw down our reserves to help um, minimize the rate increases in the near term. Um, so that represents the use of our reserves effectively, which we're characterizing as a you know rate stabilization fund use. Commissioner Flowers. I just have a question. So Barry, is, or to whomever, is there a, a dollar amount that we want to always maintain in that rate stabilization fund, much like what we have established for our overall? Um, oh. Yeah, we, okay. we do have a, um, 
you know, we do, we do, we have recommended some minimum cash reserve targets uh, for the system, and um, they represent, you know, some basic amount of reserves for working capital, something like 90 days of operating costs. Um, and then because of the volatility with the electric revenue, we said it'd be good to maintain maybe one year's worth of electric revenue to provide everybody some time to react in case there was a, you know, a reduction um, just because of the volatility of that revenue stream. Um, but that would be less than where the current um, cash reserves are. Um, so you know what we've been doing in this financial plan is in order to um, minimize what we would refer to as rate shock to the customers of the system is that um, those funds that have been built up, we're applying them you know, first to the capital needs of the system, obviously, and then we're going to be drawing those down to help phase in the rate increases so that way uh, you can have more predictable adjustments over time. So, I mean, I think Paul pointed out that you know the last three-year implementation was a 6% per year, and even given the higher inflation that we've been experiencing, um, among other things, you know, we're still kind of in that ballpark. We're, we're not higher than, you know, 7%. We're still, you know, around 6.8% or so. And, um, yeah, so we, we do have some minimum targets that we're trying to maintain. Um, but, you know, we, we're well above that with the existing cash reserves we have uh, currently. One more. I'm sorry, just wanted to follow up on that reserve thing. Um, so I didn't see that in here. I just I saw closure reserves, and this has nothing to do with that. Correct? These are these are yes, sir. Ex excess capital reserves. I'm assuming. We, I believe, we have an FAQ slide I can go to that has a presentation of the projection of the cash reserves. If um, it would please, you know, the commission, I can present that. And, and, and that's fine. In a minute, we'll you can address that then. And then somebody mentioned earlier about net metering. Yes. Um, and the effect that that could or might have on this. What Could you il illustrate that a little bit, maybe? Yeah, that, that's actually what I was referring to just a bit ago when I was, uh, I think, the $7 million. Uh, oh, so okay. the net, I think, I believe that the net metering would have the, um, I think it was estimated um, that it might generate an extra $7 million annually. Okay. And um, my point about that is that, you know, $7 million is a, a substantial amount of funds. Um, but if it's not going to be a recurring amount of revenue, we can depend okay. on that, you know, we're still going to recommend these increases until we get to a, a sufficient state. Gotcha. Thank you. Yes, sir. Forgive me, but isn't there a difference between net metering and then a grant from the state? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I think net metering may um, garner more, I would think. Yes, and I didn't mean to interrupt Terry, but um, Jill Silverboard, and uh, yes, that's correct, Commissioner, there is a difference. Real reason I wanted to interrupt him, though, was to let you know that even if the net metering uh, happens and we're able to use that electricity for our other facilities, it'll be a revenue to solid waste, but it'll be an expense to your other funds because it'll be expenses for our buildings and our facilities and our systems. So it might be utilities paying some of that. It might be the general fund paying some of that. So the, the net metering is a, is a blessing if you're in the solid waste fund, but it'll be hopefully less than what we pay Duke. Right. Um, well, that's but it'll still be an, it'll be but, less than Duke, but it'll still be an expense. I mean, there's no reason not to do it, but I don't want you to think it's just revenue, completely revenue to the solid true. waste fund, because there will be an expense cost. Yeah. Well, At some point, point if we go paying. down that path, can we find out what that... Yeah. Yeah, they will do that for us. Yeah, with that revenue mm -hmm. or the cost differential yes. would be okay. Yeah. But I mean, that's an expense that we're already paying in those departments to and we're do currently to pay at, a, at a higher rate. Right, so, higher rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll go down. Differential, no. no. So just we're clear that we're talking two different things. What's being proposed by the state would be the ability for us to apply for a grant that we don't have to pay back as grant. Um, and that would be if that money's still available for us in 2024, you know, when our purchase agreement goes away. So that fund would have to continue to be, you know, uh, appropriated as far as funding goes. We can get up to that 8.6 million. You realize we're going to be competing with all the other waste energy facilities for the pot of money that's there. So Terry's right in a sense that I don't know if I can would consider that as a guaranteed income for us to plug into your rate fee as as we know it today. 
But on the net metering standpoint, what I presented to the board last year is, you know, right now we get paid, say, two cents from Duke when we sell our, our power to Duke um, under the power purchase agreement. And right now, the county facilities that are buying their power from Duke can be paying, depending on what type of facility we're talking about, anywhere from probably eight or nine cents up to probably 13 or 14 cents per kilowatt hour. We could probably be, we could, under a net metering agreement, provide power to you all, and I say you all, the balance of the county facilities at maybe seven cents or eight cents, which would be almost half of what you're paying and still be four or five times what I'm getting from Duke. So it'd be a win-win on both sides. And it would be more than enough, it would dwarf anything we would get in a power purchase agreement from Duke. So from a solid waste, it's an extreme win. And for the balance of the county and the, and the energy areas, it could be up to a, you know, maybe a 40 or 50% reduction in what you would see in energy costs. And I don't, <laughs> I'm asking the question because I don't know, but could we be using any of that energy within the plant now? I mean, kind of like what we did with the plant, the energy plant here serving the courthouse and then the energy plant that we created out at the jail. So we say using it for the plant, using it for the waste energy plant itself. We do that now. We, we, call, that, we call that parasitic load. So if we're generating, you know, we have a capacity of 80 megawatts mm -hmm. generation. We, we usually run around 70, 72, mm -hmm. and then we'll pull off probably anywhere from 12 to 15 to run the plant itself. And our power purchase agreement requires us to put at least 56 megawatts out on the grid to, to make sure we're, you know, we're meeting our requirement to get that capacity payment. So we do that today, yes. And then have we ever figured out how much that 56 megawatts is worth in the Duke Energy marketplace? <laughs> well, again, depending on where they resell that, I uh -huh. mean, they're paying us two cents for, we right. usually put around 60 or so out on the, on the grid, mm -hmm. and we're getting around two cents of that, uh, two cents a, a kilowatt hour for that. And they're making, and they're, and they're selling it back to, you know, some of the, the county buildings at thirteen or fourteen cents. Mm -hmm. But okay. we're not a utility, and until net metering becomes a legislative breakthrough, we can't put the power out on their lines. We would be a utility if we were to do that without some type of legislative help, and that's what we're hoping the consortium or the the the, the coalition, I guess, the Waste Energy Coalition. That's going to be one of the things they're going to be bringing up to, uh, you know, to the legislature, I think, beginning the next next legislative session. And we realize that'll take two or three years to get some decent traction with great adversity from the utility companies. So the 60 million, if I were just to do the math, I would go 60 million times 12 cents. <laughs> Well, 60, 60 megawatts. Megawatts. Um, well, you would, at two cents, it's 10 million yeah, you'd be about $10, $10 million for two cents a so, year. A year. Mm -hmm. So if you were to ratchet that up three to four times, now you're talking 30 or $40 million, which gets us back into the realm of what we receive for power and capacity payments. Okay. And again, at the same time, reducing the county's energy costs Mm -hmm. you know, maybe by 40%, which I'm not saying we could provide all the power that you would need, but if you were to take all of our 80 megawatts, I mean, being in that world, you know, it used to be $10 million or so just for the energy from what I remember. So half of that is, that's a good chunk of money. Would we have to build infrastructure though, lines or? Not if net metering became a legislative, okay. we would just have to pay Duke maybe a penny or so per kilowatt to get the power because we're using their infrastructure. Okay. If we didn't, we'd have to build our own. And that's and we could build our own now, but that would never be economical I to know. make that happen. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Eggers. No, I think I think in the last couple of questions you've answered what so, I was going to ask. So. Before you, the because um, we've always talked, it's like 45,000 homes, right? Is that correct still? Yes. That we power with that. And if Duke... Uh, if we don't come to an agreement with Duke um, and we decide, okay, you know what, this is just not feasible for us anymore and we're going to ship our garbage over to, you know, Hillsborough County for or somewhere else, how do they make up that power for those 45,000 homes? They would either have to generate more through the infrastructure they have, build new or buy from somewhere else to replace what's missing from the grid. 
Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, one last question. I'm sorry. Uh, the, um, the, the discussions up in Tallahassee about that annual, uh, I guess, grant that we're talking about that they kind of sweep, I guess, to something else this year. Is, it, was there discussion there about long, longer than one year at a time commitments? Because obviously these big capital projects that we have like this, is, and we did a third. We did a thirty-year plan, so it's a long term. Is there any discussion about having it more than just year to year, or is it just typically set up that way? I, I can't answer that. I, I would have to def defer to Brian, but my understanding was it's a one year at a time where they're where the state would be uh, parking, you know, that money in the uh, Department of Agricultural, uh, uh, I think, pot as far as going after the grant. Yeah. And again, the first round of that money is for the waste energy facilities that are getting less money in the power purchase agreement in the future than what they would get today. Mm -hmm. And any money that's left could be used for capital program grants. And I don't know if there would be enough left if everybody just went in for that $100 million on a competitive basis. And yeah, with the uncertainty of that, it almost, by definition, makes it a capital item yes, because you, don't, you can't rely on it for these numbers. Right, and I think an that's what Terry was alluding yeah. to. Yeah. I wouldn't plug it. What we know today, I wouldn't feel comfortable plugging into a 30-year plan as a guarantee that, for, that you would want to make for rate, rate issues. For rate more issues. like occasional capital. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, po apologies uh, for missing your question. So as far as the Revenue requirements, the other side of the balance, um, we've identified um, some deposits to the rate stabilization fund in the earlier years, um, as well as funding some capital and O&M are the primary elements of the funding requirements. Um, a smaller element of that is our deposits to a closure reserve, um, which is gonna fund um, the eventual closure for the landfill in the future beyond the forecast period. Um, the key assumptions that we made when we developed this forecast related to um, escalating um, the various costs. Um, the current contractual um, agreement with the waste energy facility has um, a two-pronged index um, that looks at, you know, I believe machinery and um, labor costs as, as an inflation mechanism. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the not too distant future, you know, that agreement will need to get re-looked at and those um, elements could change. I think we've assumed a continuation of um, current conditions um, in here, so that's important to mention um, since we're, you know, we're not really sure um, how that, you know, contract could affect us in the future. But that being said, we, on average, our operating costs in this forecast are roughly, you know, 3.4% um, annually uh, in escalation. And um, that's generally consistent with uh, indexes within the industry, um, within the solid waste industry. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics has um, a mechanism to track that called the Trash and Collection Index. Um, you know, and, and that's averaged about that rate over the last uh, 10 to 20 years or so. Um, in addition to that, we've assumed um, some deposits for capital needs of the system. Um, and over the near term, you know, we've identified, you know, uh, staff has provided to us a, a, a capital improvement plan, which I think I'll touch on in more detail just momentarily through 2027. But then after that, you know, we're still not sure about what those needs are. So we programmed in um, some allowances for capital reinvestment um, equivalent to the depreciation equivalent on the system for the assets. Um, so this would continue sort of a PAYGO funding of capital needs over time is, is the theory behind this. Um, you can see that in the out years of the forecast uh, that we have some additional deposits um, to reserves, but all, primarily all of those deposits, again, are going to be um, for the capital needs of the system primarily um, outside of you know, the, the, the funding requirements for our operating expenses. Yes, sir. Sorry. Um, I'm seeing that you're putting extra monies in the next three years, which makes sense, um, into that stabilization fund. I yes. Guess it's the extra monies mm -hmm. that we're getting. 
Where's that extra money's coming from later on? As I see it, you're, you've got extra monies to put into that same stabilization account later. Yeah, well, I think what's going on is our capital expenditures deposits, and we actually talked about this internally, but the, the lighter blue capital deposits um, and the amounts that we're putting in that rate stabilization are for future capital needs still within the window. So it's almost like you could um, add those two bars together, but it's not really extra money in the tail end of the year. Um, what it is is we've programmed in rate increases to um, generate sufficient revenues uh, to be able to um, uh, fund um, expenditures in this manner. And so the additional deposits to the rate stabilization fund in the tail end year of the forecast period is uh, for the capital needs of the system. It's just that we have a minimum deposit for the capital needs um, you know, in the lighter blue. So you can add them together in, a, in effect. So it's just outside your formula, really, this extra money, yeah, extra it, capital monies. Instead of looking at rate adjustments later on being lower, you're going to put it, it in. Yeah, it, it, it's almost, and we, we discussed this um, internally that it might have been better to recharacterize those deposits in the out years back to the capital deposits um, funding requirement, because then it would have, it probably would not have asked that question if we had, but. Um, <laughs> well, I would have just assumed that you had identified other capital needs. <laughs> yes, so. and and to be fair, you know, we are, you know, we're really focused on making recommendations for kind of the near term, but this exercise serves two purposes, uh, looking at the long term and the near term, so. Yeah, I know, you're, you're, you're about 20 years out there, so, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. a little difficult to estimate those capital. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, the, if, if, if you recall, there's uh, the very bright blue, almost purple colored bar. It's a smaller element, um, roughly um, two to um, three million, 2.7 million a year in the near term. That is comparable to those purple bars you see on this graph um, on a um, cumulative basis. So we, we're starting with a roughly $9 million reserve in our closure fund, and we're building that up you know, through those deposits over time. And the idea is, is that if you, if you examine this chart, the what I'll call the mountain graph in the background represents our estimated liability. Um, I just want to find my notes here because I wanted to share with you something I think might be interesting. So the um, current... FDEP closure cost estimates for the landfill in today's dollars is roughly $260 million. Um, and the liability that we show is roughly $50 million in the first year of the forecast. And the reconciliation between those two numbers is that the way the liability is determined is based on the utilization of the landfill. So that's why um, you know we only have a $50 million liability because we've only used maybe about 18%, 20% or so of the landfill capacity. So we have, you know, as we utilize the landfill, we need to set aside funds um, to effectively pay for that liability. And generally the concept in the industry is that, you know, once the landfill is closed, these cells are closed, there's no more revenue from the operation that can be generated, hence why they want, you know, this funding. So it, it's sort of a, from an accounting principle, you could say it's a matching principle. We're trying to um, match, you know, the generation of the cost with those who are benefiting from the use of the landfill. Um, so uh, by making these small deposits, we kind of match that and um, the customers that are benefiting from the landfill are effectively paying for the use of the landfill and also for that eventual closure cost. Um, you can see by the end of the forecast period that the um, restriction of the funds for internal purposes only, um, it's not actually, we're not restrict, you know, restricting them from an accounting standpoint, but internally we're setting aside these cash reserves over time in this plan. And you can see that the purple bars match up with the closure liability by the end of the forecast period. And you're still gonna have time after the, this window based on current estimates to build up funds for the long-term care liability. So 
So I mentioned earlier the um, capital improvement plan. Um, the proposed CIP runs from fiscal year 22 to 27 and represents about uh, $157 million over, over that time. Um, there are about uh, five projects that represent about a little over $100 million. Um, some of those improvements, uh, I, I, namely the bulky waste uh, processing facility, um, uh, could provide a benefit in terms of um, reduced um, utilization of the landfill. So effectively, I, and I'll, I'll defer to Paul on more technical questions regarding the project, but effectively um, the concept is that, you know, there's a lot of bulky waste that goes into the landfill and it takes up a lot of airspace. So if we can process that, if we can build this improvement that can help extend the life of the landfill. So um, you get a return on that investment. Another um, uh, significant program is the uh, enhanced metals recovery at $20 million. And um, that that's actually just um, effectively like a business decision where, you know, you're going to, you know, we would expect that the county might generate an extra $3 million a year in revenue from um, implementation of this program once the contractors paid back, um, you know, for their share of that investment um, as well. So um, that's going to provide benefit by doing these improvements. I think what I'm trying to communicate by this is I think that these improvements are intended to try to um, enhance um, the efficiency of the operations. Um, so to the extent that there are more projects that are identified in the future um, and you can extend that landfill life, then, you know, the, that other slide I mentioned before about, you know, the $2 million per year or, or whatnot for the closure fund, if that's extended, then we can um, come back down on our cost and contain our costs a little bit better. And that would accrue to the benefit of the rate payers um, through reduced uh, rate adjustments. Um, beyond the you know, near-term forecast, I think I mentioned earlier, we made an assumption, and, and you can see that curve increasing on the capital expenditures. Um, so, I mean, uh, it is a little jarring to see that kind of an increase, but this is a much longer time horizon than what we typically forecast. And, um, you know, at 2 to 3% per year, um, we grow at that level. And that was why we were utilizing those deposits to the rate stabilization to deal with those peaks and those uh, projected capital needs uh, that we show here. But, um, so do these, um, does these, these are the capital, all the capital that that plant requires? Yes, um, because we, you know, we're, we're just assuming an amor, you know, the, beyond 27, I would say that these are amortized costs. Yeah. So we don't we don't we don't have a forecast of when specifically these events are going to happen. Um, so we've amortized it. So to the extent that you know we get out past the window, we might be able to accrue some reserves if we don't have an expenditure right away. But what this is going to help ensure in this financial plan is that you can continue to pay go fund your improvements and not incur debt. Yeah, not as familiar with the operations of this type of facility. I don't know what's considered capital and what's considered like more like repair and maintenance capital, you know, that it's more ongoing. Is that factored in elsewhere or is that part of this capital as well? Is all capital in that this, capital number? Yeah, this would be the capital that is associated with the, the, the capital investments that's on the books for the um, enterprise fund. And uh, for example, you know, the, the county just invested or the enterprise fund just invested in the technical recovery. A program which was a roughly $250 million investment to rehab the waste energy facility. Um, so that was a pretty costly investment that was required. And so this was effectively sort of capture that over time because, you know, these facilities, um, and, and maybe Paul, you want to jump in, but these facilities do need to be renewed every so often. Otherwise, what can happen is you can lose um, your ability to generate energy, you have more downtime, and uh, worse still, you know, if you're diverting a lot more waste uh, from that um, waste energy facility into the landfill, you can eat up your airspace um, at a very fast rate. Cut our 80 years down. Yes, sir. Um, what is bulky waste? What do you cons what is that? Cons is that the con contractor stuff, or is that? Yeah. So. That question, uh, bulky waste is really anything that doesn't fit into the chutes oh. for the waste energy facility. So we're talking furniture, mattresses, um, tires to some degree. We have to burn tires whole because you can't bury whole tires. So you either have to shred them, quarter them before you can landfill them. But right now we, we're burning whole tires. But that's about 60, 65,000 tons a year are going to the landfill in just bulky waste items, which is about 25% of what's going to the landfill every year. So by building a bulky waste facility, we're extending the life of the landfill, which is our goal is zero waste by 2050, is to 
remove as much as we can go into the landfill, and that's a giant, well, that, that, uh, that giant would cut, chunk. That would cut way back on that 65. Right, um, we would incinerate it as opposed to going to the all landfill. Of it? The, the bulky waste, yes. Yeah, yeah. wow. That's a um, I, I just wanted to comment on, on Terry's uh, response as far as you asked about the capital improvements for that type of facility. So it's not just the waste energy facility, it's the, the capital that we need for the entire site. So we're always gonna need side slope maintenance, ditch maintenance, right. surface water, um, our water treatment facility, which treats all the surface and leachate water, which sends makeup water to the facility itself. We're always gonna have pressure part work in the boilers, uh, work with the turbines and things like that, which always go above and beyond the, um, the retrofitting monies that were expended from 2016 through 2021 to extend the life of the facility. And if you went back to the to the, the slide prior to what Terry had, you'll see when you're talking about the rate stabilization fund, when you talk about the monies for capital, you see it kind of you know going down, moving out, and then going back up again. Well, we're going to need that capital infusion again 25 years out because you're going to need to ref refurnish that facility again. Yeah. And there's no better effect on the landfill as far as reducing what's going there than that waste energy facility. I mean, of all the technologies that we know today, that is still the best technology we have to make that happen. So we need to plan for those types of retrofits because you're probably going to be looking at 350 or 400 million when you're 25 years out. Right. New facilities probably would cost you 800 to a billion dollars for the size of the facility we have today. Thank you. So given the funding requirements relative to the revenues, we developed a long range projection of these needs on a level basis. And um, over the near term, that turns out to be roughly 6.8%. So um, we thought that uh, given you know the increase in inflation, we had some offsetting benefits in other areas. Um, that uh, this is not too far off of the plan that was identified before. Um, as, as a result of you know, all the information we presented to you today, um, that helped guide us in terms of um, ensuring that we could have level increases and maintain the fiscal responsibility in terms of ensuring that we have adequate reinvestment to the facilities, among other things. Um, so, and I, I think as um, Paul mentioned earlier, you know, if we if we were to assume that a typical single-family residential household generates about a ton per year, you can see that you know the increases are about you know three dollars going up to about three fifty. Um, per year increase um, translates to about um, you know twenty five cents a month in the near term. Sorry, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to quibble over the twenty or twenty five cents as you translated, but I like to think that we listened to our the TMC and our our partners, and they recommended a five and a half. Were you part of that discussion? Did you, I mean I know that. Um, previous comments where we don't really know what the uh, rationale behind that five and a half was. Do we have a look at all of your projections using the five and a half versus the 6.8? So we could get a sense of what difference that is for our facility. Um, I, I, I did not come prepared in the in, with a FAQ slide that presents it, but we did look at it and we examined what would you need to do to catch up because what effectively happens is if we go with something lower, that doesn't reduce our revenue requirements, it just lowers our revenues. And um, the issue um, that we have, if I can just run back here, is that you know we're trying to get to um, that a dark bar where we're utilizing the rate stabilization to make up the difference in our funding requirements. We're trying to um, chip away at that over time through these rate increases. So um, if we go with um, a 5.5%, which is less than what was uh, recommended effectively, the next year you're going to have to make that up or you'd have to make that up um, over time. It, the longer you take to make that up, the less compounding you have in the near term, and it could result in some slightly higher rate increases than what you would have had had you just stuck with the original plan. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, we can we can um, certainly prepare you know some charts to show you what that would be, or if if you'd like, I could give you a sense of maybe what the. Um, um, 
change in the rate increases are. I, I think that you know when we looked at it internally, we we thought that if you wanted to make up the difference, it'd be a roughly 8.1 percent increase in 2024. So it would just kind of depend on whether you would you know if you entertain the 5.5, everything else being held constant, whether you'd want to make it up in one year or do it over time. We can prepare those because yeah. this will come back to you for a vote, and so we can have that type of information available and discuss it at that time. I, I appreciate your I appreciate the perspective. It's it's really just almost net present value stuff, you know. So, when do you pay pay for it, and what kind of cur what kind of smoothing of that curve do you have? And I just like to see it, but I understand where you guys are coming from. So, hopefully, to give the board a little, uh, you know, a better sense of the TMC discussion. So certainly, Raf Tellus was there to, to present, and you know I was there. Several staff were there to watch the, uh, you know, the the discussion, and they were they were all over the all over the place. Quite frankly, um, at one point they were deadlocked at a six point or a six point zero percent increase, which we were prepared to bring forward, um, and we discussed that. And then they made another motion to, to make it five point five percent. But I would tell you, you know, from a staff standpoint. There was no discussion as to why 5.5 as opposed to 6, as opposed to 6.8, when you were talking about the needs of the funding to, for the operation to go forward over a period of time. And one of the main reasons we discussed with the county administrator was, you know, we're looking at a 6% increase, you know, for the last three years, year over year. And then if we went with 5.5, knowing that the recommendation is 6.8, we know we would have to come back later with something even higher than that. Then it, doesn't we kind of get off that 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 streamline you know that that natural curve or or uh, the needs that are going to be or, or the funding that's going to be needed over a period of time and not dip down and then come back and kind of get into the seesaw thing so and and realizing that the 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 revenue difference is almost infinitesimal when you're talking about you know those types of percentages and especially the impact of the homeowner that's why we stood where we are. Now, I also want to, uh, you know, make you aware that we had a TMC meeting in May, and it was after we had our meeting internally with county administration, and I, I let them know that thank you for the recommendation we discussed internally. This is going to be coming back to, uh, I'm sorry, March, not May. Um, we're going to be bringing a recommendation back to the board at the 6.8% and the reasons why we were doing that, and there wasn't any real discussion or feedback or blowback from that at all at that meeting. So, I mean, I just want you to, to know that and have the benefit of that information. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. Are there, Microphone. I noticed in um, the next slide, um, Tampa and Hillsborough and Pasco all have WTEs. This may be more of a Paul Sacco or a Jewel question. Um, can we form a uh, private utility, just like Jacksonville Electric or the, all of the municipal utilities that exist around the state? Are we preempted forever and ever from doing something? May not be a question you can answer today, but I it, it just disturbs me that we are in this situation, and I have brought this up before, that our back seems against the wall without the ability to really negotiate, and I'd like to explore whatever we can. Let us look at that before we, and we'll have that when we bring this back for mm -hmm. a discussion. Okay. Just looking for options. <laughs> so this represents a comparison of the um, tip fees for garbage uh, service around the state and we uh, boxed those that have you know waste energy facility type operations because they tend to be more costly than ob obviously than w just simply landfilling um, waste and you can see that you know the county is um, you know low on, on the low end relative to other facilities that have waste energy facilities. And then the two other waste energy facilities, Lee County and Palm Beach County that, you know, are on either sides of the county, you know, under the current and with the proposed recommendation. Um, it should be noted that they have um, a disposal facility assessment as it's referred to. So a portion of the 
cost that would have normally been recovered through the TIP fee is actually recovered through an assessment. So it sort of creates um, um, an econ what's referred to as an economic flow control to incentivize folks to come to the facility by keeping the TIP fees a little bit lower. Um, but uh, when we do these comparisons, it sort of skews the comparison a little bit. So when you factor that in, so for example, I, I know for a fact that Lee County's disposal facility assessment equates to roughly $17.50. If you were to add that on, you know, they would, Lee County would then all of a sudden be right in the mix with, you know, uh, City of Tampa or Miami-Dade County or Pasco. And so I thought that that was worth noting that, you know, effectively really, you know, Pinellas County is the lowest. And, you know, it's, it's no surprise that the reason why that is is because of the capacity payments that are currently received. So as that goes away, um, like many of the other folks on this comparison, that's going to force us to have to raise our rates. And we can do that here at a much slower rate because of the buildup of the funds. That was going to be my question. How many of those others have capacity payments? Then I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, I, to my knowledge, um, I think that uh, like uh, Palm Beach County is only getting about 3.5 cents, you know, roughly per kilowatt hour. I, I'm not sure about what the exact capacity payment is, but it's nothing comparable to Pinellas County's, I don't believe. Um, and Lee County does not have a capacity payment. That I believe that they sell their electricity open market and have a contractor that helps with the sale of the energy. Um, and I can't speak to Tampa, but I know that uh, I think Miami-Dade's kind of similar to um, Palm Beach County. And I know that uh, Hillsborough County um, does not, but they actually are able to, um, to the question earlier, they're actually able to sell the energy to their um, wastewater treatment facility. Um, but the reason why they're able to do that is because the waste to energy site is co-located with their wastewater plant. Um, so they don't actually have, they can just directly wire the electricity and able to uh, sell that. And um, the energy use of the wastewater plant is, is, a, is a fraction of the total energy produced. So it's, but they're able to get um, something equivalent to what was being discussed earlier with the uh, net metering. So it's hard to really, when you look at all these, they're all a little bit different. So it's hard to yes, compare sir. them, you know. But, but generally, generally speaking, that the count, considering that you know the majority, you know, the waste is run through a waste energy facility, that that the rates are you know low relative to those on the comparison. Their their increases that they're 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 looking at, um, are yeah, not, are not like what we're looking at though. Probably, I mean, they've already they've already embedded those increases probably. To well, you know, it's it. I mean, on a percentage terms, I think you're you're right. Um, but you know, in, in nominal, in nominal terms, um, the increases might actually be somewhat comparable if you think about it, because you're starting from a lower point. So, yeah. you know, if, if we're, you know, maybe 40% greater like Pasco or Hillsborough County, we're, you know, substantially higher. We could be doing a 3% increase. You could be doing a 6% increase. The nominal increase to the customer could be comparable. Right. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. All right. Uh, with that, can attempt to answer any other questions? Further questions? So we'll be bringing this back as a separate discussion on the rate to, for by resolution for a vote. So, thank you very much for being here today, oh, com Commissioner. Do we participate in um, any program where we're uh, giving um, our other charges like this or the rate for the microphone? Hi. Do we participate in any programs where we are um, giving away or selling um, the used tires that may come to our landfill? There are a lot of playground companies that shred that rubber and use that as a component for the um, ADA type playground facilities. We do not do that. What we would do is from an outreach is for the folks that generate the tires before they're brought to us, that they'd be in the position to donate those tires once they come to us, it's it's waste at that point, and okay. it, we really can't put the materials back out that okay. way unless we're in a, a true recycling state where we're going back out to the market. It wouldn't be going to private entities or, or charitable organizations at that point. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time today. All right. Thank you. Moving right along. 
Uh, we still have quorum, so we're good. Yeah. Um, so, okay, Steve, come on up. Let's get uh, going. We'll have a convention of visitors, Briero. Um, they have an update on the strategic plan, and then we've got an agenda brief. So, and luckily, I got to Steve's slides before, and and there are far fewer. So, hopefully, <laughs> we'll be able to get through this before we lose a quorum. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Administrator, and thank you for saving me on the other slides because uh, you guys will be giving me really bad looks at this point. Um, I'm going to make the intro part very quickly because I want to get to the meat of the update for our strategic plan. Uh, but I do want to thank you guys for having us uh, to this afternoon uh, to go through this because it is really important as we look at how we go through and increase the economic of, uh, impact of tourism across Pinellas County. Uh, today we've got Robert Allen with HCP Associates who's going to walk through the process and some of the top level results. As Barry alluded, we actually had about 48 slides and that is just the beginning of uh, of, of what we have. So that's why I say top level results. I, I laughed, okay, I'm yeah. like, oh no. <laughs> um, but after his presentation, I'll talk about uh, some next steps of where we go, uh, go from here. So welcome uh, Robert Allen with HCP Associates. Thank, thank you, Steve. Thank you, remaining members of the commission, county administrator. Uh, I'm happy to present the very, very top line findings of our strategic planning process. So just as a kind of a reminder, what is strategic planning? It's a community and staff-driven reevaluation of the organization with the intention of clarifying the mission and vision for it. It also provides guidance for changes to the structure and service focus moving forward. I know yesterday's CDC meeting had a lot of discussion about this and budgetary process. That's gonna all feed into it, this as well. Really, we want to identify roles, and those three major roles are ownership, so Visit St. Pete Clearwater is the primary organization responsible for something. Partnership, which is that this is something that the organization wants to support, whether through resources, financial, staff, or otherwise. And then the third role being advocacy, which is we speak in favor of it, but not necessarily taking an everyday role or a, a large stake in that. Throughout this process, we wanted to make sure we put an emphasis on increasing the economic impact of each visitor, as Steve mentioned developing the assets of the region, increasing the economic benefits of tourism to the local community, and deepening partnerships across Pinellas County. Of course, with so many municipalities, that is an important component as well. So this was conducted over an eight-phase pro process. I'll move quickly through these. The first was a series of stakeholder interviews. We conducted 46 telephone or Teams interviews with key figures, including many of you in this room. Thank you for your time, for those of you with whom I have spoken. Following that, we also did an online stakeholder survey. This was to allow smaller venues, smaller attractions, other hotels that we didn't have the scope or the time to speak with in the one-on-one -on -one interviews a chance to give us their feedback. Additionally, because this is about increasing the impacts and benefits of tourism to the local community, we conducted a community sentiment survey of 1,300 Pinellas County residents to, it, according to the United States Census. That's a very, very, very important distinction. This was a very representative sample per the US Census. Finally, to conclude our data collection phase, we conducted industry and visitor analysis, looking at not only past trends in Pinellas County, but larger nationwide trends in tourism. Once we collected all of that information, we entered into the planning phases. That started with three stakeholder workshops, which were half-day workshops bringing together a lot of those external stakeholders, Once, as well as one all-day workshop with the Visit St. Pete Clearwater staff. Uh, it was a little bit of a tr trudge, but it was very, very productive. And everyone from the newest members to the most senior members at the organization were highly engaged and provided very valuable feedback. We're now finalizing that strategic plan and all of the associated presentations such as this. So that in short summarizes our process for this. So what have we found out in brief? So perhaps the first point is the most obvious. Pinellas County's primary appeal is as a beach focused, family friendly, welcoming destination, but it has so much more to do once you're done with the sand, such as arts and culture. 
Overall, stakeholders agree that there really aren't a lot of places that offer the same combination of experiences as Pinellas County. There were a great deal of struggles. Some people mentioned far-flung destinations such as Hawaii as alternates. Obviously, that's a very different price point for a lot of people. But also, these stakeholders emphasize the importance of the growth of the arts and culture scene in Pinellas County and the importance of protecting the area's historically hospitable and welcoming atmosphere. Making sure that Pinellas County doesn't turn into Miami Beach was something that was a crucial point raised by these stakeholders. Additionally, it's not just St. Pete and Clearwater. Dunedin, Tarpon Springs, Safety Harbor, other ecotourism opportunities such as Weedon Island Preserve and Fort DeSoto, these were all things that were commonly identified as hidden gems that are worth exploring and further messaging by the DMO. Stakeholders also identified some challenges. So what are those major challenges? Transportation, including parking, red tide and the perceptions that people have about red tide impacting the beaches, affordability, not only for the tourists themselves, but for the workers in those hospitality related sectors. And this other problem I would call, it's like the information gathering problem. You come to Pinellas County, there's 24 different municipalities, there's thousands of different things you can do. How do you find out about what is going on, what is there to do outside of just visiting the beach or maybe going to the Dolly? There was a broad consensus that Visit St. Pete Clearwater needs to message more internally, not only to residents on the value of tourism and what that brings to the local community, but also to visitors once they are here so they have an idea of all these other experiences they can take advantage of, potentially extending their stay in the county. Stakeholders also provided some detailed feedback on a few specific items really relating to different departments of the organization. So general support for sponsoring more distinctive events that draw outside visitors. So these are some of those signature events like the Valspar Golf Tournament or the Grand Prix. These are big name events that bring in people from other parts of the country that may not be reached by traditional marketing channels or maybe outside of the traditional markets that visit St. Pete Clearwater targets. There was a strong but not unanimous consent among the stakeholders that a convention center, a big one like in Tampa, is not necessarily the best call for Pinellas County. Instead, even whether they agreed or disagreed, stakeholders emphasized the importance of new hotel inventory that can support these on-premise meetings and conventions as a viable path forward without investing this tremendous amount into a convention center. There was broad agreement that county operated sports facilities would be an important boost to promoting that sector of the business. And there was a broad agreement that the organization should do more to coordinate with the local industry on a variety of important challenges to, I would call it the supply side of things. So workforce, promoting the destination, transportation, all of these things especially are heavily impacting the hospitality sector. Finally, there were some very strong differences of opinion on capital versus marketing usage of TDC funding, but there was a broad agreement that the district requires, that, that district being all Pinellas County, robust marketing. The place will not sell itself, they say. <coughs> In terms of our residents, we learned a lot of very pro-tourism sentiments from Pinellas County residents. One of the concerns we had coming into this project, given how important tourism is to Pinellas County, is this concept of over-tourism. This is something that you see a lot in European cities like Venice, where there is such an animus against tourists because they feel like their hometown, their city has been turned into an amusement park. Fortunately, that is not a threat currently facing Pinellas County residents. 91% of them believe that tourism is important for the future of Pinellas County, and 85% of them affirm that tourism benefits everyday residents of Pinellas County. This is a great thing. Now, we didn't just wanna ask these really high-level questions of the residents, so we did ask them about whether they feel that tourism betters or worsens several different aspects of life in Pinellas County. What we found is that for most of these categories, from local economy to jobs, property values, even diversity of people and cultures and the beaches, they feel that tourism makes these things better. Now, that doesn't mean that residents feel that tourists make everything better. Tourists, or tourists in their view, do make problems for litter, crime, 
crowding and congestion, and of course, traffic. Now I should state, especially when we speak about crime, most statistics show that the criminal element of tourism is pretty small. However, these are perceptions of the residents. So even if tourism is not necessarily a driver of criminality in Pinellas County, the residents' perceptions of that is something to keep in mind. Additionally, we wanted to get a sense of what are the different activities that we might think of as being tourist-like activities that everyday residents of Pinellas County are taking advantage of. So whether it's visiting a park, visiting a beach, or hosting friends and family from outside of Florida in your home, large numbers of Pinellas County residents are doing these things that are really tourist-like activities. Another thing that you sh should consider when you look at these numbers is that these, these, were, these data were gathered and we asked people to look one year back. Well, that one year look back does include those COVID times in which many people would not have attended something like a sporting event, although we still see relatively sizable numbers of residents who had done so. Finally, 88% of residents recommend Pinellas County as both a place to live and vacation. Those numbers were identical to each other. So, with our summary here, we resulted this process in some strategic outcomes. As we mentioned, those outcomes are split into three roles, the first of which, and the most important, being ownership. So again, ownership is the highest level of responsibility. This means that this is Visit St. Pete Clearwater's job to make this happen. There are several strategies on the next slide. I will not read them all, but I will focus on some of the top ones and some of the overarching themes that guide each. So, the first two are some of the most important, emphasizing the marketing and storytelling focus of the organization. There is no one better equipped to do that than Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Final, exploring more bold, targeted, and innovative storytelling strategies with high ROI is another crucial component to moving forward. Many of you have already seen the great messaging that this organization is already putting out. But going back to the earlier stakeholder comments, there's so much to do, but yet if you buy a TV spot, you really have to talk about the beaches. If you're putting it on mass media, you have to talk about the biggest strength. But there's so much more, whether that's doing an eco tour at Whedon Island, whether that's going to a glass blowing museum, all of these things have an appeal to very different niche audiences. And that cornucopia of different things to do in Pinellas County needs to be addressed by using targeted marketing to speak to the most receptive people for each one of those activities. Many of these other components have to do with Visit St. Pete Clearwater's role as a nexus or a networker between governments, all the different municipalities, between hoteliers, between different attractions, whether that's museums or whether that's others. The crucial element that kind of keeps all of those recommendations together is that Visit St. Pete Clearwater is the one person in the room that can bring those different voices to the table and come up with joint programming that brings those things together. Whether that's a convention that needs to span two or three hotel properties, or whether that is an arts pass that needs to get two or three different museums on board to foster further engagement with the arts community. That sort of networking element is one of the most crucial things to the ownership component of these recommendations. Partnership and advocacy, these are kind of the second tier and third tier roles, but they're still important. As we know, as much as Steve can go and pick up trash on the beach, Visit St. Pete Clearwater can't do all the beach renourishment. They can't solve all the transportation problems unless Steve wants to drive everybody around. But partnership specifically means that Visit St. Pete Clearwater would be lending its support through resources, through marketing support, potentially through fiscal support, while advocacy is more of a messaging and stating their support and leaving it at that. So some of those things that we see under partnership, encouraging respect for the environment, coordinating between hotels and cultural attractions, you know, putting art inside the hotels, contributing to placemaking efforts across the county to emphasize all of these different municipalities, unique cultural elements, collaborating to increase airline routes to the area. These are all things that may fall a little bit outside of Visit St. Pete Clearwater's wheelhouse, but they're important steps that would boost tourism throughout Pinellas County. Finally, for advocacy, again, these are those big picture, long range goals, emphasizing 
environmental protections, especially shoreline resiliency, red tide, and more, advocating for improved transportation, especially for workers and tourists, and fighting for workforce-related issues, including housing and affordability. We know that hospitality is probably the single hardest hit sector of the economy that are facing these issues, and those are going to be issues that are going to come to a head for Pinellas County in the coming years. So I know that it's a little bit late in the afternoon today, so I did move a little quickly, but I would love to answer any questions you all may have this afternoon. Questions? Commissioner Eggers. Well, um, thank you. Um, I think the, the findings that you had were, um, I guess, not surprising, but in encouraging. As you said, you just don't know how the residents necessarily, I mean, I, we hear, but you know, it's nice to get some feedback. Uh, the most exciting one was, to me, the 67% of residents who say that they've hosted friends or family from outside Florida in their own homes yeah. in that last year. That's a huge untapped market. They call it the visiting friends and relatives market. It's a huge market that could warrant further exploration by the DMO. And is one of the reasons why one of those recommendations was to increase marketing and messaging to people already in Pinellas County. That's yeah. not traditionally a DMO function, but with such engagement from all of these different people having their family from Indiana and, and so on and so forth, it's, it's an untapped potential. Yeah, I was in those, I wasn't in the numbers that were, but I, I did that for like three or four family members. For many of us <laughs> have probably done that. Um, I like the 88% of the numbers of residents who would recommend this as a place to work or live and, and, and to, uh, I guess, a place to live and vacation. Which that, again, those statistics, I might add, are a, that is a question that has been asked on the Pinellas County Citizen Survey in the past, and that repeats that methodology. So in case you all want to use that in your long range trending, that, that is the same question. Did you did any of the um, the benefits of bed tax money? I mean, directly it was any of that in, embedded in there, or was it just kind of the results of the use of those bed tax dollars? You know, we, stadiums, so, museums, you know, spring training, all that stuff that's mixed in. Um, we we did ask some questions that got a gauge to how much they think that tourism is contributing to the local economy. the The results were pretty varied from people thinking that it's. You know, more than 50% of the local economy to people thinking that it's less than 5%. So if I had to summarize it as anything, it's they don't really know those numbers. And, and one of the, uh, I'll call it a jealousy point, is you, know, you see all those penny four signs everywhere on all these different capital projects everywhere. People know about Penny for Pinellas. And so one of those sort of discussion points was, well, if the TDC is paying for something, why don't people necessarily know about that? That's a great point, because there is a, an awful lot, you know, that people really enjoy. As you said, that not only the visitors enjoy, but people, the rest of us who live here year-round enjoy, too. So, okay, thank you. Further questions? Great presentation, and um, it's, it's some meat to dig through. The, the internal communication is really interesting, um, not only for our residents, but for, for visitors once they're here. I know years ago we had talked about um, uh, a, a texting program that used the geodata on people's phones of where they were, um, and we texted them, you know, if they were on the beach, we texted them about the Dolly Museum. If they were on the Dolly Museum, we texted them about a festival on the beach. To, do, do we still do that, Steve? Um, I just couldn't remember how far we had delved into that. Um, I think texting now is old, is old school, and now you now now you go through and you your your uh, your your iPhone is on, and now you get served an ad, especially when you're looking for something, and it knows that you're in a specific area. So we've got messages that'll go out from from that standpoint. And how are these ads coming through? I'm sorry. How are the ads? How are we advertising? I mean, on it's just. I don't have an iPhone, so. Oh, it, it, well, it's a, whatever your smartphone device is. So again, when you, if you're on your phone and you look, hey, I'm interested in finding something to do, and they go in there, we know that that person there, we've A, either served them some ad at some point in another place, or we've targeted because you meet a certain age, um, you know, you're female, you're 46, and you've got three kids. Yeah, no, yeah. and no, we and that I, I fully understand how you, if you look up something, you suddenly are inundated with ads that are related to that. But we had actually gotten to the point of if we had a uh, phone number data that we targeted where they are yeah. 
phys- actually with their you know with with actual their rela- their um, location. Yeah, I don't believe we still have that. I have not heard of anything like of us doing anything like that. And don't tell me the texting is outdated. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Steve, we were developing, it seemed like last year or the year before, there was some discussion about developing an app for uh, other activities in, in, the, in the area so that you could get on, any, any, any tourist that's here could get on and, and, and find an abundance of things to do. Um, and uh, Creative Pinellas was involved in that process. And what, what was that? What was that? And how is that moving along? Um, so the t- two things, the first one on Creative Pinellas, they created the Arts Navigator. So that when you take a brief quiz and it shows that you are a certain category and now it'll tell you those things you could do on your trip, whether it's for a museum, it's for an activity, it's a specific event, something along that line. I will call it that they're probably in uh, the next phase of testing it. Um, actually, we have our whole staff uh going in and, and helping them and testing it to make sure everything everything works. So they'll have that. And then the other side of it is with our website, uh, we actually went through this last year and designed it specifically to be mobile friendly first and then to desktop. And so now when you get on there, if you're looking at if it's, it's an event, it's an activity, it's a restaurant, it's going to have those business uh, listings um, on that. You're not still using apps, are you, Commissioner? <laughs> That's so yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just figured out what they were. No. Okay. Further questions? I, I do like the concept that I saw on one of the slides, the Beaches Plus. Um, I think that was, that was a really interesting way of saying everything that we have to offer the, the visitor and, and our locals. So, All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank your time today. You. Thank you. What else you got? One final thing. Well, first, um, we got five items coming up for May the 5th for the next work session. So we got Cross Bay Ferry, uh, transportation follow-up discussion, Pinellas Trail access um, and standards, um, uh, airco development, and uh, update on the penny. So, um, so that'll be another full agenda. We'll try to get our presentations streamlined and to the point, but um, to the extent we can. Uh, so. Anyway, but <laughs> it's a pretty full agenda. Yes, we've, we've come up with access standards by how somebody, and then we're also going to talk about e-bikes or, you know, all the things that are going on on the trail that you guys have, you know, at one point or another brought up and had questions about. So, okay. All right, on to the agenda. All right, so uh, presentations and award, we've got... All the items, I'll just start over on item 15, um, unless you have questions about any of the reports. Okay, item 15 is a joint participation agreement with Florida Department of Transportation. This is for um, uh, traffic control and communications equipment at State Road 60 um, from Missouri to uh, Patel Boulevard. So the state's gonna give us $1.8 million, then we're gonna work that in to our plan, we'll install it. Uh, the, the equipment, and then it'll become part of our um, ATMS system. Item 16 is re- uh, receipt and file for civil lawsuits from the county attorneys. Item 17 is a warrant of a bid to CDW for net app storage systems. Uh, so this is uh, $4.6 million for 36 months. Um, this is our storage capacity needs. 18 and 19 are reports, receipt for file. 20 is award of bid to JS Jordan Construction for St. Pete um, Clearwater National Airport for a new freight elevator on the terminal, $381,000. Item 21 is a grain agreement, Florida Department of Transportation. This is for paving of the Strawberry Economy parking lot. And so that's just north of the airport. Um, So it's on the airport side. I learned this, these things new. (laughs) I just remember, when did we name it the strawberry lot? That's they they have that, and then they have I think lime on the other side, so it's all pie related. So <laughs> we should be selling those uh, naming <laughs> naming rights to those parking lots. I, I, I learned something new each day. That this was one of them. So we I was at a I was uh, I was at a state I think it was Miami Stadium, uh, maybe the Hard Rock Stadium, 
and their parking lots at the time were sponsored by Toyota. And so instead of parking like Disney, you were parking in Goofy, you were parked in Tacoma or parked in Tundra. Or... <laughs> yep, well, this is that. And so they're going to expand that lot. They actually can use it. Then they, wouldn't have, they won't have to go to the other side of the road except in like the really peak you know, times. Um, item 22, uh, Transportation Agreement, Florida Department of Transportation, Design and Environmental Work Associated with the Terminal Building Expansion. So this grant's associated with their strategic investment, and Tom will be there uh, to answer any questions regarding this, but this is 100% funding for um, uh, this grant and requires no local match, provides the first grant, provides a total of nine point fund, uh, six, 9.9 .9 million and able the, um, the airport to get started with the um, design and engineering and environmental work to get the project ready for uh, terminal expansion. Um, Tom can really lay out for you. He's kind of, they, they've done very well in terms of funding and being able to get started with the actual terminal expansion project. Pretty exciting. He can go through that uh, on Tuesday. Third Amendment to the Economic Development Funding Agreement with Star Tech Enterprises uh, for e Economic Development Incubation and Acceleration Services. So this basically takes us to when Tampa Bay Innovation Center starts up. Um, a grant agreement with Operation PAR for Substance Abuse Services. Uh, this is a continuation of, of that program. Um, and you can see the breakdown in, on the different pieces of the funding. Um, but it uh, provides a, a million dollars, uh, a little over a million dollars. Item 25, subcipient agreement with Westcare. This is for the Family Drug Court Program. It's a three-year grant from the Office of Juvenile Justice Programs. Item 26, local planning or local agency uh, program agreement with Florida Department of Transportation. This is construction of Starkey Road sidewalks from Elmerton to East Bay. 2.9 or $2.7 million project and 900 from the county. 27's road transfer agreement with the city of Pinellas Park. Twenty eight revisions to the work net um, bylaws. Under 29, this is a request to file suit. This is a case that was investigated by the Office of Human Rights. Uh, it relates to housing discrimination on the basis of race and retaliation. Oh. And I have nothing planned for county attorney reports as of now. <laughs> Thank you. But the work net, the bylaw changes. Um, is it substantive? Is it housekeeping? Housekeeping. Housekeeping, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Over to public hearings. Uh, the, other, um, the first case is a request for a change in zoning from R2 single family to RE residential estates. Uh, proposed uses are a single family home and a uh, boarding, um, uh, boarding of horses. No one objected and recommended 4 0. And lots of petitions in favor. Um, 34 is a request for a zoning change from residential agricultural to R5, 1.97 acres, summer down under Corporated Clearwater. Uh, the applicant proposes a combine, uh, to combine the site into two adjacent parcels and develop 39 um, housing uh, townhome um, development, a uh, townhome development. The um, one person appeared citing uh, opposition because of sewer impacts. Um, and they, but they do have a letter from Sunshine Water Services, and they are the sanitary sewer provider uh, for this area. That is a private, a private sewer um, utility. And that's all we have. All right, going back to item 32, County Commission New Business, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, forwarded an email to each one of you. Um, the career, uh, career source, we had an ad hoc committee meeting um, yesterday and discussed the um, uh, support for a law firm that we want to uh, bring on as a result of our current law firm having 
um, the possibility of a conflict of interest to handle the insurance situation along with the payout that I talked about at our last commission meeting. And so we um, voted to um, move forward to the full board for a vote on Monday for um, this law firm that I sent out to all of you guys. So we will be voting on that through a career source uh, full board on at 10 o'clock on Monday. Um, and then that way the necessary resolution document that needs to be brought forward on Tuesday can be brought forward as a new business item um, that will be presented by me um, begging the chair's support for that because we need to move timely so that we can take care of the issue at hand. So it's just to, the, the, the Board of County Commissioners has to approve our recommendation for an outside law firm. County Attorney. You know, I was just uh, kind of listening to here, and it's, again, I explained last time that this is a power reserved to us through the bylaws and interlocal agreement, and obviously, you know, as I explained, conflict counsel is something that you, you see from us when we have a conflict. It's, it's very normal in the course of a legal business. And so as far as timing, them doing it on Monday, us doing it on Tuesday? I do not see any issues with that whatsoever. Very good. We did double check to make sure it wasn't a 72-hour um, notification process or anything like that. Um, because we would have been up against the gun in order to get things in place to, to be able to close the situation out, which we want to do um, in a timely manner. But we did look into that too. Thank you very much. Commissioner Gerard? Yeah, I'd kind of like to have a discussion, however brief, about the, the uh, report that we got from Animal Services. Um, and also, I had a question about um, the Injunct not injunction, moratorium on new pet stores. Is that something we need to renew or does it just keep going until we do anything? I need to take a look at that. I don't recall what sort of time frame we put on that. Yeah, um, that would, through December. Lourdes. Through December is what I'm hearing from Lourdes. Through December. Yeah, but Lourdes, of when, when were we discussing bringing that? You and I were going to discuss after you did your individual briefings. Benedict Assistant County Administrator. So we've had all of our meetings. We have one left on Tuesday with the commissioners with our one-on-ones, um, and we plan to bring it in June. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Commissioner Peters. Thank you. I just want to um, send out prayers to Officer Durr in Pinellas Park was shot last night. I don't know if anyone knew about that. Right. Um, just, um, just to send out prayers to his family, I'm sure I talked to the chief, he said he was ambushed, and so I'm sure the family and the whole department is shaken up, so I'd like to send out prayers to all our law enforcement officers. They go out every single day and they put their life on the line for every one of us, and I just want to um, send our prayers out to his family and to law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I uh, was with communicating with the chief the other night, and um, it, it did shatter a bone in his arm, but uh, he's, he is stable and doing well. Um, the other thing on my list was that we had talked um, previously in, uh, at a previous meeting after Commissioner Flowers' memo regarding fifth floor procedures and those type of thing about having a fifth floor meeting. And I wish our other two commissioners were here because I'd like to have mass as good a participation as possible. But we had wanted to suggest meeting on Tuesday morning this coming Tuesday, the 26th, in the morning at 10.30, uh, to have this meeting, and then you'd have time to go break for lunch before the 2 o'clock session. And I wanted to see if there was consensus on that time, and, of course, still the desire to have that meeting. Okay. All right, we'll go back to the drawing board on calendar and try and come up with something that uh, works, and we'll go from there. No. Um, remember if we had, it was one o'clock right before the meeting? Yeah, that should be a problem. It will, will be definitely done by uh, in an hour then if we had one o'clock on Tuesday. Does that work for everyone? That's fine. Fine with me. Uh, 
Okay. All right, one o'clock on Tuesday. We'll do it. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, just real quick. Um, just wanted to pass along our condolences to the Figurski family. Um, as you know, Jerry a passed away on I think it was April second, and um, at the funeral the other uh, the other day it was yesterday. Gosh, the week has just been crazy. Um, and it was beautiful, well attended. Um, obviously, he did a lot in the community, and he did a lot in uh, our land land planning agency group, our LPA group, and. Um, just a, just a really impactful person, and the ceremony was wonderful. Had a little card, you know how they hand out cards at the funerals, and um, it, it kind of touched to him, but I thought it was pretty neat, so I'm just going to read it real quick. It says, God gives us each a gift of life to cherish from our birth. He gives us friends and those we love to share our days on earth. He watches us with loving care and takes us by the hand. He blesses us with countless, jo countless joys and guides the lives we've planned. Then when our work on earth is done, he calls us to his side to live with him in happiness where peace and love abide. So just touched on a lot of things about this man uh, and what he gave to the community, but I thought it was also kind of a neat thing for each of us to remember. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. All right, remember uh, 1 o'clock, we'll send out a notice on that. We'll get that noticed. Uh, it will be in the conference room on the fifth floor. And um, remember to contemplate... Uh, action as far as the election bill that was filed and we'll discuss that again on tuesday uh, during the commission new business section all right we are adjourned